welcome to uh, our workshop today. I'm going to start real quick. Let me do a quick share screen here so that I can get that started. So we are here today uh, to talk about character development for beginners. This is part one of two. Uh, it's part two will be with Dom tomorrow where he does the art stuff. So I, let's see if I can click this here. There you go. So I'm Howard Wong. I'm mainly known as a writer. Uh, and today we're going to be fast forwarding our timeline a bit. Uh, we'll see if we can get a break in or two if people need it. But we're going to go through character descriptions. And what you need is paper and something to write with. If you don't have it, you definitely can grab it now so they can follow along. I'll be doing that live as well, making a new character for Dom to struggle with tomorrow. So Dom, you can see here, will be here tomorrow. At the same time and he'll be doing the sketchy part of what I'm doing today let's see here so the run through is gonna have an introduction of uh, my background so they can ask questions about that we're gonna go through eyes and inspirations some tips and tricks and let's see if I can shrink this down so I can see my screen there we go and more than good looks this is one of my favorite parts actually that very very important parts when you're writing creating characters and for any kind of property and then obviously at the end, we'll leave time for questions. Now, hopefully everybody can see what I'm doing. If you can't, definitely let us know in the chat if you can. So I do comics. So this is some of the stuff that I do. We mentioned the Iron Man comics here. I did a interesting one with uh, George Takei's uh, anthology uh, stories inspired by his uh, history, which is neat. I uh, also worked uh, Jones books and stuff, mobile games. I'm trying to speed through this so that we get to the, the meaty gritty stuff. So working toys, uh, doing to, uh, story development, as well as uh, client books as well here. So those were my fun, my fun stuff. And also property toys as well, like here with Minion, where I worked on the app for it, uh, where I had to talk with Universal about the dictionary dialogue of these little guys because they actually have a language so but i can't share that with you because that's uh <laughs> non-disclosure agreements so i can't share that ever actually <laughs> and also do copywriting so I, I write stuff for websites and where i ads for play for people and articles as well so fairly interesting stuff more interesting is stuff that i can talk about which is the narrative concept and content development which I've done for Bungie and currently working for National Geographic uh, on a project that I can't talk about, but I can mention that it deals with the oceans. I'm trying to say it so it's very broad, but it's really interesting and very science -y. So if you want to look up uh, myself uh, on social media, this is definitely the link uh, that will get to this page, which has all my social media accounts if you want to follow along. So if you need this, see this later, I'll definitely pop it up if anyone wants it. So let us start with ideas and inspiration. So um, ideas and inspiration. Uh, besides going around and looking and thinking about things, first thing in, in my mind would be what type of character or role am I developing? So basically, what kind of character would be fitting uh, with these roles? So. I usually start with archetypes, the usuals, uh, the protagonist slash hero or antagonist villain, and then the more fun stuff. I know people always like gravitate to these two, but the fun characters are like the sidekicks, uh, the different roles that they play, mentors, love interests, friends, for heroes, but also for the villains as well. So, and you can have more than one of these as well. And I have one of my favorite roles is like the supporting characters. So it's sort of like, if you think of Spider-Man, his supporting characters would be like Mary Jane, Aunt May, and so forth. And to me, that is plays an important role uh, for these these two archetypes here too. Um, see what character types your initial world building and story idea will need for it to work. And that's an important part because um, you have to have an idea for your story. And you don't need to write your story before you start creating characters because it's, sometimes it's easier to do it the other way around. For me. 
I usually start with a character and then build a story around them. Um, that might be due because of uh, my background playing video games or making video games and stuff to Dungeons and Dragons because you technically are making a character before you start the story and quest. So you don't have a story yet, but you have a character and your character will change as you develop your story. So I always keep this stuff in the back of my head which is a world building, plots, life experiences, and entertainment media that I've experienced as I look in building a character. Now, I don't spend too much time here uh, for the world building and plot. It might be something basic. It could be as simple as I want to think of a character that will be fitting in a fantasy world where there's an issue and problem that you have to solve. Simple as that. I don't go further than that because as I said, as you build your character, things will fall into place and your story will actually start developing from that. Some key points is this, use everything you know from any moment in your life. And I do mean that. Um, one of my examples is that uh, the toy I showed you with the big giant robots. I got, I, w I was invited to do this uh, with, uh, the, uh, with, with Bandai and 3.0, which are two big uh, toy companies in Asia. And it was for the creator of Gundam, um, which is just nuts uh, for me. But when they asked me, why do, why do I think I could do this? I had to hearken back to when I was a little kid in elementary school where I would run home and watch, uh, and I didn't know at the time, giant robot cartoons. I think you can maybe, I don't know if you can see it on my screen here, but um, let's see if I can stop sharing screen for a second. If I can do that, I can probably show you guys. Da, da, da. Let's see. Can I do that or not do that? Yeah. Uh, it's right. da, da, da. Here we go. So, one other thing, I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm not going to grab because that's really dangerous. Or maybe I can grab this one. This is a tiny one. So, this is like a robot of a cartoon that I watched when I was a little kid, when I was probably like 10, 11, if, if that. Um, and what happened with that was I explained that I watched this stuff and grew up with it. And they were like, really? Especially the, the Japanese uh, creators that were there. And basically, we told them my experiences watching this stuff as an 11-year-old, which actually helped me get that job. So this is really important. Uh, and oops, and very interesting uh, here to use everything in the moment in your life to create something. Um, and don't restrict your ideas. And go big. And that's another example of things. When I was talking to Marvel and Disney about their Iron Man comic, they wanted me to do that was based on the first... Marvel theme park attraction, which was the Iron Man ride in Hong Kong. I was at first thinking, making it very, very uh, Marvel-esque and keeping it within the world. And then my editors were kept on pushing, it's like, go bigger, like, just go, go to town, go nuts. Give us like the most craziest ideas and then we'll tell you when, when, when to stop. So I kept on pushing it to the point where I was like, we're going to team up with uh, Barry Mordo and um, Armin Zola and then make magical robots and stuff. And like, do it. I'm like, seriously? Because I was literally just joking <laughs> about doing that. So that's what ended up happening in the comic, which we actually have magic and science combined as a threat uh, to Tony Stark and Doctor Strange at the same time. So you never know. Uh, idea dumping. Now, this is um, an interesting thing. In any industry I worked in, from toys, video games, uh, comics, animation, and so forth. A lot of people throw away their ideas. Don't do that. Idea dumping really means is that you're going to put it to the side. No idea is a dumb idea. You just throw it to the side and see what's what will what will work as you develop your stuff. So, I've seen this with a lot of new uh, people creating content or uh, development for characters and world building and stuff, where they just like this is not good, it's not going to work, and they just toss it. Don't do that. Save it until your project is done because I had happened when I was working for Bungie. I was doing um, narrative narrative development for a new IP, which I can't talk about. And as we were working on it, they were going one direction. And I had notes for other things that are completely different from what they wanted. And the last hour, they changed gears and wanted to go with something else. So I grabbed those old notes from like four or five months ago. Like, what do you think of this idea? 
and they were to vote for it, and that became the, the, the dominant idea uh, for the project. So, and I wonder if I may just add yep. one note to that, which is great from an artist's perspective. With uh, from when you're illustrating and you're translating and trying to visualize like a certain scene, and, and you're creating a visual narrative, uh, sometimes the scene, the way the panels flow, it can make it could be too complex or too simple, and so you have certain challenges. Like we want the scene, but it's not really working with this idea. It doesn't flow to the next part. And so, you know, just like you're like movie making, it's, it's a very similar approach. So one thing that's great, like with uh, working with someone like with Howard who has ideas, there's stuff because we have, it's already established with the world and how things were, we can easily just change the narrative and that way we purpose it for that scene. And then that way it's like, it doesn't impact, it doesn't feel like visually like a movie, like it stands out kind of odd. Like it may read really well, but visually once it's, you're, once you illustrate it, you realize, oh, you know, this, doesn't have the impact or this the climax is too early in the story because it's the for in terms of visual aspects you want to make it more like climactic at the end of the story so you kind of like rework and how the camera angles or how the panels are laid out and that's why like howard is saying like don't toss you just draft one draft two draft three that's why drafts are, that's what drafts are for exactly yeah so it's not, nothing's wasted until the very last hour once you submit it, well, that's pretty much the end of that. <laughs> Until <Yeah. laughs> then, everything's in play. So, um, some tips and tricks here. So, are there similar types and roles that you know of that fits your story idea and what makes them stand out to you? This is something I use a lot and makes it easy to create characters because when you're creating something from nothing, it's easier to see what is out there that you remember. So, for example, let's say Batman. Uh, we know his tragic story, and which defined him and his whole entire reason for being was uh, to basically be living justice and helping p and making sure that what he experienced never happens again. So that kind of aspect of that character to how it, it pushed him to train himself to be like this superhuman detective character, would that fit into the character that I'm developing? Possibly. And if it's so, I'll take parts of it. Uh, and that's, uh, it's not saying you're copying, you're taking parts of it so it inspires you to push it further or a different direction. Because basically, it's sort of like, um, see, it's, it's kind of weird. People think you're copying or, or what have you. I'm like, no, it's more like there's a GPS for you and you put in the address and it tells you this is the route you can go. But you notice that there's other ways of getting there that are not as direct. They'll still get you to that same area or the same place you want to go to. So you use that as a guide versus just, I'm going to follow the, exactly this, what happened and then just make him instead of a bat into another character. Well, that is kind of, that is copy. But if you change it so that it's a different thing uh, by getting a different route, it, it creates a new character that way. So this is one of the one thing, tips and tricks that I use. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way, we, the way I do it is I usually make a list of those characters and what makes them stand out uh, to me. Usually I would use a word or two or maybe a, a smart phrase, a short phrase. I wouldn't go nuts and make a whole uh, essay about it. Something very short so that it triggers uh, ideas. Uh, most important is what makes them memorable for you. Uh, like I mentioned, the Batman thing was just like two sentences, that kind of thing. Uh, well, one interesting thing is that it kind of with for Batman, it actually the uh, acknowledge an homage similar into the narrative for Bruce Wayne is that Batman is somewhat inspired by not not only on the pages but behind the scenes by Zorro, like the film that he goes to see when it's the tragic night of his parents it becomes the birth of Batman. That night they went to see Zorro in the theater, and then if you look at it, Zorro cave cape. Much, but it's not you're right exactly what you're saying Howard. it's like it's not you're not copying it's just you're taking elements because you can say the same thing about robin hood it's like robin hood you know he fought criminals there it's like this he was branded an outlaw but he had a base <laughs> you know it's a lot of similar aspects exactly so as i said there there it's not copying but inspiration of how to get to somewhere where we're going um and you know don't don't be afraid to do that um and, well, and there'll be examples i'm going to be showing how how I build characters really quickly. Sometimes you don't have time, uh, especially during meetings when they ask you to do it on the fly, which I've had <laughs> happen many times with me. Dude, like, can you create a world and uh, characters for this and give us, you know, a glimmer of what you would do after like five, after literally after you're hearing something that they're doing, which is uh, unfortunately part of the job for me. Um, 
Here's one of my other tricks that I do is to think of friends and family, especially their personalities, physical traits, and history that you can build from. It's easier sometimes to know these these aspects of people that you know of that you can apply to your characters. And it's not saying that you will go, I'm going to copy Uncle Bob everything. It can. It can happen. But you can also do other things where you take aspects from each Pearson that you know and combine them into somebody new. So uh, I'm going to. I see there's somebody in the waiting room. I guess I'm gonna try to click. Oh, Victoria! You get that? Okay, thank you. Well, I couldn't click it for thing. some reason. <laughs> Hi, Victoria. I'm glad you could join us. Sorry about the technical difficulties with the Zoom link. Um, we've started a bit, but. Don't worry, it didn't go too far. I was talking about how I built characters uh, from the ground up. So basically, taking everything that you know from all the media that you've watched to taking, as you can see here, traits and personalities and the history of people that you know. And it's the, the same thing applies to characters that you've seen on television, movies and comics and books as well. So as I men mentioned, that I usually take these kind of things and mix and match and create somebody new. That's one of the quick ways of starting a character where I can start developing them. So do I have an example of that? Yes. So this is my daughter, uh, one of my daughters, my, my eldest one. Now she won't let me use her real photo because she's a teen. So that's how it's at. This is as far as I can go with this. Um, so I was building a character, a female character. So I wanted to relate it to people I know. So I used my eldest daughter as well as my youngest one. And as you can see here, the artist mimicked her haircut. Um, and you'll see this part too in a second. So we mimicked her haircut. The personality is a mixture of the two kids um, that I pitched to Marvel uh, from the Iron Man kind book I did. You can see here, this is her in her full, in her full suit. And if you notice, um, this, is, this is actually not purposely because she was wearing glasses. It's because it was related to the ride. They had VR glasses. Uh, which they, you know, with the engineers at Disney, created Stark, Stark, uh, Stark Smart Glasses. I really, really hate that name personally. but So Stark Smart Glasses was a thing. So I'm like, I'm going to integrate that into the character's uh, arsenal so that it can relate to the back to the ride. And so it happened to be glasses. And if you watch Simpsons, that, that was sort of like an inside joke uh, between me and some of the engineers who, who watch Simpsons. And then we enjoy that very much. So, so this is actually a page from the comic where she first dons the prototype suit, which I mentioned uh, earlier when we we're bantering back and forth about using real world uh, technology and pushing it to, into the future. So this is like the nano carbon uh, diamond uh, suit where it's like a soft suit, but it, when, it's, it will react, when it reacts to impact, it becomes hard as a default on Iron Man suit, which is usually a hard shell. So you can see here, uh, my this character who's based on both my children. Personality-wise, it's a mixture of both of them. Physical hair, my eldest one. Glasses, somewhat they're hurt as well. Um, and, it, and the thing is, I did name her after my first daughter. Technically, it was supposed to be another character named after my youngest daughter, but that she was edited out. So that was, you know, not a great moment as a father, but what can you do? So, as you can see, I went from my two kids, created a, a, a base character here, and then sort of added the Iron Man aspect to her to create a new character for Marvel. So she actually exists in the comic book universe and thankfully still alive and kicking. <laughs> um, let's see what we have here. So let's give it a go. So anytime you see this uh, is when you should grab out your pencils or pens and paper because we're going to give it uh, a go ourselves to do what I mentioned. So I'm going to do this as well and do a live, uh, do it live with you. So I'm going to be switching cameras back and forth. So the first thing we're going to do is what kind of story will this character be in, uh, which I'm going to try to figure out here. So here's some examples of sci-fi, science fiction, Western superhero, a monster kind of thing, action, maybe a mystery, what have you. So I'm going to see if I can switch my camera. In a second, I get to set it up. So as you guys go grab your pens and pencils and paper, if you have any questions, do let me know. I need to make sure I got my camera set up before I get this going. Let's see. All right. 
Hey Dom, can you see my, can you, what do you see on the screen right now? Do you see my pen and my hand by any chance? Well, uh, yeah, I can see it there on your chat screen, yes. So if you were to, to stop uh, share screen, it should, uh, yeah, we'll see your hand on the pad. Okay, thank you. I should stop share. That is a good point. How's that? We go. How's, yeah. Is that good? All right. So I think what kind of story it's going to, that I, that I want to do. So let me give me a second. As you guys do it too. Follow along for sure. You could do your own thing. This is a point. Uh, I think I'm going to do something with monsters. Uh, okay, I scribble a lot because I think I, I always doodle a lot. So, you know, it's it was, always helps when you do something and gives you ideas. You know, when you do, when you do, even when yeah, I, cause I write, I do doodle a lot and my notes are really horribly bad. But I want to do the monsters and something though. Not just monsters. Hmm. Hmm. Nah. So as you can see, I'm like trying to figure out a quick plot with my character with a character I want to build. So I want to kind of have something fun. Uh da, 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 maybe a mystery. And maybe something else. Something else. Eh, maybe. Maybe I add a witch or something to it. So, as you can see, I'm I'm just drawing down notes. I may I may I may I may even change the whole thing, or use some of it, or branch off into other things. So sometimes, I mean, if I do this, I might go into which that's science uh, science fiction, which maybe she's like a witch that exists in the, fu in the far future, which would be kind of neat actually, which in the far future. Hmm. This might work actually. That'd be kind of neat with a curse. It goes into character, turning your character maybe to a monster or something. So I'm like talking and I'm doing this because I don't write down my thoughts as much as, you know, I probably would, could, could do here. But this is really just showing you my thought process really quickly that you don't fall, there's no straightforward line. I actually went, started here and I ended up going Maybe going in reverse, where I talk about uh, maybe the villain, maybe <laughs> she's the hero. I'm not sure yet, and something with a curse that will turn somebody to a monster or something like that. So, let's go back to uh, our my screen here, my my little PowerPoint guide here. When you think so, about it, like in, for inspiration, it's like just that concept. It's like hmm, something maybe drawn from the Legend of Medusa. But there you go. That that's that's where it becomes. It it, it starts once you start with one thing. It snowballs and you start. It starts being very quickly. So um, I hope you guys can uh, let's see. I'm gonna switch my camera back. Yeah. To, so we see the slide. Yeah. Here you go. Can you see that? We we see the slide. Can you see the slide? Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that I think of what type of character this is going to be. Uh, the main. And I'm thinking of as, as maybe the hero villain. I'm not sure yet. So I'm going to write down. Um, I'm not going to share my share my screen to uh, no, at this point for the camera I'm writing down because it's just to try to save some time. So I wrote down hero and villain. I know you guys can't see me right right now, but I wrote down hero and villain and question mark because I'm not sure which way I want to go yet. So you guys can do that too and figure out what kind of role, what kind of type of character your, your character is going to be. It could be hero, villain, or sidekick, mentor, uh, supporting character, or maybe, um, I don't know, maybe it's, it's, it's a, a, B, a B plot character. Somebody will think, will, will talk. Will, or it you know. could be like an Iron Giant, just like, you know. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, <laughs> the Living MacGuffin. Um, <laughs> yes, MacGuffin. yes, yes, exactly. The Living the MacGuffin. Living MacGuffin, if, yeah. If you can explain uh, later on what a MacGuffin is. Oh, man, that's like a whole other workshop almost. But yeah, I'll give it a shot. Oh, just like you're just the basic, uh, you know, when you hear the title of a story and then how it applies to the MacGuffin. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's basically why the story happens and why where all the characters are drawing towards. It's sort of like... Um, the Infinity Gauntlet. Oh, I don't know why the marbles in my head right now. The Infinity Gauntlet and the stones. That's all McGovern. Because they don't exist, really, in the real world. And that became the driving force as well. So where am I here? So I'm saying here, make a list of this type of character. From things I know and something that makes them stand out to you. So let me switch back. 
and stop sharing for a second. And I'll switch my camera okay, to my desk here. And he said Medusa. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So that's something that we can, I can look at. Um, hmm. What else can I do? So as I think, I usually draw a doodle because that's just, that's the main thing. You don't have to doodle. <laughs> this is just me doing my thing. Because um, it gives me a visual and sometimes it inspires me with ideas and stuff. And then, I don't know, in a way, it's sort of that I don't want to see a blank page <laughs> when I work. So it, it kind of helps me in that sense. So Medusa is definitely one of them. Uh, other thing that just popped in my head is Voltron. Uh, the Voltron Twitch, right? So, but that's what's actually it's a sci-fi witch. So that's actually very interesting. Uh, taking video games right now, Final Fantasy VII, possibly. Uh, hmm. Versus, this is the, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. You're mentioning like uh, Voltron, because it's yeah. like uh, I realize as I'm I'm just doodling as you're breaking down your ideas. And then you put Final Fantasy right there in a seven, and I'm giving her like a mask similar to like Voltron's uh, faceplate and oh, nice. uh, like Sephiroth in uh, Final Fantasy. Genova yeah. too. You know, and it's, the thing is for me, I, sometimes I would grab things off my shelf and stuff. So I don't know. Let's see if I can spin. I'm like tempted to spin my camera around. So uh, much of motion sickness, I guess, a bit. So. I would sometimes look at the, my stuff, my stuff on my shelf for my inspiration. So I would look at the stuff that I've gathered over time for ideas. So I might be grabbing something from this, possibly. Hmm. Let's see. Let's go back to here. And you know, some you can grab things, anything from movies, books, comics, toys, which I just did. Um, so I just, because I looked at my stuff just now, okay, it could be Cursed Armor or something uh, that turns you into a monster. So I actually like that one so far. Um, that gives you an idea about uh, what you can do with this part because we went from generating a basic idea, possibly a, a short narrative, and then figuring out what kind of role. I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, you know, it could technically be a tragic, tragic character. I'm thinking that too, like, you know, kind of like a bit of an anti-hero. Yeah, can be. That's why, you know, it, it, it's, it's, as you can see, it's evolving. So it could go either way right now. So I'm going to switch back my camera and hope that you guys are okay. I know I'm going a little quicker than <laughs> normal, but it is to make sure you guys have time to get through the material and stuff. So I uh, da, 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 here we go. It's working. There we go. You guys can see my screen, I hope. Yes, we can. All right. Tips and tricks. So if you have followed along and still are, are trying to wonder what to do, you can always use these tips and tricks to help you with creating any kind of character for any kind of property that you're working on. So you take a character you know and change one aspect of them or the world they live in. Now this is something I really do do when I have a crunch uh, during a meeting, be it live like this or in person. Now I've done this in person where people rolled out a whiteboard for me to, <laughs> to I kid you not, to jot down what I just showed you here and come up with something because you know, there's a lot of people who have never worked with me before or do you want to see and make sure I can do things on the fly. And that's the only way to do it is literally to do it on the fly. So this is some of the things that, this is one of the things I do. So let's imagine Iron Man. We all kind of hopefully know who he is and what he is. He's like, you know, a genius who made a super, a super suit that allows him to do multiple, many, multiple things that are impossible and allow him to go on adventures and stuff, protecting the human who's inside. And we know that he lives on Earth, in New York, and Star Tower, and other places on the planet. But what if we change one thing? What if we took that away? We keep Iron Man for now, and we say that he lives underwater. What do we need to change for him to do that? This is the part where you end up creating a new character. 
So he wouldn't be using uh, jet rocket packs off his hands. Uh, so we'll have to change that a bit. We have to make sure he bleeds underwater, that his suit doesn't just make him sink like a rock <laughs> in the ocean. So it's a lot of these aspects where I'm building the physicality of the, char- of, of, of the character. Now, mentally and personality and, you know, the history of the character, maybe he was like sort of like, you know, raised by wolves, but instead he was raised by mermaids instead maybe he was shipwrecked in the middle of the ocean or something he hit a reef and there was no land around so the mermaids took that took it took him as a baby and raised him and he became sort of their version of tarzan underwater and his suit's not made of metal anymore but maybe out of something else maybe uh giant scales and bones of like uh sea monsters that we didn't know existed because it's so deep that we never seen them so that it's more organic and less techy. And as you can see, you can build off of that real quickly and then go on and I can go on all day like this. So this is one of the quickest ways to get to something new by taking something you know and changing one aspect of them. So this is one of the ways I'm doing it. The other thing is a Lego method. And if you aren't familiar with Lego, they're like little bricks that can stick together and you can create whatever you want with just your imagination just one of my favorite toys I still have near me, actually, uh, that I play with here and there with my kids. It's because it keeps the mind nimble to create things. So what does that mean? So let's imagine we have a human being and say I smash it with a frog. So a human plus frog, what would I get with that? Let's find out. I would get a were frog. Now, unlike the Iron Man, uh, tip and trick where I changed one thing. This is like sort of adding two things that usually are not put together. Uh, so this is a weir frog, which is a beautiful art piece done by Dom and my friend, uh, Mike Ruth here. Um, <laughs> and if you want to see more of Mike's art, you can definitely go to his website. It's a fantastic artist and fantastic person. Um, and thankfully he's not mad that I did this, uh, to him. Um, <laughs> he looks like a Viking, Mike, Mike Ruth. He looks like a Viking there, but he's like a, like a young Santa. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. He actually looks kind of, I never thought of that. He does kind of look kind of scary, but he's actually, yeah, he's, he's a, a young teddy. Chris Kringle. <laughs> he's, he is a teddy bear. So he's a great artist and very fantastic, uh, personality. Um, so that's one, that's the other thing. So t- in taking, changing one thing and then adding two things, that's two things. And then one of my favorite ones too is changing genres. Uh, what does that mean? So even if you don't understand what a genre is, you'll get this one. So this is a story of Goldilocks and the three bears. And we know that she goes into her cottage and sleeps, you know, eats their food, sits in her chairs, sleeps in her beds and they find her there. Right. Um, that's like basically the story. So what if I change genres? This is like a fairy tale. So what happens if I change it into a sci-fi? So now she's not walking into the woods and going to the cottage, but she's flying in her spaceship and she maybe she, she comes across a, an arc, a space arc. And then she just, you know, gets in on her own and starts just taking their stuff, their tech or what have you. And just eating their food and what have you know, you basically start building uh, with the idea. So just by changing the genre becomes a new thing in that character. So instead of uh, Goldilocks being this, you know, <laughs> this kid who's like running in the woods and then going into a stranger's home and then, you know, having fun there. Uh, now we have an astronaut who may or may not be a good person or a bad person. We don't know because we're developing character who comes across what probably might be uh, her, her salvation because she was like drifting in space or whatever. And now she has a chance to survive, but the only to do so is to steal these people, you know, this, this place, you know, this, this space arcs food and, and technology and, and uh, resources. So that creates a new character right there just by doing that. So the three things that we talked about, um, let's see here. The take a character you know and change one aspect of them or the world they live in. Uh, the Lego method I mentioned where you added two things and we got uh, Mike Bruce a rare uh, frog. And then changing genres with the Goldilocks example I showed you. So um, if you need, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time if you want to use this as well. You can 
either apply this to the character you're doing right now, or you can even make a new character real quickly if you need to. But this is really the three, one of the three top three things I do to do something very, very quickly uh, uh, to jumpstart an idea. And then if you can, as you can tell, as I was talking, it starts branching off and becomes something more so. So for me, uh, I'll switch back to my camera here. And, that, uh... and one thing that's fun is like when, uh, as from as a creative, uh, as uh, for Howard and I, and he covering the literal aspect in terms of narrative and the storytelling, and I come up with the the visual. Uh, it's well, both like the visual narrative, but the, with uh, we talked about it's like you know sometimes we come up with some uh, scenarios. For example, like like the movie Alien. It's like what if Alien was reversed, and instead of the alien, it's a human, and the human is trying to survive in the ship and being chased by like in the movie Alien, the humans are actually like aliens and it's a human stowaway and then you kind of you just kind of flip it so it's like from, you tell from the perspective of the alien now human stowaways perspective and it's just it's a lot of fun and then as as like uh howard's developing the plot outlines and everything like that uh i would be coming up with like okay this is the ship okay well how big is it and i'm just trying to figure out uh roughly it's like okay this is how it looks inside just like the mundane details and as he comes up with the story then we uh, we start building like the like the world around the characters and the characters he'll give me like a breakdown for each and then i start to figure out how they eventually interact with that world and environment which will will explain like a bit uh in tomorrow's session but also in next week there for how to make comics that's actually actually the the, the perfect summary about the relationship between writer and artist so is that it's it gets to a point where it's it's it's, it's howard then there's uh, there's me, but it, there's always periods of collaboration, and um, like now with the character that's coming up with uh, with the witch and the monster and the curse, like you see what he's doodling, and I cannot wait to show you guys tomorrow what I'm coming out with because it's completely different. Well, I'm actually yeah, drawing something that's quite different so. than what he's doing. Hope so, because I can't draw. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just like uh, if you were to see what I was saying about the the face mask, like when you mentioned about Voltron and all like this, it's like I was. So I'm drawing like a face mask, but like kind of like Medusa robotic sci-fi like tentacles, but her real hair is like, you know, hanging down. And I'm just trying to figure out like her shape, her outfit, her silhouette, her distinctive. It's like when you see her uh, or any, your character as a whole on the page, as the writer, as like, as you're writing the description for all the supporting characters, every uh, everyone that's like, so when they're not seen all together, you know, visually who's who but not just from the writing but from the visual aspect so it's always nice to have like a, a certain silhouette like batman you you know it's batman just by the ears and the cape alone yes. uh and his gloves superman yes. you know the same thing if especially if it's a red cape and spider-man oh there's a guy that's hanging upside down on a thread you know captain america with shield um and so that's that's what uh, we always try to do so that way as a reader you're not struggling to like fight to identify who, who am I looking at? Uh, like I, I, I get the dialogue. So there's always this nice steady flow and it gives me excellent direction in terms of like how he sees like, you know, the character moving in a scene, for example, it's like this character is a lot, is a lot harsher or this one is a lot softer. So it's like, I know like in the panel to pan away or zoom in fierce in the eyes or just have like, you know, nice calming shot. And that's, all part of the character development it's like you really want to convey not just emotions but the mood uh you want to you know this doesn't always have to be the same thing um and then tomorrow's session we're going to show like with uh, character development like the different uh, reference sheets like when you have the side view three-quarter view and the front view and back view it's not it's it's actually for ref reference because sometimes you just want to have uh like them on the ground like you know kneeling and they're doing an pose you know uh, like exhausted or triumphant, but you'll know how all certain key details of that character that you design, how they move. So no matter what angle, you'll know right away. They could be have uh, back uh, backlighting and just be in complete utter silhouette, but just with the edge lighting, but you know, that's your character. And the reader knows that too. And that's so tomorrow's gonna be a lot of fun with that. So as you can see with Howard, what he's doing here, this helps actually when when a writer gives me uh, doodles uh, to do the final character, 
it, it, it it's like it does save me a, a lot of time it's like that way i know like okay oh i can push the envelope like what i was doing was a lot more at first a lot more feminine but i'll show that tomorrow uh a, a little bit more uh dr strange because it was stuck in my head we we're talking about that i love the majesty of it and then i see what uh howard's doing and it's like oh i can go a bit of hellboy so that's like you know that's more jim henson i can actually go a bit labyrinth here and that's, Ooh, that's great a good one i read this actually <laughs> mm -hmm. about that. i read this a oh. good one yeah so it's like that's definitely that's even more fun new character and how they'd be in the page is to be different interpretations so now i'm gonna do actually for tomorrow's session i will do both so we will see like the first like you know the science series medusa like the inspired character and then we'll see and but that's the thing is that no don't dump your ideas because this character visually may not be what who howard wrote but like you know or who you wrote when you're working with an artist but you may love the look of this character and for down as your development story there's a key scene and you realize you know what instead of six feet let's make this character 30 feet tall or something or the other way around but it you know no ideas are necessarily bad ideas all ideas can be repurposed they can be Absolutely. revisited Absolutely. Absolutely. So hopefully you guys got some ideas. The three things that I mentioned for the tips, oh, I just clicked, I mean, I clicked that. The, uh, the tips and tricks I was talking about just recently. I was actually doing them as we were, as I started out this, <laughs> started out making this character because I automatically do that. Um, it's not saying that there's no, there's no order. There's no right way of doing this. There's like any way that comes to your mind, which is easiest for you guys to do to create something, then do it that way. That's the way to do it. Um, so we've been just talking about the physical aspect and the world aspect of this character. And now those are great and those are definitely needed. But my favorite is this, is more than good looks. Um, so I have a line here and I'll just read it out and then I'll just explain it. What makes a memorable character is how they are on the inside and not just how they look or what abilities they have. Because a lot of people focus on this aspect and how they look and also what their abilities they have. It's because it's easy to, to design and do. This, this part, what makes them a character, what mm -hmm. makes them memorable, that is uh, in large part uh, one of the hardest things for people to, to do sometimes because they fall into, I'm just going to focus on the looks more and then people will get it. Um, and there's very few characters where when you see them, you go, I know exactly what that kind of character there is. And the, the whole point is to possibly do the opposite. You see a character's visuals and you're like, it's like Mike, <laughs> I'm using Mike Ruth because it's my head. You see Mike Ruth, he looks like he's going to be a bouncer at the bar. That's what he looks like. But when you get to know him and know his who he is, his history, the whole bit, you know he's really a walking teddy bear who just so happens to have a tattoo and a Viking beard and, you know, <laughs> pretty much just like a Viking kind of think of it. So it, it has that aspect where, you know, as a writer or an artist, you, you see that in your head. You go, okay, he, this, this character's going to look like this, but the real character uh personality uh and history and the reason for doing whatever they're doing their motivation is based on something inside that you can't see yet and the story will reveal that so uh, let's see if i have an example so i'm going to use batman as an example um so i hope most people know who batman is and most people want to see batman he would uh, let's see what he has he dresses like a don't batman. get it he doesn't look like he plays baseball but uh -huh, funny but let's see these are the three things that most people instantly say well what do you think of batman and it was like just because of bat he's cool gadgets and he's a great detective even people in the comic book industry when you ask who batman is these are the three mostly three definitive things they would say but if that's the only things that define batman then anyone can be batman too yes so what we're talking about is what's inside the character, a character's personality. So for Batman, it's not all this. I'm using him as an example because this is easy to jump from. So and it's also, it's actually a great example because in the comics, there have been multiple people that have put on the cowl, but we always yes. know like the true Batman, Bruce Wayne, but what makes him like, you know, why so true? Like it's Bruce Wayne and it's all the things that you have here. Yeah, 
So Batman's character, because uh, yeah, exactly. Because there's two different people who wear the cowl and then take his role because of this, just because of the way the way their stories are written. Maybe he's hurt or he's missing, and so forth, which happens quite a bit more often now than that <laughs> before. When I come to think of it, it's good that. But but you know, people, uh, it's easiest to make a character where it's like all good stuff or all bad stuff. You know, good guy, bad guy, protagonist, antagonist. But what makes a character interesting is when they have a bit of both. So Batman is technically this: he is afraid. He was afraid since that night he lost his parents,、um, and he's also angry. He's a bit evil if you think about the, his methods of how he does things in Gotham. He's always suspicious. He is fearless, and somewhat noble. Never this though, but somewhat noble in the sense that if what he's doing. Is great. How he's doing it, definitely not. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's face it. He's a billionaire. He could technically just change the city and then create programs to help everybody. But instead, he's just going to go out and, you know, scare villains <laughs> half to death. So、um, that's what makes a character complex because he started out as this, which led him to become everything else. He's suspicious, fearless, a bit of noble. His methods are evil. So that creates his, his personality. So now we're getting deeper inside, beyond、uh, the physical aspects of、uh, of, the, of the bat, or any other character for that matter. So, as I mentioned, even good characters and hero characters and villains have this fears and weaknesses. If your characters don't have this, it'd be very hard to write your story because there's no change in your story for a for a story to function and work. Your characters need to change, and for that to happen, they usually have this、um, already set、um, at the beginning of your story. And a quick tip for story writers out there: to, to make your story work, at the end of your story, these should change a bit, if not change completely. And you should see this change gradually through your story. So,、um, as you can see here, I have some dualities here, easily tricked. Uh, he has trust. Has trust issues. So maybe that character started out as being very naive, but then by the end he's very cynical and doesn't trust anybody. And we see, but it's because of the way you write your story, you understand why the character became this way.、Um, so what else do I have here? Fear of failing.、Uh, gets mad easily. No confidence to being overconfident. So these are like the things that you would change. So it's easiest to create.、Um, One side of the equation and the other side, so that you can see how your story would flow. Sometimes, it's not necessarily the perfect way of doing it. This is just a, a quick and easy way of doing it. This can literally branch off because, literally, you can slash and then add another different fear or weakness that comes about because of the way you're writing your story, and add on to that. Now, besides fear or weaknesses, you can also do the strengths and what and and. Uh, uh, from the change of the character, so from fears and weaknesses, you can develop strength and what have you, or the other way around, where they're like they're very confident, they're very strong, and then by the end of the story, they were all a mess. So you can go either way, and then and it changes their character. And if you think of how they were, how we were working on,、uh, I guess at this point, a alien witch that's cursed. I'm still thinking of what to do with that cell.、Um, it could be starting out as her being very strong-willed and being a very confident witch, and then all of a sudden she got cursed, and now she has, you know, trust issues, and she gets mad easily, and she is not confident anymore. So it, it, it defines your character. So their look and everything else falls into place, and then you have a story really being built. Um, most another important thing about your character is the motivation of why they exist. Now, I know you guys may not have a story right now in mind. That's fine, but to keep this in, you have to keep this in your back pocket for sure. As as you start developing your idea for your character and the story starts popping up, motivation is most most important thing. Now, I'm going to flip back real quick. So, motivation connects to fears and weaknesses because you want to. This we this will be changed. Uh, yeah, a little faster. When their motivation, when they start acting upon this. So, let's say、uh, my character. Let's say she was、uh, jealous of another magical being or something that、uh, was 
uh, I was going to say crowned, but uh, was given the title of head witch. That's a terrible thing, but that's just a jumping point idea, which you know led her to get uh, who believed that she 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 deserved vengeance because she was the one who was observing, um, and then it involved a love triangle, and you know. I can go back and forth all day. I'm just looking at the time now. Fast forward a little bit. So, all this stuff for motivation it goes beyond it. This is just a short list, obviously. And motivation it can go on forever with other things, but definitely mix and match your stuff. Your character doesn't just have to have one. I see that with a lot of、uh, young writers and artists who go, "He's doing this because of vengeance." I'm like, "Okay." So once he does that, that's the, that's it. Then is there anything else besides this happening with your character? It's like nope.、I'm、like that's kind of terrible because that means they're that's the end of their life. <laughs> once they satisfy this motivation, there's no point of them for living. You got to have a little bit more for that, right? So maybe there was a rejection. They led the vengeance, and through honor, they regain it, and they also find love along the way, and that changes them. Uh, it changes their fear and weaknesses to be a strength that you know, through their trials and tribulations, they be found love and then you know reinvented themselves from the ground up. So definitely don't just pick one for motivations. That's why it's always the S.、Um, and I stress that to people that I work with and and teach and stuff that you always do more than one、uh, because that helps you build your story for sure、uh, for your character to develop and change. So, let's see. Last one for this part. Type of relationships they have with、uh, other characters. This is so essential that、um, I have given talks to、um, people in, video, in the video game industry that they have they've hired,、uh, have asked me to do, to do a talk about them.、And、this literally became almost a whole entire workshop on its own. Because a lot of new、uh, game writers、uh, and developers,、uh, they focus on the hero and villain character, driving their game towards that. Because gameplay, you're the hero, and that's all that matters. And it's like that sort of is part of the truth. But without your supporting characters, that affect they make the characters that you're you're focusing your story around. There is no story. It can't be driven for it. I mean, can you imagine a story of just one character completely without having this around them?、Um, and you know, those are people like, "What if he's on a desert island?" A, a character. I'm like, "Well, you know, Tom Hanks had a、uh, had a beach ball, so a volleyball. Sorry, so there you go、um, <laughs> to talk to. It doesn't have to be a real physical being. It could be imaginary as well. So,、uh, family member, friend, enemy, teacher, student, or examples." Um, and the thing is, they don't have to always exist. And we think of Spider-Man, we have Aunt May, Uncle Ben, because of Uncle Ben,、uh, because of、uh, Uncle Ben's death due to Spidey not being active and stopping a criminal.、Uh, that changed him. That defined him as a character, right? Well, it was Uncle Ben that gave him the infamous line with great power comes great. great responsibility, which defines Peter Parker. Exactly, and then we look at Peter's friends like、uh, Harry Osborn, who becomes、uh, his one of his greatest enemies, right?、Um, you know, it, it goes on and on. Like even the enemy aspect of things, your enemy will define your character. So now, when I say enemy, I'm not saying like a hero, and the hero's enemy is so and so. So for like Batman's greatest villain is the Joker, but you flip that. Who's the villain's enemy? Is it the hero? Is it somebody else that's in the relationship with them? Maybe the the, the villain's、uh, real true enemy is、uh, their their significant other who's very abusive、uh, emotionally, or whatever that causes them to do what they do. So you you, you push this further than the, okay, this is their teacher, so they're nice and they teach them things. It could be a bad teacher. It could be a horrible one. That tricks them and makes them do dumb things, right? So, in a, the same thing for any of these. So it doesn't have to be always the good positive side of things, but the negative side of things.、Um, an example of that bad teacher is Palpatine to Woody how he corrupted Anakin and <laughs> turned him into Darth Vader. Yeah, exactly. So there's always those aspects of the relationships changing your character. So you gotta, you know, 
have a short list of this. Uh, it doesn't have. You don't have to go. I'm going to go through every single you know supporting character and think of it. Think of a few, and that will help define your character really quickly. So let us uh, slow, slow, give it a go. So character's personality, good, evil, huh? So I'm going to keep this up for now, uh, for a bit, for you guys to use. And I'm going to start doing mine uh, as well. I'm going to start writing. I'll, I'll share my camera in a minute. I'll make sure you guys have this to access. Now, this is not the only personality personalities that you can use, obviously. And this is for a jumping off point for sure so you know if you guys are okay i'm gonna flip my camera here uh, blah blah is everybody okay so far if you're not having problems definitely raise your hand or throw it in the chat i hope my scene you guys can see my screen i hope with my very awful sketch yes me. Yes. so personality wise hmm. uh, let's say I'm, I'm, this is, none of this could, you know, anything I write here may, may not work. You know, the things I, I like, for me personally, like when I think that I square off, means are things that I want, I may want to expand. And the things I circle is questionable as, I started with monsters, so I want to stay with that, or I want to go into something else that just came up. So it's like, this is not like standard, this is just myself, so that I know for myself what I was thinking at that time. Because I don't want to write down everything, I was, all my thoughts down, because then I'll be stuck writing the thought down and not letting my brain uh, work and expand what I'm doing quickly enough. So this is why I have these kind of weird markings. Use whatever works for you, for sure. So right now I have her as being afraid. Um, I don't know. What else do I want to make her vengeful? Uh, no. Nah. Sad. Yeah, really angry. Um, I'm running really fast because I'm trying to think of, mm, if I want to keep it like that. Because my thought process is that sometimes I would try writing a word, I don't like it, or the, like for this case, character personality, and I strike it out. It's because it's, it doesn't work with where I want to go. I and mean, sometimes I would just not do that and just put a line through so I can keep it. But I know for sure I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to make her happy. <laughs> so it's kind of odd. Um, I don't know. Well, that's what I want to do for her personality. Um, trust. Uh, no, maybe trust issues. Let's do that. So I'm going to keep it. Her definitely angry. Not afraid, though. Most likely sad, and then maybe because uh, when she realizes something, realizes she's at, or I'm gonna be at simple for a second there, at fault, for what? I don't know yet, but there's something I might need to expand on later. So that's part of what I'm gonna be doing. I'm pretty sure Dom is now going, what are you doing? <laughs> With this, so let me go back to my share screen when I can flip my camera back. Oop! Hope you can see that, and I'll go back to this. So my next thing, ah, to do. Let's go. Hoping I can click. There we go. So character's personality. Good, and you can also talk about good evil. But fears and weaknesses. Um, let's see what how much time we have before I start flipping. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna flip back to the camera just yet, but you guys can definitely work on fears and weaknesses if you wish on your own. And I'll share my camera once I get mine done, I guess. So you can have this on your screen. Hmm. So, oh, I know that's a good one, actually. So, the funny thing with what I'm doing, um, the artist usually doesn't see my thought process. Um, I usually get it down so I nail it down where I, where I think it should go and then make a doc uh, document and then send it over, which is basically at the end of all of this will become a character description. Now, if Dom, if I send this to Dom, he'd probably be wondering what the heck is he looking at because it's just probably group on the page. But this is just basically my worksheet for myself. Um, if everybody's good with this, I'm going to flip back in a minute. Um, 
Uh, now, the thing about let me, let me get my pointer out here for like for fears and weaknesses. It doesn't have to be something generic of like be easily being triggered or being confident. It could be actually a phrase, right? Um, like for my character, you'll see that uh, uh, you'll be you'll be seeing why right here. If I, if I get my pen to work, hello. Let me flip my camera back. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. There we go. So I started with it gets mad easily. And, uh, it, it, and this I know will stem from uh, this for sure. This will connect to that as to why she gets mad easily. But as I said, for fears and weaknesses, it doesn't have to be a generic thing like, you know, always getting, getting mad easily. It could be literally a phrase, like for my for my particular character, it's one of her fears is staying as a monster forever and not being able to change back to herself. So that's one of the fears I have here. Uh, and that also stems into her weakness because this would be a driving force for her to do things because she doesn't want to be this way. Yes, it connects to motivation. And that's the point. These All these things are related to each other uh, because they are they are part of the character here. So even though things might be swapped back and forth and things that you know, I can have that, that category, and it should be part of this category and this could be this category, doesn't really matter. But what matters is that all these things build up the inside of your character. So regardless of where you stick it, even if you go, oh, this should be in this character, doesn't matter. As long as you write it down and you have it, then, then you know for sure uh, that you have it. Um, and then you can use it. How you doing there, Dom? You doing okay? I'm already having fun with this character. I was uh, for tomorrow. I'm actually because I started doing a bit doodle the the first approach, and then what you were developing uh, the monster, uh -huh. and I realized now, and it's going to be great for tomorrow because I think the solution is actually in between. Uh -huh. And I look forward to like tomorrow, like showing like here's my first approach, like you know, based on the description, based on like when I see it written, literally what I my, how I think, and then seen from your thought process and then now uh, i'm going to illustrate the version that you drew with the jeweled forehead and everything uh, that creature so i'll be doing that monster and then what normally happens is that compromise uh look and you realize like for the scenes and all of this will flow really well like you know how it'll illustrate so for tomorrow it's gonna be a lot of fun i'm i'm, I'm gonna be after this guys i'm gonna be drawing this and uh uh after like i'll be sharing it and at, at the very beginning of the uh, workshop and then I'll take you through how I did it. I'm going to redraw from scratch and we'll, we're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah, like that's, that's perfect. Like, like this is what's happening between <laughs> what's happening between me and, and Dom is actually what would happen in the studio. We're uh, fine kids. We're fine. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what happens in a studio is when you're in physically in the same space, be it virtually or, or physically, um, this is what happens because as you just sickly inspire each other, so it uh, doesn't matter what industry it's in. I've done this in, in mobile games to uh, comics to what have you. Even the toys. It's the, even the toy industry is interesting because we would start grabbing. And it sounds weird when you have, when you say it out loud, but I think growing up grabbing up toys, and then basically pushing the envelope on the ideas and stuff. Sometimes people throw some people throw out ideas, and you would add it to your character development and and or uh, character sketch there. Um, so that's what's happening between me and Dom and. It's, it's kind of a uh, sort of a interesting way of seeing it happen in front of you guys at the same time. Because honestly, this is the first time Dom and I are making this character. He had no idea what I was doing. Uh, honestly, I had no idea what I was doing. I just know I didn't want to do a superhero. So <laughs> that, that, that was my only caveat, and that was it. So um, it will be interesting to see what he does with what I'm doing. Can I show a preview of my little doodle? Sure, go ahead, man. Um, let me let me stop sharing. I'll need my you screen. to close the share screen. Yeah, All right, go. and I'll share mine. And this after our session, I'm going to be, uh, you know, doing the character. So as he was like doing the description, it's like okay, uh, magic, science, or something flowing, something familiar, like certain cut, like something ain't old, but you know can be kind of sci-fi. And I thought like, oh, maybe a fractured like type mask. Oh, jewels. Yes. Okay, Medusa. Maybe these robotic tentacle things are part of that mask. Why is the mask hiding? Oh, maybe behind the mask is this monstrous face that you were drawing. 
So that's why the purpose. So I'm just trying to get an idea, like, well, a bit of the wardrobe, but silhouette, but it's like, oh, huh, could do something interesting that's like, what you were when you're drawing the monster? It's like, okay, so that's the face plate, and that connects to the jewel like yeah, that you had in the forehead on your head, like on your on your doodle. Hmm. Yeah, I see that. So I'll be doing like two approaches. The more the more like the uh the first initial like Medusa, when I was like that, that was ingrained in my head when that seed was planted. So I'll do Medusa. And then I'll do like the 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 more like a monster version, and then from there is like we could see like what elements we like and we want to keep and which ones we want to pull uh, push back, and that'll be a lot of fun for tomorrow. Oh yeah, and I'll be expecting you to chime in because like you know as we're doing the progress, like Howard, what do you think? Because from Rice's perspective, you'll see like yeah, in that world, that character I think when look like that or when need to wear anything like that, those are key details. For consistency and accuracy there it's like you know that i need from the writer yep I, well i definitely will be there tomorrow don't worry uh, hopefully we'll have our tech stuff <laughs> by then as well um let's see where we are oh yes motivation yes oh where's my point here? here we go so motivation as i mentioned before that's definitely needed um for your character and i said this is not this is sort of short list so you definitely can go beyond this um mine uh let's see let me get my camera set uh, it's not working give me a second sorry a little technical difficulty here i don't know i had to stop sharing first da -da. this camera. camera three there you go. There we go yep camera three so some let's write down with, with motivation some vengeance um I, I'll put love for now. Love is always the. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, guys. I always throw in love as one motivation, my first motivation usually, because it's one of the easiest things <laughs> to start with. Because it's it can go either way, and can go a lot of different ways. So it's it's always great to have that. Um, hmm. Vengeance, love, uh, da, 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 da. fear, possibly. Well, I wrote down this when you were talking. Uh, you know. Unfortunately, it's like it's probably obviously from the show Asian Aliens. So, if it was like an old alien witch or an old age or, or an old ancient alien uh, jewel that cursed a modern day witch, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm as I said, I'm still playing around with it. So, it's one of those things where I'm like, I like ancient aliens, I like it having an old. So, instead of having you know, what that's life, interesting is because you could see like, oh, this made this the legend that inspired like the, the tale of Medusa. And you realize, like, oh, it's like chariots of the gods. It's like, oh, it wasn't a god, oh, they were from the heavens, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So, it's sort of that aspect of instead of saying that sci fi always has to be or it has to be like new and, and forward, it can actually be old, right? So, it can be old. I can read that down here really terribly. So you can always treat things like that. So even when you say like um, a genre like a, like a Western, right? You'll see people like add, make a subgenre, uh, like a sci-fi Western, right? So you can always play with it. Even within this confine of, of genres, you can always make a subgenre. So sometimes and I have for to examples say, of like a sci-fi Western is like recent Cowboy Bebop. There was a Firefly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, wow! In some yeah. regards, Star Wars, but if you uh, more like Solo, I would say. Uh, yeah. Man Mandalorian. Yeah, definitely, definitely Mandalorian. Mandalorian is basically a western with 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 uh, <laughs> a sci-fi western for sure, absolutely. Because even the music is is definitely harkening back to the Clint Eastwood days, mm -hmm. <laughs> for mm -hmm. sure, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, this, love this it, spaghetti love western. it. <laughs> the, the spaghetti western, so it's like a sci-fi spaghetti western. Wow, that actually that rolls off your tongue. That's actually kind of nice. So for motivation right now, let's see: uh, vengeance, love, fear. Mm, no, no, yeah. Let's see. Staying. The, well, that's actually fear of that. Uh, hmm. Let's find out what makes her sad. So even for motivation. I might have a question of what her motivation is, but I definitely want to do something with this. So I don't know yet. So as I said, these are like my working notes. I would not usually, I would not give this to uh, an artist 
I think I'll go for it. But this, if it was like in the same studio, like space, like what we're doing right now, for him to see this is fine because he can hear me talking about it, so he knows what's happening. So, but for me, I have a really clear idea what's going on. I know it looks like a mess right now, but if you didn't follow me from the start, if I just plopped this down, that would be pretty terrible, I think. But I think one of her motivations is going to be definitely from her sadness. I think she's going to be pretty, pretty sad though. Angry and sad, angry sad, <laughs> um, for sure. I think that's I'm going to go to my jumping off point. So I'm going to flip back to. Well, angry sad. There's like that. There, there you go. There's a motivation. It's like you know, there's a great loss due to a great love, and now fear of like that whatever took that away returning perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Know. Well, exactly. That's why I always have. <laughs> it sounds bad to say that. I always use love as my motivation, but it, it, it's a good jumping off point. It doesn't have to be the only one for sure. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like love, like towards uh, another, it could be like someone's love of their hometown that was burnt, that was destroyed, and they assume revenge for that, or they turn towards the dark side because it was as a result of that, or love of uh, uh, knowledge or like uh, never ending story. You know, everyone's heart uh, gets broken by the tray of, you know, lose his, uh, uh, what is it, heart attack? Artax and the Swamp of Sadness. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, that's a horrible, sad. <laughs> yes. That scene that makes every person cry when they were a kid watching it. That was like a big sloppy moment in the theater. Oh God, I just remember which theater I watched it into. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> that's, so did that's, I. <laughs> everybody, any one of the heart would cry. Um, and it's true. Uh, I still get sad when I, when I rewatch that film. I've never read the book though, which is odd enough. Um, I don't know why. It's funny. I just ordered it. I'll let you know. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, oh, that, that's if you're that's, okay. Something is wrong with that. Ah, uh, having technical difficulties, people. Um, I think we went backwards for. Okay, it's not staying, and I'm not gonna like to fiddle it too much because I'm looking at my time, and so time is coming up real quick. So relationships, as we mentioned, is like anybody. Uh, that the character be related, you know, having a relationship with, be it friends, family, what have you. Uh, so let me get to it. You guys can do it to yours too. I don't initially know. No, I never thought about this one yet for our character. So relationships. So I don't know. Hmm. Um, maybe a sister, possibly. Do you think time uh, said do you think there's time travel involved? Can be. I'll write that down. I, I okay, I'll be I'll be honest with you, I'm not a real big fan of time travel. I'm just thinking thing. like perhaps she she she's uh trying to preserve her bloodline. Yeah, possibly. But like even though it's in the future of the story, she's from the far, far, far future. It kind of reminds me of uh oh bloody poop oh yeah, good omens. From uh, <laughs> that was terrible. Neil Gaiman and Terry wow. Pratchett. Thank you. Oh, that's terrible. How can I forget that name? Eh? But there we go. So Good Omens. Uh, the the series is on Amazon Prime, but the book is fantastic. I, I can it tell is, you right now. Yeah. I can tell you right now that the series is very very well done. It's definitely like the book. So yes, you could literally watch it and then read it later. Um, and like in terms of character development, you can't have two wonderfully contrasting characters that have excellent chemistry and that goes with your points about relationship too it's like those two being like best friends and like you know each other's like you know uh like i, I would say truest love like been there since like, their very existence but uh it's that that's excellent chemistry like that's when you're talking like in the aspect of your relationships those two characters michael sheen and david Tennant did such a great job Oh, the fantastic, absolutely fantastic job. So it's a great series. Definitely watch it. Um, it, you be, it. It's so funny. I mean... Princess Bride funny. Yes. It's that kind of humor. <laughs> um, definitely. And when you talked about witches, that's when I thought about like the, 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 you know, the ones that were witches and then... Uh, oh, I forgot her name. I'm thinking characters name. I'm trying to like focus on this, but the one that wrote the... the, the predicted the future right down to the apple stocks that that killed me <laughs> that literally just slayed me um from the tv series they, they, it's a little different from the books because the book is dated but so they updated some of the aspects of things like the see, I'm not, so i don't want to like 
spoiler event, uh, for sure. If I mention that, maybe I won't. But they have witches in it, and, and season two is filming. Actually, I, I know. Thank God. Another um, thing that's filming this month uh, is uh, Interview with the Vampire, the series for AFC. Yeah. And from from a writer, like from a character. Uh, now, here's the funny thing. It's like uh, earlier, Howard and I were talking about like the MacGuffins when you hear about a title. Like it's uh, like Tron, for example, with the movie Tron. Tron is the character himself. It's actually a supporting character in the original movie, and he's barely in it in Tron Legacy. But there's a city that's named after him. Everything references Tron. He's the MacGuffins. Like that's the plot device of the title that, you know, that ties everything together in terms of the relationship with Flynn. And then you have like uh, with. Uh, uh, Jeez, what was I talking about before Tron? I don't know. I'm sorry. I was, I it's funny. Yeah, my relationships there, but my McGuffin was like, I was just thinking about another another property that was like perfect as an example, but I got oh, lost right. on Tron. Don't worry. I was working. I was working on this. So, um, so right now for relationships, I have a sister that's possible uh, involving in the love triangle with her, possibly. And then I thought about maybe her mentor was the one who betrayed her because she was part of the love triangle and not the sister. And I'm not going to check that down for now. Oh. Interview with the Vampire, the title. Yes, yes. The Vampire is not Lestat. That in the whole series, everyone thinks, it "Oh, is. Lestat." It's actually Louis, Louis oh. Zuponslak, who's doing the interview. Yeah, yeah. And Lestat is talked about in the beginning, but then eventually, you know, for the good for for a good part of the book, Lestat doesn't appear. It's all about the story of Louis doing the interview. He's the vampire, but the you love Lestat. You like there's something, but that's because of relationships and how they're written. And then when Lestat appears at the end, then the sequel book is The Vampire Lestat. And then he's, of course, he's always been the main character. But Anne Rice wrote it purposefully, uh, Interview the Vampire, and have Louis be the interview, uh, be the interviewee so he, she can build up Lestat. So that way, the story that, you know, she wanted Lestat to tell his perspective. And then his, uh, especially in terms of how his relationship was with Louis and Claudia and all like this, and it just enriches that world building more and more than you have the third book, Queen of the Dam. And when Howard's talking about like here is doing like for love interest like this, these notes, how everything interconnects and you have your your like your mind map. You're just weaving aspects. But from the character development, the world just starts to manifest. It just explodes. And then you see like how the characters connect. And then some that you think will get along, you want them, you realize, you know, it's better for just enemies or frenemies or what or the other way around. So as you can see, like with the notes here, it's like I'm listening, uh, like a, when he writes a story, my job here is that if there's a subtle Easter egg based on this relationship, that like a, something that's a token, like the jewel, right. like, you know, then that uh, as an artist, I'll, I'll put some emphasis, uh, emphasis on it. So it's like if it's a the jewel aspect, if it ties in with a relationship with her, uh, regarding the family, I'll make it look more antique, you know, not just some blank. There's going to be mm. some element like a rune, something that's very distinct about it. So these, when he gives me notes for the character development, uh, I really, I, like I try, I put in the effort, and well, all artists do, to get these tiny little minute details for, uh, to make sure, to ensure that the character is distinct. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that's, that's going to be fun to see how you put it together because I'm still <laughs> trying to figure it out myself. Well, that's, so, a, that's a good thing about the last part for tomorrow's uh, sessions that at the very end, as we start to, you know, refine and do the polish on like, you know, this character, that way we can start adding those little details to the costume or you know, even the color scheme as well. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I know that the time is, I want to make sure I have some time for questions. So I'm going to push a bit. So if you need to find me, I'll put this up or I'll have it up in the chat uh, tomorrow even. So I'm gonna like really quickly go through to the part where we talk about Dom's session. For those who join us late, uh, Dom's session is tomorrow, same time from 10 to 12, uh, with technical difficulties, maybe pushing that a bit, hopefully not. And where he'll be taking, as he mentioned, my gobbly group here, which I will be typing tonight into uh, a very first draft character description for me to work with. As well, he obviously will. He will have it. I'll probably scan this for him because he saw me working it. As like I said, a studio-based version of this, so that will happen as well. Um, if you haven't signed up for this already, uh, definitely do that. It's the same uh, Eventbrite link. You can do that anytime. Hopefully, there's space, uh, and then you can get to it. 
And I'm going to throw it to to crowd here for any questions that you may have. I'm going to flip back and I'll stop sharing my screen. There we go. So does anybody have questions uh, for myself and or Dom even since you're here already? Well, in the meantime, it's like what we're going to what we can do is that when if you're curious, uh about the like session tomorrow there it's like if you're, you're what Terry if you want to do it along just just pencil on paper you know if you have a like a markers are perfectly fine like and it's it's uh it's honestly where it's like whatever you guys are comfortable with if you have any materials so in the beginning I'll ask like if you have a blue pencil or certain things so it's like I'll give you some little tips to get that's great uh this you don't need any form of special paper it's like you know it's it's if you want to work digital and that way we can do a share at the end i fully am encouraged that it'd be great Ooh, there's a question for us there what's your your definition of a frenemy <laughs> dom um <laughs> no um oh that's doctor who and the master oh that's a good one that yeah because they always about to destroy each other but also magneto and professor x that's another really good one uh frenemy uh relationship I want to say, oh, that's a, this is a multi-layered one would be the Batman and the Joker, but it's, it's, that's a very, uh, multi-layered one because without one, the other one doesn't exist. And they basically are from the two sides. It's going to sound weird. They're from, they're going at their motivation that technically is almost the same in a sense. And it sounds going to sound weird, but from two different, uh, perspectives and, and and ways of doing it because batman wants to have everybody you know uh being doing the right thing justice everybody not breaking the laws and whatnot and then joker is like totally what well, seems to be like total anarchy and uh, and random randomness to his, his his madness and crime but it's not um joker is like batman is screaming for attention at what's going on in society but in a different way and pointing out all the bad stuff as well so it's a multi-layered one um i'm thinking of, i'm trying to think of ones that are just very generic uh generic but good frenemies what other frenemies are not as not as geeky because <laughs> we're just geeking out on and learning out in shows and stuff man um so now I'm looking at stuff right now behind me, trying to figure out what would be a good one. Uh, oh, that's a terrible one. Uh, Obi Wan and Anakin. Ugh. Um, again, I get. I'm well, let's that. say like Sherlock, like Sherlock and the uh, the Inspector. Because the Sher yes. uh, like it, it, even in the book, like the series Sherlock, it, it the eased up on it as the, as the series progressed. But in the beginning, you could tell that Sherlock was visibly always annoyed with the police, and he had absolutely no respect. And in the Robert Downey Jr. movies. The inspector is portrayed as a complete imbecile and a bit corrupt. But it's like in the books, he's like, you, you know, you just know that Sherlock never really respected the, uh, the police. But they, they, the police didn't really like Sherlock either, but they needed him to solve a crime. So they had no choice but to work with this guy that he cannot stand. Yeah. And like, you know, it's like, if we're going to arrest you, we would. Like, technically, you're not supposed to be working with us, but here you are. Yeah. And then meanwhile, the Sherlock is like, I'm going to solve this murder for you and just break every jurisdiction and break the law with no consideration and like consequence and I'll figure it out uh, later. But we need each other if we're going to right this wrong. So it's like to one, uh, one goal, one shared common for the greater good. These two people that cannot stand each other are not, are not are exactly enemies, but they are not friends either. They're frenemies. It's like I find like Sherlock, it's like that's a real like, exit dynamic. It's like him with the inspector. Um. Oh, uh, there was a comment in the chat from Roxanne. It was, is Spider-Man and Harry uh, frenemies? Mm. Yes. Uh, not at the beginning of your relationship, but when Harry loses his father, definitely. Uh, especially when, when he, yeah, the green when he gets the exposed to the formula, especially in he develops the same Green Goblin madness. Well, yeah. Uh, in, in the comic books and the movies are slightly different, but in the comic books, yes, Harry. At the beginning was uh P peter's you know best friend uh mm -hmm. and then after his father's death and then when harry found out that his father was a green goblin and took in the same it was a gas but it's a drug whatever uh to turn him into not the green goblin but the no wait did he become the hobgoblin first 
Was he the original Hobgoblin with him? No, the no, original Hob Hobgoblin, Hobgoblin was the first guy that found the suit yeah. and painted, yeah. painted yellow exactly. and changed colors. But Harry took over the Green Goblin and then mm -hmm. sort of reinvented them. Yeah. Uh, but in the movies, so, uh, both Spider Man 3 and Amazing Spider Man 2, Harry Osborne and Spider Man, yeah. it's like the, the, it's the key details. They change the origin, the backstory to fit the narrative for the film and keep it fresh. But I was right, like, there's certain key details. There's like, there's the air of familiarity. So, you know, yes. like, Peter, Harry, old school yep. friends, you, the, the mention in Amazing Spider Man 2, you don't see them in high school like you did with the first Spider Man trilogy, but the fact they mention it establishes that relationship. So, when Harry comes back to town, hey, Peter, they give him motivation. You know, there's a conflict. Harry is desperate. You know, and he's, he's like we we're seeing about when Harry's saying about revenge and motivation at the end when he attacks Peter. And then there's the, you know, with Gwen Stacy, what happens. Yeah. So it's, and then, of course, but then you have like a complete uh, version, a different version of Spider Man 3, uh, where Harry, he was scarred up. You know, he learns the truth about his dad with, uh, with Peter Parker. And instead of going after Peter at the end, he joins him. And to fight off Sandman and Venom. So it's like a friend of me. They were fighting at first, but then comes around and becomes friends. And same thing with the Professor X and uh, Magneto, like in yeah. the movies and the comics. Professor X always carries hope for Eric, Magneto. Yeah. And Magneto, he's sad, he wants to. And the the, the prequel trilogy, I thought that James McAvoy and Michael Fessman were great as the young Professor X and Magneto. You see that relationship develop and how. Oh, by the time that Wolverine is introduced, you know, he understands <laughs> yeah. the dynamic. Now you totally get why he's reacting to like, you know, Professor X and Magneto is wondering, why don't you guys just kill each other? Oh, you have history. Ah. Uh. Yeah. It, it's, I guess, one of the easiest ways to develop a frenemy character uh, or relationship for your characters. It sounds so, this sounds so, sound so bad. And I use this is if you have a sibling. Or, or a cousin or somebody who's close to it as a relative because you can't break because you can't break away from them especially if it's your you know sibling and stuff Sorry. yes spats you know there are points where you like you want to murder them and sometimes you you hang out with them you know but at the end of the day you would help each other because you know your your, your family would have you so that's one way of dealing with it uh to see how the dynamics of a friend and me uh relationship would work is that it's not always it's, it's definitely not in a black and white like we're friends we're going to do this together because you know that's what's going to happen it's more like uh i don't agree with you so i'm going to oppose you but I'm, i don't want to completely annihilate you so and at the same time it, it, it's it pushes the characters into a different realm and, and it like ele elevates their uh, their development wow i just thought of anime that they use that a lot in anime like in for naruto they use that a lot with sasuke like you wouldn't believe. Um, oh, uh, the, uh, the last Airbender with Aang and Zuko. Completely that uh, for the most part of the uh, of the of the seasons, and then at the end there were friends. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of stories you can look up for that, uh, and then it's a very interesting way they could develop a character with relationships because a friend of me does has a tremendous dynamic uh, for how your character would be because. When you start plotting out your story based on your characters that you do, you created that play that plays a huge role in, make, in making the motivation change and shift throughout your story. So that's a great question. Um, and a friend of me doesn't necessarily have to be like the main the characters as a supporting character. A friend of me could be key. And one friend of me, uh, I would say not to anyone specific because he's been reintroduced in the, in the Mandalorian, but it's you kind of see it's like a certain regard. It's like. Um, at first, you kind of think of Lando in Empire Strikes Back uh, as a friend of me because, you know, the betrayal like at, at uh, you know, at Cloud City. And then you have like Solo, the prequel film, which is just established as like, you know, how he knows Han. But then you kind of get why, like, why he's, he's weary of Han. But then you look back at Empire Strikes Back, the way he greets Han, like, Han, buddy, whoa, Han stole your ship. Like he wrecked it when he did the the jump to the parsecs. Like you know, you, you lost your life pod, everything. It's like okay, he's a little too friendly, but you didn't know that because now we established it's established as that that they're more or less frenemies, but then they become friends. Like by, by the time it was Return of the Jedi, like at the end of Empire Strikes Back, although I still don't understand why Lando was wearing uh, Han's clothes, but uh, he promises that they'll they'll find him, 
and uh and he dresses up and infiltrates you know java's uh, palace and he goes from frenemy to friend and you know and then like you know like uh if you think about successor by the time rise of the skywalker because han is has passed his move i passed on uh lando's there and it's uh you know he brings the fleet so it's just like you know it's that, that you can do that you can the frenemy doesn't have to stay a frenemy frenemy can become friend frenemy then enemy or whatever you want or whatever the narrative fits it's what's what's best for your main protagonist when terms of character development and as an artist when power provides me with details like that which is a lot of fun is that you can do mirror aspects you know how they mirror each other but some similarity so if there's these two characters are saying you want them to have the same uh, prestige is like two individuals that have different uh, opinions, like Martin Luther King and Mal uh, Mal Malcolm X. You know, it's like, but it's like that harmony. It's like, you know, you want to kind of like, you know, like uh, John and uh, Paul and the Beatles. You know, it's like, they're not frenemies, but it's like the two, like, you know, it's like they're very, very distinctive styles. So it's just, I'm, I'm just there to carry that uh, visual aspect over. And then Howard, you know, as a, as a writer, you guys will come up with all that rich beautiful history and i just like if you say he gives him a memento what there's something that he has like there's a, an amulet or something it's like what's the amulet this is it just i need to know what it looks like but now when i know the significance if i were to draw it out in the panel or story i know that the focus on certain details on it i know why it's why it's there and uh you know that's for your character development you know you you'll be adding these rich like tapestry of details as it develops and it would just come very organically and that's one thing i can tell you working with writers is that when you get into that creative zone it just like it's like a snowball effect it's bigger and bigger and bigger and richer good feedback oh thank you i i, I thank you for the comment uh i hope i hope we you know you guys pick up something from my banter <laughs> and stuff. I know it's a workshop and I can't go into a lot of details on, on things, but hopefully you guys pick up uh, something that would help you with your uh, creative development um, of your characters because what we'll be doing next weekend is to turn this into a story, into a one-page comic. Uh, not like a full story, but an aspect of a, of a story that I'll come up with. Uh, during that moment i'm not gonna uh, like even work on it i'm gonna work on it live with everybody next week on the saturday which is the 11th of december if i'm right i hope i'm right about that which you know is another workshop and then dom will be there on the 12th to draw whatever that comes to my mind hopefully i can script something decent um <laughs> within that time frame um and i'll be using this character that we're, we're making to you that i made here and you know, definitely, if you want to follow along, use the character that you created as well to uh, start up a story around it. I mean, um, it's one of those things where I usually get the question is, thank you, Roxanne. So I confirmed it's 11th and 12th. Um, thank you, Roxanne. A lot, people, a lot of people jump in and go, I'm going to create a whole entire story. Now I have, you know, all my characters set. You can do that, and there are times where I have to do that. What I like to do is do a short, very short, and I, and I mentioned uh, that I'll be doing a one-pager as a test. Because for me, it's like if I do a one-page story, it won't be a full story. I mean, they'll have aspects of a beginning, middle, and end somewhat. Is that if it doesn't work or something is not clicking, then I know I need to go back and tweak the the the, the building blocks of what i have uh the, the characters the plot subplots and so forth before i go into the scripting aspect of it so uh what i will be doing next week is this to test if this idea works and then see what doesn't work and if it doesn't work i pull things out or change things so um that's part of the creative process as well so that's how you'll see go from character to story and then you can go, you know, go full fledged and do an entire comic book and stuff, or a novel, or uh, animated script, movie script. This is because what we're doing right now it doesn't it can apply to anything. Even when I'm talking about making a comic book next week, that technically can be applied to anything that you're working on. Be it uh, children's book, even which is I've done. I use the same process of creating characters 
and how I plot and develop it. It's exactly the same. Animation thing. too. Uh, yep. Even storyboarding and film. It's like it's very similar. It's very it, the the theory is it's it's adaptable. I can yeah. transfer to those different mediums. Uh, that's one thing I could say and assure everyone. So if everyone ever says like, "Oh, comics can't do film or video game or whatever," Howard just proved that in terms of the literary aspect, in terms of like the written aspect, and I can vouch for that because the bulk of my work, if you were to look it up, it's like certain titles. Like for DC, I was a work for hire. I would do, and they would ask me like, "Can you uh, do the ink these pages?" And it wouldn't be pages like you know Batman talking to Gordon. That's the main story. It would be like the crowd shots or the criminal running down the alleyway. Like these these pages, uh, you know, that have a lot of detail, a lot of bricks, stuff like that. I would help with it with deadlines. Sometimes I help with the lettering. Sometimes I do some color coloring touch ups. But at the same time, I do. Uh, like my day job, I do graphic design for Telesets, so I'm like a graphic designer for Starfleet. But I do freelance work for concept art for film and television throughout the years. My, I've done animation, and I can honestly say a lot of everything that Howard has said, having worked in all these sessions, applies. Even when you have all those notes in your story wall, it's the same thing. Your character development, everything as you're building it, Pixar does the same thing. Everyone I've ever worked with has done exactly the same process. and. One thing that's nice though for next week, when he was when Howard was talking about the panels and stuff that may not be working, I'll be doing some quick little blue pencil storyboards like we would if we were working on a project together and send it back to him. What do you think? And he'll go, Oh, I don't like that. Yeah, that's not that sequence doesn't work. We're not gonna do that for the panel. And that's true. That's all part of the process. So um that next week is gonna be pretty exciting and yeah, <laughs> very involved as well. And then seeing some of the stuff that I have here. Uh, my notes here put together uh, so by next week you'll see somewhat of a fluid typed out character description uh, with other things I mean I things I didn't touch upon are the things that always people fall into to make it uh, they think it's a character description and it is it's part of it it's just like how tall are they how much do they weigh do they have brown or you know what kind of hair color do they have eye color you know and so forth and what do they wear that's all part of it absolutely back to the batman example that is definitely part of it but to me it's one of the easiest parts because the hard part and when it will define what they wear and their hair color and so forth is their their inside what's what's happening inside the motivation uh their character personality and stuff because well the outside yeah it has to reflect you know, being it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a flat media in terms of comics. Well, just illustration art in general. Yeah. That's why you see so many interpretations of Batman. So, like even Iron Man, his suit, every time in, it fits the story in the comics and in the film, every time he has a new suit, even Spider-Man, like in the films, yeah. he has a new suit. And in the comics, you see Batman, he's extremely bulky, like, you know, like in Dark Knight, but then he'd be more lean in the, like a Batman year one story because he's a young man, he's more yep. fit, he's not as scarred up. But it's like whatever will fit it's like as you, it, it, it will come it's like and that's why it's great like with the details the more details like you give like to an artist uh that's good but not like the minute stuff because you know with this has to be redrawn over and over and over again so you just like for time and all like this you want to simplify and streamline certain details but there's those key those little key details be it like uh doctor who the fourth doctor and his amazingly long scarf you know it's like this that that's the one thing that makes him distinct. Like Matt Smith, he had his the bow tie that made him different from every other uh, every other incarnation of the Doctor. You have Iron Man, where he has like all of a sudden they flip the colors. Like in Iron Man three, instead of red and gold, they did gold and red. So it was more, but it was like you know that that suit is like from that story. And that's let's you know you guys are pretty much uh, this is your sandbox to do with what you will. But it's, it's like there's no need to fuss over like you know little little things or every minute detail. They all will come like with a story that's you're creating a character and then uh, next week with the session like tomorrow we're going to do like the visual aspect and how to have some fun with the drawing but for next week in terms of like you know how that applies to the panel work and doing the sequ sequential art and that's what it means just sequential art is like story which is just like one two three four five six you know just an order of chronology that you want people to read the story and how to break it down and another thing too is that with that you'll see that uh, sometimes, like some details, you realize it's too much in a way, it's too distracting. So, we're doing the jewel in the head for next week. I think it's a great idea. But say that Howard told me there's a jewel that's around her neck. And that could be a bit of a challenge. 
because if she's like Medusa if I'm, or whatever design, that's another thing that's moving, that's flying around, and then I have to draw that. But if it's like right there that fits, but you always see the jewel and you know that that's that's the witch. So it's like that's all trying out things, and you've got to take out, you know, you got to add things in later. So it's like, I don't want you guys to ever stress or fret about that. As long as you keep the bare basics of the character, you know, think of it as a jacket, just hang the jet point on the coat hanger. It's still the character. As long as like that hair and everything else, it's like John Constantine. He's known for his red tie and that raincoat, but without that raincoat with the attitude, the personality and the humor, in his demeanor, he's still John Constantine. So it's like for you guys that are you know, like familiar with Hellblazer or watch uh, Legends of Tomorrow using that character that was on there so it's yeah. uh that's the only reason why it's like the end of keanu and constantine see that's another reason keanu played constantine in the comic he's blonde in legends of tomorrow that's exactly how he's written with a red tie and the brown raincoat and the white yep. shirt but you have keanu reeves that played the the character in a big budget hollywood film who looks nothing and he's not even british like he's and in, in the comic he's british but the core aspect of who constantine is was there even from the smoking, the cancer, like when he has, he has the cancer, that was, that's his, that's his, uh, his, uh, weakness, his vulnerability and him just how he pro talks to the characters nonchalant, like Gabriel, the Archangel Gabriel, right? And like in the, in the dialogue scene in the church, but that still keeps it constant. So you hear in Keanu Reeves is playing this character. That's nothing like in a comic. You'll accept it as soon as you watch it. So it's like, yeah. you know, we don't care when they change race or they change gender of a character mm -hmm. as long as they retain those key elements. Yeah, that's what exactly. that's what makes creates a character. Yeah, exactly. Because it's there it's the inside that, that he exuded because oh group, I forgot who created <laughs> wait, who created Constantine again? Oh poof. Anyways, they based they based Constantine on like Sting, the singer and, and uh, the yeah. character, right? So, yeah. but <laughs> But the fact is, as long as you keep the core, the core aspects, which is specifically their motivation, their personality, their history, whatever, in intact, doesn't matter what they wear. I mean, how many times have we seen Batman not wear the Batman suit and still be Batman? Um, you know, when we see, actually, like, I watched it recently, James Bond, James Bond's not always in a tuxedo. Sometimes he's not in a tuxedo at all, right? Uh, like in the recent movie, he never wore a tuxedo, but he's still James Bond, right? It's so sort of those those kind of things because it's it's really you notice that character immediately because of how they are, um, then what they're wearing. So what they're wearing, yes, it's it's important, but to me, it's sort of that that's the last thing I would think about, uh, you know, because I can. It that's should just change reflect stuff. exactly what the writer yeah. puts on the page in terms of the personality. If they're more uh, more powerful, for example, then I'll, I would design a silhouette or a shape that has some grandeur to it. If it's more subdued and more mellow, uh, like in uh, the recent Loki series, was a great way to reinterpret like the character Loki in so many different ways. Like, yeah, like you know, let's turn him into an alligator. Why not? You know, but it's still Loki, and as classic Loki says, he's green, isn't he? And then he has the horns. So it's like there's certain key aspects, like. Okay, you can't really refute that that's not a Loki. But, and then you have, like, when you saw classic Loki played by the Richard, brilliant, brilliant Richard E. Grant, fans of the comics, the original comics, it's like, okay, you see Tom Hilston, you say, that's your Loki. That is Loki. But when you see Richard E. Grant with that costume and the silly tights, you're not mad. <laughs> because you, it's, it's all these key original details. And you realize how ridiculous that if you did a literal interpretation of that character, put him on screen, doesn't really work like yeah you know what he still looks awesome it's like it does stick out but it makes him distinct that you loved it so much because it, it retains so much of those values and from kid loki president loki which was a character in the comic okay. and you know, the tom hilston as the new as the variant is the loki when you think about it he's not the loki from the uh the first thor film he's not even the same loki from the avengers film he's you know he's friends with mobius at the end the relationships define him in that story uh, in that story arc and then Sylvie, his other alternate, and the way that she's drawn with the half broken horn and it's much smaller, the hood, more subdued, more stealthy. So it's like, she's trying to be quiet. So I I, I, can, I can assure you, like the writer wrote, like the, the variant for Sylvie is very discreet and shadowy and all of the, these little details. And when they did design, when Andy Park did the design, I think it was Andy Park. 
Uh, it should be. It should be because he does. He does. He does all the. Stuff I know he worked Marvel on Wandavision. Studios. Like I know. I know he did all stuff on Wandavision. He should but... be him because he does all the Marvel Studios. At least the fir- the, fir- the the first primary designs and, and yeah. whatever happens happens right. But I, I think at least he was supervisor uh, uh, for it. But for like sure. for Sylvie, it, it, like what makes her a bit different from the other Loki's? For one, you know, the first thing you notice is the the half half with like broken horn, the smaller horn, uh, and like an actual like nice crown. Second, blonde. But when she was young in the flashback, she was brunette like the other Loki's. So blonde. So that way, but you accepted it. You accepted it as as it as it progressed, like the story is like, but she has different hair. But the other all, all the other Lokis are have are brunettes or, or dark hair. But it's so that when you see Sylvie on that screen on that shot, it's just the smallest detail, just a slight change of hair color. That whatever you see, all the characters, you know that that's that's Sylvie. That's the other Loki, and that's why they kept them with his uh, agency outfit, you know, and then present Loki with the vest. It's like these certain key details, but that ref- is a reflection of what you guys write, like about how that character is interpreted. And that's, that's my job. It's like, you know, or if you're an illustrator, if you're creative as well, you're going to come with that too. You're going to come with certain details to make them distinctively different from the other. But it's, you know, it's, that's why it's like, it's so much fun. It's like the character of Loki from the old classic Norse mythology interpretation, what he looked like. And then from like what it is now, you have so much fun so long as you have the trickster you know aspect of it you have the magic aspect you acknowledge a bit of asgard you don't have to say norse but as like asgardian just certain details and it'll, it'll still loki exactly so is there any more any other questions you guys have i know we're bantering off because this is what we do <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, we're, we're making up here for the half hour also that uh, we lost there for so, the exactly. like, issues but the q a was supposed to be like about uh half hour 45 minutes yeah but because, we figured we'd just be yeah. candid with you yeah um, so if you have any questions or if you ha- if you want to like share what you have or want us to comment on stuff that you worked on uh during the session you know let us know you can always like throw it on the chat or you know let us just <laughs> show your screen i guess uh through the uh if you want uh and reveal what you have if you want us to take a look uh, we're here for that uh, if you'd like to say hi to grogu behind howard yes oh that's actually that was actually cool that was actually uh, uh made from a relative in hong kong because my <laughs> he he asked my kids like what do you would like me to croquet because i just learned how to do this and, he's, and they're like Baby Yoda, he's like, what? Because they don't get they don't get uh, Disney Plus in Hong Kong. So I was like, wow, I, that was an interesting aspect for character. I had to explain what Baby Yoda was to someone who has no access to Disney Plus, so he has no idea what this is about. And I had to explain it, and I showed images, and I was like, so this is the character from a new series that's a branch off of Star Wars. And you know Star Wars? Like, great. So this is the time period it happens <laughs> right here in between these two time periods. Like. So stormtroopers that you know exist, thank God, and Jedi exist, but we they're not abundant or, you know, probably maybe possibly not existent because we didn't know at that time uh, when, when he was making this. And I was trying to explain what a Mandalorian was. And he's like, so like Bobo Fett, like, yes, but no, because he has the armor, but he's not Mandalorian. And then you, you go through the mythos and stuff real quick. And I'm like, so this is what baby Yoda is. Mention Yoda as a child. Um, and is this somewhat the same height ish and whatnot trying to figure it out so it was really interesting to explain that to him and then when i got the images sent to him he's like so it's like yoda but not i'm like that's what i said at the beginning but you wouldn't understand that unless i get all the backstory and the history and the connecting to what he knew and that's one of the things that um i get he didn't get to touch upon here is the fact that one of the things that uh, a key thing for a character is to uh, for for audience to connect with a character is to have something, a touch point, that they can relate to really quickly. So it's like uh, you know I, I you know maybe a character was tricked uh, into losing something, so they're very angry, so they're going out for revenge. It's like that happened to me. I was you know I got scammed for whatever. So you have that feeling that you're like you're already in you're already, as a reader you're invested in your kid in that character because they're they're experiencing the same thing as me but they're able to do something beyond what I can do. Um, and that's a lot of, all the things at the back of my shelf here that it's basically that, right? Um, any writer, 
uh, uh, and artists, uh, they do that. They will look at characters like, okay, so this happened to me and I didn't like it. So what would I, what would have I liked to have done or be able to do? Why people like like you know why people like, I would I wish I was Batman. I wish I was Wonder Woman. I wish I was as a kid, especially growing up, it's because it empowers you to do something beyond your ability. So your character is an embodiment of your wishes, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me, would I like to have uh, Bruce Wayne's ability, physical traits, you know, his martial arts, his brain, the detective brain? Absolutely. Would I want to be this mopey, brooding, sad person? No. <laughs> right? uh, but why would I want those other traits? Because it allows me to do other things that I can't do. Um, it, it, it's a weird thing. It's like, it's like growing up, it's like, would you like to be Spider-Man? The first thing the kids would say, yeah, I would love to be Spider-Man. But they don't think about what defined him, which is the, his, his, the death of his uncle due to his, his inaction. Right? Um, and you know, growing up, you see Spider-Man in a different light. Do I want to be like Spider-Man? No, okay, that's really sad. I mean, the whole my whole existence is guilt. <laughs> the whole like, reason. Well, one character is like I thought was uh, interesting too. It's like I, I find like in films they don't really interpret it uh, too well. It's like um, Superman. Why is he like with godlike like powers? Why is he so good? If you think about it, he's an orphan, and he was adopted. Feels all man out. And it's like. Um, of course, it's, it may not be uh, obvious, but like, you know, I'm, I'm actually uh, half, half Chinese. So it's like growing up in a, a small town, uh, being half French and half Chinese, I was like the token Asian guy. So was, as a kid, there was like, I got, um, I got, I got picked on and beat up, uh, beat up a lot and dealt with all that stuff as any kid would, you know, it's like childhood, not the dissimilar to like Harry Potter in that regard from like, you know, school bullies. But the funny thing is like, instead of humor, it's like, it's drawing, uh, doing drawings and stuff like that. And, that's when I found like, you know, other friends, like uh, I'm not really a writer, but friends of mine, there's growing up, like they have great story ideas. We watch cartoons and like come up like, oh, what if we did this scenario? And I would just doodle it and draw it. Started, you know, and it's like becoming more friends. I found like, you know, with the whole collaborative uh, process, it's like, you know, uh, with that's like you, that's what motivated motivated me to work with other people. And I found that with Superman, like being adopted, it's like what I like about him is that similar to me is that we both grew up in the country. I wasn't adopted, but felt like a bit of an outcast. It's that my people are far away. And like at the time in the eighties, like it's always letters or the odd long distance call. But I felt like that detachment, like I, I the, the town that didn't make us feel that we were, we were different. And, uh, and then no hate, nothing like that, just different. So it's like, you know, you can go one path if you if you were treated badly. And I will say I was not. It was just that people at the time were not as educated, didn't know how to interact and just interact with another Eurasian kid like normal. And it's it quickly that became the case. It's like with Superman, you see like how being alone, like in this backstory, he had uh, Ma and Pa Kent that always like imposed like, you know, these values. And then his, with his uh, friendship, his best friend growing up was Lana. It's like, you know, that was one thing. It was like, since the thirties, like, you know, so it wasn't another ma male buddy or like that. His best friend growing up was a girl. This is in thirties, depression era. Like Joe's sister, Jerry Siegel wanted that and acknowledged that, wrote that at the time. It was always, every cliche was like, you know, male cliche machismo buddyhood, this brotherhood. Superman's best friend growing up was Lana Lang. And his first person he admitted and told his identity is not his identity. And they say identity. It's more like he told her the truth about that. He was different and about his abilities because he wasn't Superman yet. He didn't put on the S he's still Clark Kent. He's still not kal -El. He's still like, not doesn't know about his Kryptonian heritage. And those are the aspects that humanizes. I find Superman is that is, is, is uh, origin and character development is 100% focused, not on the fact that he's an alien. Now, the fact that he has powers is that he's a child that was alone, that was raised with a lot of love, who always felt that he was uh, the odd, man, uh, odd person out, but was endlessly reassured by those that loved him that, you know, you can, you're, you can do good with this. And that's why when Howard's talking about love as a great motivation, is that, you know, that love and sense of hope is being contagious. He, this character, you know, we, we fall Superman and he, you know, saves the day, we see him in comics and film, die and be resurrected, you know, and just be an embodiment of hope. 
and then you have like with the supergirl and like the whole it just it just blew up like this whole mythology about droids and what the s stands for and all like this but in the core in the deep down core it's just a just a, a child that grew up in a small town of a small village of kansas and was felt alone he could have been a hockey player you know just without powers and like any he could you know any child can identify with that or you know being a journalist it doesn't matter like he that's what he went to do for his day job is journalism you know that defines that says a lot about the character about how he grew up and like you know the local stories so it's like i find like that's one character it's like uh it doesn't give enough credit and it's a, it, they always focus on the god aspect of superman and not clark Mm-hmm. It's like that's the main thing you should focus on is that boy from Kansas. Well, I mean, it's, an, it's I, I won't say guys. I never worked with DC yet. Hopefully one day. Um, but for Superman, like like most superhero characters, and who'd have a duality, like two two different identities, they well, a lot of creators and writers fall into is that Superman is you know you know his character, and Clark Kent is his secret identity. And I was like. Well, no, but it is, is that the real Clark Kent is Superman and Superman is actually Clark Kent. Um, the fact that anything he does with his powers, abilities, whatever, that, that's, that's part, that's the same person. What he does with them is Clark Kent. Yes. The Clark Kent we see with the glasses and stuff is Superman because he's pre- making sure that that aspect of his, his relationship, his family and himself is protected. So he's actually more... Do we call it Superman uh, when he is in his Clark Kent identity than anything else? It's a lot of shield, like a lot of protection layers. Even his glasses are lined with lead. It doesn't make sense because make lead poisoning everybody around him. But <laughs> his glasses are lined with lead, so you can't have X-ray vision. Which technically, if you think of it, doesn't really make sense because he can technically control that. But anyways, he's doing all these things down to the hair and the way he moves and his his it must be a klutz and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. that's that's really superman you know keeping in check because it's like that for everybody every, every character and we always they, they always think that you know their superhero persona is the real character like, nah no it's actually the, the core character is the real character because if you take out everything from bruce wayne um no i'm harping on dc but if you take away bruce wayne's uh, tragic death of his parents in front of him and a grief in that what had changed him. You take that and you throw it out and you all you have is just Batman. You don't have Batman. Batman's actually Bruce Wayne that made that 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 that's inside driving what we see as Batman, if that makes sense, right? Batman's in the shell and then the heart is actually Bruce Wayne. So and in terms of love relationship, Alfred, if not for Alfred, you know, Batman oh, could man. have gone a very different route. Well, that's another, th- yeah, that's one of those things where you get reinterpretations. One of a, a great a miniseries called Red Sun. I hope that's right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. From Mark Miller and, oh my God. I Superman Red Sun, artist. yeah. I forgot the artist's name. I'm terrible. But Me too, Mark- and I have the book on the shelf. <laughs> I have it on the shelf. Mine's in my basement somewhere. But, but this, it's a reinterpretation of Superman where if, what happens if his little ship fell in Russia? instead of america what would happen what how we would be raised and how would it be like what would he do with those powers and abilities and stuff and it's great because he's like oh he's gonna be evil he's gonna help you know you know destroy you know take over the world and da, da. and that's was the plan for those who raised him which was the government but the core of superman stayed the same he started seeing things and started changing um so the clark kentness of uh, uh that we that we know uh, took basically blossomed, regardless of the fact that he was raised from Russia. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of another character that happened to, and I can't uh, think of it right now. But that was one of those aspects I liked that, of that story is that they didn't make go okay. He was raised by bad people, so he's going to do bad things. End of story. That, that that's too typical, too easy. It's sort of like you mm-hmm. you know. But the thing is. The, the coreness, uh, the core of what Superman is, stayed the same. Uh, another great, oh, that's a good one. Uh, Superman Secret Identities. Oh, well, uh, Stuart Eminent. Yeah, Stuart yep. Eminent and, and Kirk Busick. Oh, I love yes. that writer. And Stuart yes. Eminent is a great guy, too. Um, that's what, to me, was one of the most perfect super. It's going to sound weird when I say it. The most perfect non Superman Superman story. Yeah. Um, not to spoil it completely, but. It's not about the Superman we know. In fact, it's not about Superman. 
It's about imagine if the real world, real our world here, where somebody named their kid Clark because their last name is Kent, and then he basically grows up with the with the fact that the comic book exists, the movies exist, and stuff like that, and but you know the real superheroes don't exist. Um, and then you throw in what happened, you know. So how would that, how what, how that would affect somebody? And then, yeah, there's superpowers that come into play and stuff like that in the storyline. But the core of Superman, they're basically what Kirk Busiek did was show what what happens if we took all of that stuff that we know about Superman and then <laughs> throw it away. And now we're going to rebuild the character as though we know about him like we know today as a fictitious fish, uh, f- fiction character, and then put it onto someone who's real. What would happen? How would that change the narrative of this character and, and, the, and how this character would be? And it was brilliant because I was seeing it and reading it. And I was like, "That's literally what we would do." Because in our minds, we see Superman, alien, blah blah blah, the whole bit, the powers and the whole bit. But now he's not. Now, now he's human. Now he's he's been you know born born and raised like a normal human being. How would that change everything? Would he still, would that person, would that person slash character still be Superman? The way we know, no, uh, not not the not in the comic book way sense, but the core character of Clark Kent definitely. And it was interesting the way his interpretation of it, and they, he he expands well beyond that. But it's like when you read it, it's sort of like, what am I getting myself into? Because it's not really a Superman character, but it is a Superman character, and you keep flip flopping back and forth from that, which is makes it one of the best. Uh, stories I've ever read of a Superman esque character. Um, it's it's such a weird. I don't know how you pitch that because it, when you, I, I'm trying to, it's I'm trying Superman. To like it. you, you take all the core elements of the the not the mythology. You 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 yeah. disregard the mythology, just the core aspects of the character of Superman and Clark Kent. Those values, and what if you were to pop it in a real world setting? I found it's like that. It's like. If you would take the Superman code and like in the Matrix and dump it like download it onto someone in the real world, like, you know, well, how would they? It's it's, it's a really well drawn too. But it's it's a yeah. it's a Superman Superman identity was very character focused story, really oh, well yeah. done. It's you know if you can get your hands on it, it's definitely you probably can get it from the library, be it digital or in the real and borrow it. Definitely do and that. Like, Superman for all seasons. That's another oh, good one. Oh my god, yeah, that's a good one too. Then we're geeking this out now. <laughs> for core regarding like core uh, uh, of the character, and it's yes. uh, like as we as we know, like we watch films and it's like we get annoyed. At the, I saw a remark uh, or I think a Rosanne like about Megatron landing in prison. <laughs> prison. <laughs> and uh, I, I would say it's like I was so uh, uh, Howard. And I talked about this long ago. The first Transformers movie, uh, tr- first Transformers movie is released, and. Uh, I, I I was happy that it was like Hugo Weaving doing a voice, but I was like, that's not Megatron. I don't oh. know what that robot is, but that's not Megatron. And I still don't. I, I still feel like you know, I haven't seen Megatron on the big screen in those Michael Bay Transformer films. It's still like that's no, not Megatron because you know the Transformer movie should be this one. It's actually unopened, by the way, too. Yeah, this one. Really? Or, or a, kid, a kid? Yeah, it's unopened because. Uh, it's hilarious. This is like the 30th anniversary edition, as you can see, right? I didn't open this because I didn't buy it. Um, open was, it up. Dare to be stupid. No, uh, not yet. <laughs> I will, maybe one day. I keep saying that, but I don't. Uh, I was literally talking to somebody on LinkedIn who was working at, uh, I think, manga.com, who was like re releasing it in all over England. And I was like, in the theaters. And I was like, it's the, it's the reduxed and beautified and all that. And I was like, I wish I was in England just to watch it because because I know that all the people who would be watching it's like way back way 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 before COVID. Everybody would be watching it. We'd be doing the same thing, like you're just reliving your childhood and watching it for the first time, right? And it's like, do you have a Blu-ray player? I'm like, yeah. I'm sending you one. I'm like, say what? <laughs> so he mailed me. I clearly could have bought it from Walmart, right? But he mailed me all the way from England this copy with his business card and stuff. This is because he was like looking at my stuff and we just started chatting on LinkedIn about uh, why we loved and what we loved about this versus the the live action films, which I'll be honest with you. I mean, as much as I don't like them, kids love them and that helps a lot uh, to expand that property. Um, you know, you know. Um, it's a weird thing where people, when you may imagine a character and they, it loses all the heart. 
Um, and it, well, people harped about the looks of Transformers, and that's one thing for sure that it, it was kind of annoying that they I mean it's so complex, it's really hard because everything gets modeled and you can't see the, de the definitive characters looks already. But their personality was kind of like really weird because they kind of changed them from from the TV series, right? So the cartoon series, we really think about it. Um, they made everybody very like two dimensional, which was terrible, right? And the whole point, because if you Netflix series, the toys that made us, you know, if you follow us, like with the Masters Universe and Transformers, which is like that's where Howard and I we were like we were, we were that demographic, we were that audience when they released it, we were there at the, the prime of it all. And Howard, that's what he does. That he has to go in with his companies and they have a product and they have a license and they repackage it. What's the story? And Master Universe used to come with little comics. Transformers had a, uh, this red plastic thing. You see their stats, and there was a description, a whole story. You knew that was the leader, but what makes them Optimus Prime? So the whole point of the animated series was to, yes, start to sell toys, but they had to flesh out the characters, develop this whole mythology. Same thing with Masters of the Universe. So when when you look at the live action films, I find it's like that's it's a product, it's a byproduct of a product that had a rich storyline. So they're like, they're regurgitating something that, that is completely void of character development. It's just for, it's just a mega long toy commercial. So it doesn't have the heart of like the original animated series. And that's why like they, people say like Bumblebee, why, which I think is the best Transformers movie that has come out. Bumblebee actually has some um, character uh, core developments there with uh, Haley uh, Stifel's character, who's in Hawkeye. And it's like, great, now I can see better than Shia LaBeouf in the first two Transformers movie or anyone else that was partner, uh, Mark Wahlberg. This this girl, this teenage girl, why she wants the car, it's her first car. And it's all, the whole thing, I thought that was that was beautiful. And then Bumblebee's relationship with Optimus Prime, like in the opening narrative and at the end, it's all about that, those core things, you know, you know where less is more, as long as you have those core details. And then I, I felt satisfied with that narrative and, watch, and watching that story. It's like that's Bumblebee's story, but there's Prime. I know who he is and how he is to Bumblebee, and that's everything else. And it's it's uh, with the court uh, like tomorrow, we're gonna have a lot of fun. Like now, it's like I, you know, Howard and I can't thank you guys enough for joining us and being so patient with the the technical issues with the link. We're not sure what what happened. We were here early, 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 waiting and eager to talk to you guys. And tomorrow we're we're gonna do the same thing. Uh, and I, I promise we're gonna have a lot more fun doing some doodling and I welcome like chat during our session tomorrow. So by all means, any questions, more than likely Howard and I have gone through any of uh, uh, those type of case scenarios and we'd be more than happy to share any tips and tricks with you guys. So we'll definitely be here Same tomorrow. Zoom link for tomorrow, just yep. confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Howard, uh, you want to do the quick recap there of the uh, five points there uh, from yesterday? Sure thing. I'm going to do that. And as I do that, I want to let everybody know um, in the chat that we had some technical difficulties for signing people on yesterday, unfortunately. But it's okay. I'm going to do a quick recap of what I did yesterday, which is basically how I build a character quickly. Uh, from all the experiences I had, I'm going to be sharing uh, two files uh, with you guys. And it's going to be in the chat. I'm trying to get to the first one. So this is the first one I'm sending out. And it should be, let's see, should be there. Is it there? Okay, I think it's there. Okay. So this is the workshop I did live uh, yesterday. And it was based on stuff that I did. I'm going to give you a quick see if we can do this real fast so I can I don't want to eat up Dom's time here a quick I'm just amazed quick. that your puppy is perfectly aligned with your shirt it looks like he's wearing a grandizer helmet there you go this is tapioca this she's a oh, how old are you actually I forgot how old you are that's terrible uh, she's always, always I don't know how old are you if that's mom my brain just had it a doesn't late night I just recognize that she's wise beyond her years there you go I have two dogs so the younger one is about a year year and a bit she's a little bit older year and a half year six months six months. okay year and six months i'm sorry um so there you go so i hope you guys can see that so this is some of my tips and tricks that I do, that i use to create characters so the first one here is 
uh, taking a character that you know and changing one aspect of them or the world they live in. So I used uh, Iron Man as an example instead of him having, you know, having uh, existing on the planet Earth is fine, but not having him in New York in his towers. But imagine if he was like in underwater. That was his home. How would you? Ch- how would that change his suit, his mannerisms, his outlook? His perspective on life and how he would conduct himself. So that basically ends up creating a new character. The next second one's Lego method, which you take one thing that you know and smash it with something else. Which maybe, yeah, I got one. So, so think of Star Wars and and Samurai. So if you do Star Wars and Samurai, you'll get something like this. This is actually a toy line from Bandai, which. I picked up. So this is basically a reimagining of a, one of the troopers as a samurai. So you can do something like that. Let me put it down really carefully. Uh, and da, da, da. let's go back to this. Da, da, da. So I'm changing genres. So this is another aspect that I like using too. So imagine Goliath and the Three Bears. It's a fairy tale. It takes place in the forest. Three bears. She goes in their house and basically, you know, <laughs> eats their food, sits in her chair, sleeps in her beds. So, what happens if I change the genre to being sci-fi and it happens in outer space? That would mean that characters that are now astronauts, possibly aliens, and that's a whole kind of different story and then different kind of character. So, using these three things and maybe mixing them up together, you can create characters really quickly as a jumping-off point to develop your own character. Um, other things that uh, I do, let's see if I can, I want to mention here, it's important. <laughs> uh, let's see, maybe this one. Okay, let me stop share here, and I'll share one more screen, and I'll, get, and I'll throw it to Dom. How does that sound? Let's see if I can do that. So you can, use, I guess you guys can see this one, right? Yep. Okay. So, oops. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. So I talked about motivation. Ah, hang on. My dog just touched that. Okay. Let me get back there. Okay. Thank you. Stop touching the mouse. So motivation for your character is important. As you can see here, I have a short list here. You don't have to keep your characters uh, within this within this list. They mix and match. The best is to mix and match. If you think of any character, be it like Batman, which I used yesterday. He's out for vengeance because of uh, hate, possibly. Definitely love for his parents, right? Uh, his, his fear is basically having, he, he was afraid. I mean, think about his whole, his whole concept of his character. He wears a bat because, a bat symbol, and is a bat because that's, that's, he's facing his fear. He's afraid of that. So it's a lot of this aspect of you, you grabbing things from different parts of what would motivate a character. When you start out, it might be easiest to do something that's all the, all the, uh, aligned. But once you start uh, finding your story being too simple, mix and match this stuff and you'll be more complex and it's better. Um, other things I talked about is characters' personalities, fears and weaknesses. These are very important things that make your character. The outlook, the visuals, that's important. But what your character really needs is this stuff uh, to carry them forward? Because is Batman still Batman when he takes off the suit? Yes. Is Superman still Superman taking off the suit? Yes. Every character, even if it's not a non-superhero character, it's exactly the same thing. The thing that defines them isn't the visuals. It helps connect us as a reader to them. But their personalities, their motivations, their fears and weaknesses, that's... The, that's the core aspect of the character that has to carry forward. Because if you watch any film, even like the, the MCU films, um, characters' suits changed. Spider-Man's suits changed every film. Same with Iron Man. Are they not? But they're the same character. Um, and they have, you know, sometimes they have new new abilities, but they're still the same character. Like Thor. Thor's ability changed from it, everything comes from his, his his hammer. But now now we know that he's he's actually you know the conduit for his for his ability of being the god of thunder, um, and that's what we we end up off uh, uh, end up on. So uh, I'm gonna give, throw it back to Dom here. Let's see, and I'll be sharing. So I shared the worksheet, and I'm going to be sharing as he talks the 
refined version, which is like a first draft that I would technically give to the editors slash producers, what have you, uh, because they don't necessarily like looking at my worksheet because it's really hard to look at. <laughs> so I'm going to throw it the DOM and then I will message you guys in the chat the, the refined version. So take it away, DOM. Okay. Thank you guys for joining us. So you're going to actually see the character sheet ahead on my screen, but this way you can actually uh, read it, you know, and then as you know, keep it as reference or as we develop the uh, character design and the process, including the notes that we would get back from editor or art director. So I'm going to share my screen now and just, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but just like, I'm just, uh, just to give you a bit of a preview of what uh, Howard is sharing with you. So here we are. So generally speaking, is when I receive uh, something, be it and uh, when I was a kid, there was not that dissimilar to uh, I started off in animation. Uh, eventually, there I went to uh, like a first for concept design for video games, film, uh, comic books. I would work as a work for hire, filling in for like crowd scenes, doing inking, lettering, uh, doing some stuff for Oni Press. And this is not that dissimilar to what I would normally get. Now, normally you would have, of course, here's the name of the character. So, okay, it's, you know, many or so. Gives me a bit of an idea of like, you know, we're going, oh, seems like, okay, a bit fantasy, a bit alien. Oh, here we go. Alien humanoid. Age 20s, height up to you, weight up to you. Great. And uh, in terms of hairline, long, anime, long and wavy. That means this character is going to have a certain shape in the panels that will make, uh, make them identifiable. Hair color, white with blue highlights. So in terms for the colors there, as for the reference sheet, that's great. So if I have to do the swatches for the tones, I can select those so that way it's consistent throughout not only production, but in print as well. Physical traits, there are two looks for her, alien witch and monster. So, oh, a bit of a challenge. Are they at the same time? Is it like transformation? Does one get more, you know, worse? Is there like a beast mode? Let's have some fun. So the concept of, for the character is an alien witch. Lanky body type. I'm just going to zoom in. So that way we can see, and I'll show you momentarily what quick little sketch that I was thinking of during my debrief, uh, my actually my brief there with Howard yesterday. So lanky body type, kind of clumsy looking, but in that adorable way. She usually has an innocent facial expression. Hmm. Juxtaposition to her monster form. Uh, something we can probably draw some inspiration from here for like, you know, tragic monster aspects like Frankenstein's creature. So as a normal witch, think of combining ancient items that has been passed down to her along with current clothing. That is sci-fi components, maybe a pointy witch's hat that is connected to a fishbowl space helmet. Hmm. Interesting. We'll see. So we'll see how it uh, works there because with the hair and everything else, but See, there's just some challenges that we have to bear into consideration when we do the character from panel to panel. So instead of a broom, we have a uh, atomic age one with a rocket engine at the end of it. Okay. Hogwarts says, I received an upgrade there for Quidditch. As a monster, use her hair color. So description for monster mode. Okay, so alien witch and monster. So the monster used her hair color and eye color to create the association that it is her as a monster. Well, that makes sense there. I'll draw some inspiration from the old Bill Bixby Incredible Hulk TV series. Looks like we have that with the eyes and maybe we can have some fun there. Or like uh, Beauty and the Beast when Raul Perlman played uh, Vincent. Maybe a main using her hair color. Oh, so the Vincent idea seems to be a good uh, direction. We can go do something like that in terms of the hair. Uh, there will be a teardrop red jewel embedded into her forehead. Is the protection spell protecting her unborn child? Refer to background below. All right, will do. Should be clear to see, but not huge. Try different sizes. Let's see what works best. Well, maybe we don't have to go exactly like the vision or small like Raven in uh, Titans. Maybe we can go a little bit larger. It's like, obviously, we have a lot more room to play with, being, of course, not a human character, but humanoid. She will stand upright and has grown in size. Think banner turned into Hulk. Okay, so we have to design this outfit so that way it would expand and not like explode. And that way like contract looks like one way, like small in like witch mode. It looks imposing in a way when it's large, it can still expand and that, you know, like bust out and leave her in very awkward situation if she were to revert back to witch mode. So 
we can see about plates, maybe some armor plates that expand, that contract, that telescope in, you know, and then, you know, that's like, you know, it looks nice and full down, almost like Samurai, which is in witch mode, give it a nice elegant shape. But being the body mass increases, these plates would fold up. So that's something we can bear in mind during the character design. So background. Okay, so I was here like, uh, yeah, she was standing up right, okay. Uh, normal expression is that of anger with a sad expression we can see in her eyes. She's unable to turn herself back, knows she's been tricked by someone. She's trusted and blames herself for what happened to the mage and their child. Maybe no pupils. Skin fur, hmm, we can suggest that. Uh, that of her regular color again to associate this version of her back to her regular form, okay. Now the background, very important. These details like you know that we have to sneak into uh, both the features and uh, of course the costume. A witch in training who is in a relationship with a mage. Okay. Strict and cursed into taking upon a monstrous form by her mentor after it was discovered she was with child. The mentor was circling in love with the mage and jealous of her student's relationship. Before the mentor was able to get rid of the unborn child, the mage cast a protection spell and linked it with the witch as she became a monster. The mage is taken by the mentor and leaves. Huh. Now, fr from there, I'm already thinking, like, when uh, Howard's talking about inspiration, like, drawing it from, like, you know, things that you know. Before, I was thinking of, like, certain films and TV. From here, I'm already thinking about a bit of, like, Arthurian mythology, um, like the Nimue, Lady of the Lake. You know, in terms of, like, in a Nimue, if you're familiar, in terms of, like, she had a relationship with Merlin. And, uh, not to be confused, like, you know, Frank Miller, like, that's the name of the Lady of the Lake. It's, uh, but if you, if you look up Nimue, it's like, and those, uh, how she trapped, like, Merlin in a crystal cave, it's like, huh, that's not that similar. You can kind of, you know, understand motives there. So I'm already drawing inspiration from, like, an outfit gown that's, like, probably around that era. So if, if I'm going to take anything from fantasy, I'll take it something from that. And next, of course, their style direction, Atomic Age, 50s, 60s. Could work so it's like okay we don't have to go steampunk everything can be nice and chrome it's like nice nice full colors we can have something that's definitely sci-fi and go with that age i think it would be very interesting and like crystal ball stuff like that it's like it work really really well it's like you take medieval time medieval times and just made it like new and everything's shiny then we're in the far future it should look like things have been around for a while no new shiny things oh well okay that goes with that okay so we have to do it matt so we're going to do it matt important stuff story takes place in a futuristic time where aliens and magic exist all right so we're going to go a bit final fantasy here along with events tech and all that comes with it thank final fantasy 7 and voltron the hagger aspect and medusa in that case there it's like i understand where howard's coming from it's like the legend of medusa so like you know that feel that from like when we watched like the original uh stop motion of uh, clash of the titans so it's like that's what we want like in the next week segment about when we do like a panel of like how to make comics like the character designs like in silhouette is it still identifiable so i have to take that into consideration when i do the character design so it's moving through the shadows or moving whatever our main character here is instantly recognizable the same way you would recognize batman because of the ears and the cape and superman if he's just floating in the air with a red cape and with a spit curl or spider-man hanging upside down on the thread like a yo-yo so not so important stuff okay i didn't think about the transition look but worst case we can use the old nightcrawler bamf to show it various ecu panels so here's the interesting thing i thought like it is one character but it actually has to be two different character designs so at least i don't have to do it in between things yet we'll see how the what the writer does there is as the plot develops it could be an art where i have to so there's something you kind of have to bear in mind. So now I'm going to go here into what I was doing based on the, the shorter, the shorter brief yesterday. When Howard was talking about it, um, about like a monster, I couldn't help it, but think of, of course, meatloaf, uh, bad out of hell too. I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. So there was a bit of inspiration there when I was thinking about that. So it's like, you know, the two us to two characters. So, and then, to 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 for the mask like this like when uh howard's explained to me like you know certain aspects there i wanted something that's like okay maybe the there's a mask that that looks quite soft and it's kind of like medusa and then it's like these technical things can like wrap around and like you know yeah but when anime can be defensive 
and the mask can is cracked and can actually expand. That could be interesting. So you can kind of like find the opera pieces of the monster can maybe show through, but still like there's humanizing aspects to the features, such as the nose. So I try to do that that for when you explain to me that the creature, the monster is not, you know, the map, the mass and the body type that will come. It's like us when I, I said, like what her, which form her costume or garments going to be, because I want it to be functional. So with this is just like again the features when uh, features of like this jewel on the head. At first I thought it would be something put on that's like a charm. So now it's like I say something that's actually embedded. So not that dissimilar to like anime or manga characters that we've seen. I'm thinking right now, and this is when I would normally pick uh, the writer's brain. I would get in some notes and say, uh, "Have you watched Giver? Do you remember Giver?" And this is yeah. Why do you think of something like that instead of a silver orb? like here that act like with a guy suit you know it's like a third eye and maybe we can do something like that it's like a third eye but it's like when they now that i know that there's nothing with the pupils maybe that's what acts as the as the iris so so, so. right now what dom just said is like there's, I mean, there's always a couple of scenarios one would be you send the stuff off to uh an artist and <laughs> It's seldom, but they, you don't hear back from them, and they just start going and you know, doing their thing, and then give you back uh, first drafts of things based on what they interpret. Uh, but just literally uh, in, in, a, in a vacuum on their own. And the other way would be him or her uh, really going on a call and going through each thing that they wanted to ask questions about to get more details or make suggestions before they do that. So. Um, I purposely let Dom go through the whole thing uh, first, just because that that would be the the usual case. You read everything and look at everything, uh, digest it, and then, you know, in most cases, hopefully, make the call uh, and talk to the writer. And sometimes, depending on the project, uh, the writer's room uh, to ref So, some of the stuff that Dom mentioned, uh, I didn't think about the uh, having a mask and having it being. Part of the 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 monster look, where it, it basically it's a core, sort of her cage on her face, and then it keeps her in her monster form. Um, something that I would I didn't mention on uh, that. I mean, it's a first draft anyway. It's a first draft character description. Is that uh, she doesn't go back and forth. The whole point, the thing is, that she she was she, she was a humanoid alien, but then she was cursed to be a monster indefinitely. So the whole point of the the whole point of the story would be for her to get over her sadness and self guilt of how, how this all happened. Cause she didn't see it happen before it was too late and to basically fix it. So she can save her, her unborn child, uh, the mage and herself at the end of it. But you know, in the back of my head, I didn't think of how far I would go with the story. It was just a quick, I guess, two, two, three sentence plots to have an establishing point of where we would go with the character. Possibly she didn't, you know, uh, right now I'm sitting here and I was talking to Dom, I'd be like, things that pop in my head just now would be that she's doing, she, when she realizes that she, when she sacrifices uh, everything to save others, she would technically would save herself and possibly save her mentor too. So we'll see how that goes. But, uh, and again, uh, even like the, the not important notes where I tell him, when I tell him that there won't be, there's no need for a transition look. It's because in my mind, I know that I can make it work without showing it uh, and using different tricks visually for a comic book. Same thing for animation, you know, the great cloud of smoke and then poof, it's a, the, and, you know, <laughs> the person is transformed. Um, did a lot in comics. Uh, when, when I know I wrote down ECU because it's a short form for extreme close up in, in, in comic book lingo. So instead of um, having uh, wide shot stuff, you'll have like a, a close up of the arm really close, and then you see the arm is, is you know, transformed already, and the eye or the mouth or something really close, you know, extreme close up, and then it's already changed into uh, a mouth with fangs and stuff like that. So there's different ways of helping the artists uh, do their thing without, you know, making them not sleep for, you know, eons, <laughs> but still maintain the crux of how you could tell and evolve the story. Um, the thing that he mentioned about the long hair and the fishbowl helmet, yeah, that's absolutely something that uh, is conflicting for sure. Uh, did I did I see that before uh, I sent it off? No, because I was just throwing out ideas. Like I mentioned the day before, that you don't you don't 
overthink your ideas. You just throw out everything. It's only when you start, the only way an idea can stop progressing is when it's not that we're challenged, but you use basically, I guess, in the worst way of saying it, but the logical progression of will this work? Why does this not work? Is there a, work, a workaround that will make it work? No? Okay, throw it out. Let the re, you know, then we have to go back to it and then retool it. So that's the thing about, you know, I mean, I thought about the visuals of a, of a fishbowl space helmet because I was thinking of the atomic age designs. If you look about that, if you look it up on Google, the atomic age design, it's really nice and beautiful. Um, but it's been done a lot in a lot of films and comic books and other things. And it's usually very shiny and stuff. That's why I like, what happens if we make it old and dirty, but still have that aesthetic and stuff. And that's even like the, the, the teal hair, the teal hair, the teal color, the teal and white color uh, palette was literally from the atomic age stuff that I was looking up on, on, online last night. So um, I would be revealing all this to Dom and showing him like, I mean, most of the times I don't just send text. I would send images as well, like links to things I found on Google and stuff. Uh, so this is what I used for inspiration for this. This is like sort of a, like maybe a, I don't know, a cloak or an engine design that I think might work for whatever for them to give a jumping off point. Well, it's not just to give, you don't just give text to someone. You also give more for like the least for me, I give more. So links, video links, uh, images. Sometimes the vacation photos kind of come into play a lot of times too. <laughs> yeah. So or food pictures. Yeah, we're both foodies. Yeah. But like one thing is like when I was uh, saying like what I when I look at the images it's like okay in terms of functionality you know it's like I can't do like a, a literal glass fishbowl, but it's like what do we like? Do we like like you know uh, the shape and like you know like the suggestion of glass? And it's one thing I I, I like to, in the game Mass Effect. It's like they had like these the really well done like concept designs there for like these holographic displays for the helmet and like you know, repurposed. So it's just like for this here, it's like I'm just like getting a feel for based on more the description of the witch mode and it's like trying to see about these breaks in the mask to show like a more human aspect. So when I show here full on, you know, this way it has a personality. I'm just thinking like you know this way. See, it has. Maybe I can do like a force field, like, you know, like, you know, around mm. these serpents as like, as they move, like when I do the coloring aspect. So it's a bit like a halo. So it's a bit like uh, a deity, but it'll have like, you know, as they're moving around and if I'm doing like some motion lines in the perfect circle, then we'll have a suggestion of that once I do some more coloring and, and touch ups there for the rendering. So it's like right now we're getting a feel for the concept design for the character. And uh, with that here, it's like, you know, so that way I have an idea how everything moves. So I know like, okay, there's going to be one of these guys going here, here, like that, being off this plate. And that way, this nice hair will, will give her some nice grace. But these things will, she be be perfectly still. But these like Medusa-like tentacles, that's part of the face mask, that's not exactly helm, will give nice motion action to her. So that's okay. So we have this and this can wrap around when she's in monster mode and like pull back these pieces to reveal. So like this mask there, if it was like, you know, the tentacle yeah. things are like wrapping around the head to secure or they can deploy as well. That way it's like, okay, I know like the, I would repeat like, you know, the basic like eye, eye shape or proportion and probably do like, you know, the opposite here is like no nose and like, you know, that's why it's like nostrils. That's based on this. So when normally when I would do designs there with like uh, the writer and I would uh, start hammering out the details, um, be it like, you know, one uh, film that I worked on uh, recently, uh, that's I think they want to shoot next year. The concept design, uh, the brief called for uh, here, that way you can see me for a moment. Uh, the brief called for that the the antagonist has a certain prop now this prop uh our is not his head because he knows now this prop does not exist in the real world whatsoever as it's as real as a lightsaber so it's like i'm trying to understand why this grounded character has this weapon that is basically a lightsaber like you know huge melee weapon so I'm looking at functionality. I'm actually researching uh, this character in the backstory is that this person is a uh, cosmonaut. 
So I'm looking at the Russian toolbox for the shuttle to see what parts there would actually make sense and what grade of metal and how would they allow something, a tool like that onto a shuttle? They can't have this huge spear like thing. So I had to, and I'll show you this right now. I'm going to, that's why I want to give you a debrief as I'm stalling so I can open up the folder. And I'll show you like how I had to do this and you know, how that to this character design. And this is for a feature length film. Uh, I cannot say the studio, but uh, I I can say like, uh, I think I can say who's involved, but uh, here we go. You probably could, you probably could say that. Um, for those who, who, who don't, uh, who didn't know, I sent, uh, shared the two files, the work file that he just saw that the Dom showed, as well as the long, the long form that I said that he used and talked about as well. And if you wish to follow along and do your version, please do that. Um, mm -hmm or design your own character and show us and then we can talk about it and then do some critiquing nice critiquing as well um that's always fun as well so you know don't you know please don't just you know, if you want to sit back and relax and, and absorb it that's that's cool too but if you want to like you know go down and and follow along and do your version i'll be very interested in seeing it uh and if you have any questions like the way I would work with Dom or other people in the, in the real, you know, throw a question in the chat and I will answer it uh, as a writer working with an artist if they want to do it that way. So, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I forgot to mention that before. So here we go. Oh yeah, the site. No problem. <laughs> so the, the, the prop, like it was, it was full blown uh, melee weapon. And I was trying to think about like size. So I did this quick mock up to show them, okay, this is when it's fully expanded, but not fully, fully extended, but just like here it is when it's folded in. And before, he, he, this guy was just carrying this huge weapon around. It just didn't make sense when you're running. And I, I, I'm a country boy, and I, I work with that tool. And it, it's not only is it not safe, but it just like it screws up your balance and just didn't make much sense to me. But that's the job that, uh, that that's my job. It's like, you know, to, to help visually make it realistic there so it makes sense. So I designed this weapon. I'll show you the, the actual design momentarily that this would fold in, here are the hinges. It is all parts that he would have access to uh, on the ship that he can easily modify and build. And here's like, I did using some photo reference and some paint there to, to establish like what this, this weapon is. And it says it's, it was a tool that was used for them for space, the, you know, space garbage and to cut up. So how does he make it portable? Now there is a backpack with a line that that uh, energizes and fuels it, and I, I had to I did the research and I worked with the writer, uh, with the screenwriter, so that way you know it's it's just like it's realistic, but also at the same time it's budget friendly because they have to build it, <laughs> they, have to, they have to fabricate it, and it's post production for the effects. So it's like how do we do this? So explain them like based on the script I read, based on the script, it's similar to like what Howard do when they gave me a brief. And it's like here's a character breakdown and here's what the prop is so based on that and reading what other scenes this character is going to be involved in it's like there's no way you can just like strap it like this like captain america's shield there's no way you can like you know with like run it like it's uh, that is weightless like thor's hammer so here it is it's snap and it's here's the thing you'll see momentarily in addition here's a twist the hand that he uses it is mangled so he has to hold it like this. How the, can someone drive and have enough support? So it was not in the script, but it would snap nine degrees, this prop, so that way, but in, and you'll see why, how this builds up to, we talked about silhouette and I'll, I popped them into an actual scene and I'm actually, I got it to work. So with here with the bracer, it folds in, <laughs> folds in under his arm, he can still walk through corridors. He can still, he's not going to bang against, you know, carrying this thing. And he can still drive a vehicle, which is very important because it's like another thing I said, does he carry with him all the time? And I would ask the writer these type of questions. So it's just like, okay, so he's driving this. Yes, I designed the vehicle. Okay, so he's right-handed. Yeah, the throttle's on the right. How does he operate the harpoon? It says, okay, it's on the right. So this thing can't bang up against anything. So it can stay there and arm rest. It can still operate everything and then pull down the switch in this vehicle. So that's the back view so that, of that vehicle. So there's all things just based around this one prop that I had to when I had to design it. So we're designing costume designs and doing explorations. 
the cities of Cosma and Salt. So I use a bit of interstellar and a few other things just to, there's a, everything is like a survival kit. Everything on him was based on real life, some real life tech and some one, one form or another. And this is nowhere near the final design, but it is all part of exploration. So then I started doing quick like sketches about how lighting would be and like just, you know, to see about the shape. So here's there, I'm working on his silhouette. And they, and if you if you can't notice, he's got that weapon right there, folded under his arm, right here. So it's like, for this, it's like they describe him as like, you know, it's like a Kane Hodder, Jason Voorhees, Bane-like character, very imposing, it's like, great. So we proceed with that. And let's see if I can. There we go. How does he look without the helmet? <laughs> sorry. This one here is sorry. It's a bit monstrous. It's like I had to do it at like anatomical states for the makeup. I had to design it like a latex mask. So to see if they can fit it. And that way it's like, how does it look under lighting? So that's the makeup team. I just did a concept design for them to explore. So that's what the final design that's going to be up to them. But here you see here is that suit. So when I designed the suit based on the description, it's a bit of an homage to Planet of the Apes, like that kind of like when, when Howard's saying about Atomic Age, we want to go for like that 70s, you know, Spaceman feel, but something that's familiar. You got a bit of those MCU with the extra straps, with the stitching, different types of texture materials. But at the same time, it seems streamlined like the SpaceX you know, suits. And he's got the, the weapon full extended. And how does it look indoors? How does it play with the environment? So these things in, in terms of character design, it's not just like, you know, we're going to put a cape and like, that's how they look. Great. That's step one. Absolutely. And you, but that's like, you know, you still got a few more steps. How do they blend with their environment? How, what, what is the history story about how the character looks? So I put a crack that looks almost like a skull. Uh, so that way when light hits it, and we all know with broken glass, when light hits, it has a certain glimmer effect. It's just like, you know, certain shine and light moves with it. So him creeping in into frame, I had to bear it in consideration. If he's coming up behind solid darkness, but then hint of light gets those cracks. And it's almost like a grim weeper. So that was a concept behind this character design. It was like I said, okay, I'm going to do him as a space age uh, grim reaper. So darkness, but reverse the color. Instead of a dark shroud, it's like the uh, lighter gray. And it's like, it's, instead of like you know, skull white, you got like the shadow and just with the outline and it reflects behind the helmet that mangled side of his face. So that's it, like playing when I was just doing some studies here and then dropping him in and to show like the team, okay, this, you know, this is how it looks there when it's folded down, when it's secured, that's it without, you know, just like real quick reference enough proportion. The makeup, I'll be like under like certain environments. So it's like, I do apologize, like it's a bit like, you know, for the, the horror movie. Um, so that is here, and I'll show you real quick, just wrapped up uh, the hand. So that's his mangled hand. So I told him you can't, you can't have like the actor. I have to bear in mind that someone has to, has to wear all this too, like in film. Like it's easy in comics, you can get away with pretty much anything. And absolutely. But it's nice to have certain details, what makes it different? So we, I try to do like his hand was so mangled that it healed over time and this tendon scar tissue. So it kind of fused. So that was the idea. So it's like, he, he, yeah, he, he can work it, but it's, it is what it is. So based on the conditions it was in and there with the helmet, you kind of like see it like the crack and try to do design or like try to do an homage to like the, or like John Carpenter films, like from the, from the eighties and some of like the, like Tremors and like some of the movies used to watch rent a blockbuster back in the early nineties. So, but myself, I'm uh, still a sucker for the old Betamax days. So that's, this is him in silhouette. Like I did this as like a Drew Struzan uh, old school movie style poster. And the same thing applies to comic book and animation. Whenever you want to get that certain shape, you know, certain like features, like, you know, it's an astronaut, but yet not the subtle details and just like how the cheekbones were in the helmet were all done on purpose. So that way, certain lighting, you get like the skull, like it's something that's kind of like a skeletal, but with the suit itself, you get the ball composing nature, it absorbs the light from his weapon. So it like reflects and the fact it's matte black there on one side, but it hits, hits the reflection was things there working with the screenwriters and with the producers 
for this film. And when, like with their feedback from the director, uh, the, you know, you, you do pick your battles and I show them like with the, with a vehicle, with a Rover in the background, I says, I, I see it as like a scorpion. So it's like, okay, this is something he can easily, uh, like make and like, you know, can ha maintain in the desert and like in the environment that the story takes place. But to have like, you know, this bit of an homage, like, you know, those films we used to grow up with, like Razorback by Russell McCahey and all these other like Paul Hart films that a lot of new film, a lot, of, a lot of young filmmakers are adapting today that we've noticed, like with uh, Color of Space with Nicolas Cage and like, you know, not, not afraid to use color and lighting to establish mood where less is more. And you see here, even though I put all those details, like we talked about earlier about MCU character designs for the film, they still keep certain key details so you always know that it's them and that way with here my my emphasis was his size the weapon and the like the, of course the helmet it's like an astronaut but not so when we're talking about like a fishbowl that was actually one approach that they wanted i was a bit against it because i didn't want to do anything too similar not only to the fact that mysterio just appeared and and uh spider-man um uh, uh away from home so it's like the fishbowl thing was like a little too literal on the nose so it's like okay and there was a quite a few cosmetic films already but how do we get the shape so as i figured i'll just raise the top part of the helmet the very very top you know that way it's like that it has like that the blackness of like a shark's eye so it's like okay we still got like a bit of a fishbowl and there's these led lights that are not really working maybe two here and one over here so these are little details there that I, I always try to put into consideration here, even the mission patch. That's like a little history. So it's like if you ever zoom in or in a close up in a panel of a comic book or in a frame like in film or animation or in the video game, there's these little Easter eggs that like, you know, make humanizes, you know, makes the character more real. And I even took a liberty to write the name in his, uh, in his native language, like on, on his chest piece, on the, on the mission patch. So that's the, now that we uh, just explained that this is like the approach that I put into when doing the character design here. So first, but for today, we're just going to have some fun there and just uh, do it like a quickie. So it's like, but you'll see like when I start going into expressions for details. So, so here you just see like, here I am. It's like, you no, know, obviously this is a bit of like, you know, uh, a lot of Asian influence. It's uh, it may not be obvious, but both power and I are Asian. So <laughs> we draw a lot of influence from that. So next part here is like, I got a bit of an idea for the face there. And now I'm just going to go back here in like four. Now, normally it's like, I would have a chat there with Howard right about now and ask him for the creature. You said the eyes, they're still kind of human. Is there any scars or any other distinguishable features of the monster mode? Uh, <coughs> not really. I mean, you, can, you have fun with it. The, the idea is that make sure that the eyes still express a, the human sadness because she's still conscious that what what happened but she can't like in the monster mode she can't speak she can only growl and stuff so she's basically trapped in with the cage is basically the body that she that she was cursed with into the monster mode so um, the monster mode is it the, like a like a hulking mass type or are we going like for some texture like obviously some fur or are we going like a bit of undercats <laughs> at first i thought making her like girthy and big but then I don't know. That would work because the idea is really for her. To, you you got to feel that she's she looks frightening, for one thing. When they're monster mode, nobody wants to help her because they're afraid of her. Uh, and she's a really she and she hates the fact that she can't ask for help and she can't help herself and she knows what's going on. Basically, in the first arc, would be her like being. Uh, so it's basically a self-imposed, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't even say any simple, but she's basically mm -hmm. feeling bad about everything. Let's make it simple because of she was inability to see it before it happened. Um, and as for the girth or not, it's not important. It's more of the, I'm, I'm more focused on so ensuring that she's transformed into something, you know, definitely frightening. And, but the eyes, you can see in the eyes, it's the same as that because when she, when she was innocent, she was very doe-eyed and, you know, very happy in that. But now you see the sadness in her eyes. Even though she's a frightening looking, her eyes tell you that she's sad. So, so imagine, you know, a, it's going to sound weird, but a raging Hulk, but with, you know, with, with sadness in his eyes because the banner inside him doesn't want to be doing all this, doesn't want to be like this, but he can't, he can't, he can't stop it. 
So you see it all happen, but you can't have no ability to stop it at all uh, from 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 happening. Um, change in the skull shape, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was a question. Does the mask come off, or does the mask always stay on? Oh no, she changes. She literally physically changes back to a human. No, she does, she does not change back to humanoid form. That's basically the crux of the story. Um, her she's basically it's a, I mean, the curse is a magic thing and she can't she, her, her ability to use magic it was taken away when she becomes a monster let's make it make it more simple so she can't change back she knows that she she wants to um the mask part i honestly didn't think about it as something that would open up which is really cool because at first i thought He's thinking about like the like the like the uh, oh, it's a, they're like you know like Power Rangers mask where it's like it's just there. I'm like that sort of limits the emotional aspect of the character. You can't see the emotions and the facial expressions and stuff. So, but if you make it so it opens up and stuff, it changes the idea where it looks like she's like fine because you're wearing a mask. It's like an specialist, but then when people get close, it opens up and it's like, you know, like the, you know, like predator when he had the mask on, it's like, okay, it's not super scary. It's scary. Not super scary. And then he takes off the mask. It's like, Holy crap. It gets much worse <laughs> with the mask off. So if the mask like opens up and it actually, it's actually part of the, of the face, it's not actually a mask, but it's actually like a shell kind of thing. That makes yeah, sense. I was thinking like, you know, how like, you know, the pieces there is like, you know, pulls back, and, like reveals. Yeah. Yeah, like that. Like that's great because to me, it, it reminds me of that time when when we first time the first from the first Predator movie when the first that moment he takes off his his faceplate. And it's oh, like, do you remember? Do you remember uh, the seventies uh, horror film Demon Seed? No, Christie. It's about an AI that like you know. Anyway, it's like he basically it's like takes someone hostage and wants to become human. But at the end, there's like the, there's it's it looks like this. Uh, uh robotic child emerges from up. this uh embryonic chamber looking and it's like right when they realize when he peel the metal it's like there's a clone like there's an actual living child and it's the ai and he says i'm alive no i live but the design was kind of cool it's like you know how it's, that's how they realized that oh was that, away. that is some creepy stuff i'm like looking at on google obviously right now oh that is some messed up <laughs> holy crap okay so yeah, if we if we do this that way, the the tendrils there for the snake there kind of like pull further back. No way, no way. Kind of neat. It's like, like for story wise, that the the snake like stuff basically stops her from taking trying to rip off the mask. I mean, the mask is the curse that 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 changes her, and the tent and the snake like things just like, stop her from taking it off taking off the mask. Like it actually it's actually attacks other people. Thinking that's actually her attacking, but it's actually attacking people from taking it off for her, and it also attacks her when she tries it. And once so we get the mat, the face there uh, down, then it's going to be fairly, fairly straightforward to do the alphabet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so for, we like want for the, like we want like it, obviously like like uh, human eyes. You want like a bit of a sadness, so we're just going to keep the eyes proportion here. And first thing I would do is like we know about the jewel. And obviously, mass-wise, it's going to be smaller when she's in monster mode than when she is in humanoid mode. And we know that pieces of the mass that are going to pull away. So we just see about cheekbones, the mandible jaw. There's going to be the chin. We'll break it up a little bit, like here, just for nice and suggestive. Like any, for anyone who's like doing their version of this, you don't have to do Dom's version. Definitely, no. Do your version of it, like. Oh, absolutely. Sound, you know, absolutely. It sounds, it, it sounds weird when I it, like no offense to Dom, but when we do this for like studios or even when we did when I did I don't have a comic in front of me, but when I did the stuff with uh, for Marvel, when I created a new character for Marvel, um, we had like twenty looks, and I can tell you right now, all twenty were completely different, and then we had different color palettes for each one. Um, that is absolutely true. You'll look at like sometimes a concert, they'll never tell you what number it is. Uh, but for like the Marvel Studios, um, any park there, Ryan Merlin, geez, names are skipping me there. And I was like, I know some of these guys, Paul, Paul, oh God. Okay, anyway. <laughs> anyway, but uh, the, you, they'll show you, and it's like, oh, which one's this one? This is number 62. And it would be, it's like we changed the belt, we changed the strap. But it all makes sense. You have to do something as first. But that's different because film because you have to actually fabricate the outfit. But for comic, 
uh you don't have to go like that that's why it's so streamlined like just like here's our color separation as long you can that's why a lot of comic book artists will go further with the details like lee Bermebio, um i love his batman noel suit it's very tactile but he wanted to keep the gray and the silhouette and certain details of the classic Batman look. Then you go at someone else there, like Jim Lee, and he has like the new tech, and, you know, for the new Fifty Two version. But you still retain like you know certain details like that. So yeah, so yeah, depending on what medium that uh, your character is going to be in, you you the design actually changes, and even the story, the way I would tell the story would be different. So if it was for animation, it's <sighs> depending on how it's going to be animated. So you have very simplified uh, lines, holding lines to. Uh, it might be like cell, uh, you know, cell shaded and stuff like that. So the look is a little more different. If you look at, I'm trying to think of. I'm, of, of I'm only going with this look because, uh, to be honest, there uh, doesn't say like what I'm drawing right now is I because we're talking about Phantom of the Opera is that I'm going with a bit of the old long Cheney black and white film. That's why the nose, like you know, that tragic face, like you know, monster. I was thinking a bit of Frankenstein's creature first, but you know, I see here it's like you know, there's going to be slight Jason Voorhees, like you know, the mouth is going to be leaning a little bit. The eyes are the only thing that's symmetrical. Everything else, like the mask when it pulls away, is going to feel a bit distorted. But that yeah. way, the eyes being symmetrical, when we do uh, uh, caption letter boxes. You know, it's like a, a humanized character said, so like when there's any dialogue or thought bubbles that Howard has later on, you know, we can we can absolutely do that. So I was yeah. like, didn't want too, too frightening, but a bit monstrous. I figured like the details and textures are going to help. And like, you know, with here, it's like a mask pulls away. And we know that these serpents here are helping to not only secure, so we can do like you know for this there the fishbowl helmet is that applies to the monster mode as well no that was just it was, it was basically i was trying to find visuals that that would uh give the emotional of her being innocent and kind of uh, I, I, kind of cutesy in a way I and mean, it's not really what i want to use but it's sort of that when you see the difference of what happens to her and how horrible it becomes because you know at the beginning it's like oh she has a mentor teaching her magic and this you know her world her world is not too bad she has you know she has a significant other now and yeah etc cetera, etc cetera, and then it all comes crashing down well because um, of you and you're wearing that grand uh, grandizer shirt here's an interesting fact boys and girls the French name growing up there, I used to watch the French cartoon and he wasn't called Grandizer. That's he was called Goldarak. Yep. Goldarak was his name. Was he gold except for the horns? That was it. Why was he changed to the Goldarak? No idea. So no. because Howard's wearing that shirt, I think that we're going to do a bit like I love the movie Legend. Oh, I love that. I actually did. I tried drawing those horns on my worksheet and I, I failed. But um, because <laughs> I don't draw. But yeah. So the, we can have like these uh, tentacles, yes. kind of like the wrap, and oh, that's cool. I thought about that. If like tentacles... you know how you, know, you have like a unicorn horn, and you, have, you know tendrils, like you know it's like it spirals. So we're going to do some similar here. So these tendrils here, this part of the helmet. So that way we have two distinct, you know, uh, versions of her, oh, and I'll have these two coil too. No, I love that. I, that the tendrils. So face forward, but no, no, no. I don't I like it's too poor gesture. Well no, well, no, I like the fact that the tentacles can can form into like spiky stuff and horns. Like that's cool. I like credit that. Steve I... Scrooge for that, sir. Steve Scrooge there. He used to draw Spider Man, but also concept artist for the Matrix films. He designed the squids. Yes. Oh my god. That was god. his idea. Aut local Ottawa boy too. Well, he doesn't live here anymore, but he's from Ottawa. He's, yeah. Like, oh my god. All well, people don't realize how many concept artists and designers are from can like in Canada in general. I'm not going to specify cities because I know I know a lot of them like that I'm here, but a lot of them are from Canada and people don't realize that. It's like, oh, are you from the state? Are they from the states? Are they from the no? They're from Canada. Some of them are from small towns and stuff. Um, no. So it doesn't matter where you're from, you can do this stuff. I mean, especially given like you know, with today, I find like you know, with technology, look how we're connecting right now. It's yeah. Yeah, Howard. It's now the norm that uh, we can work in conference just like this. Yeah, I'll I mean. Fly. So I know yeah. this is a bit maleficent, but don't worry. It's like that's why we're gonna change like certain things here. It's like we know like the shape there is like I want like darkness. Tim Curry in movie Legend. 
So I know that that's uh, going to be I love that film. The, the, the design for that film was amazing. The and all practical effects too, crazy. Absolutely. Back in the day, you know, like that's a that's a thing about if for the those who can draw and you know. You know, silently, I hate you because you have skills to draw. But <laughs> for those who can draw, um, what I found as a writer to to help me explain my thoughts to artists is sometimes I look at real stuff. That's why I have more crap than this in another room. But you have touch points, like physical things that you do. Like if you, when you write about, say, a, a, a person who's made of stone, <laughs> it sounds really weird. Go out, pick up a rock. I'm not even joking. And you feel the weight, you feel the texture. Then you translate into words. And then when the and the artist has, you know, like when we're talking, I can talk about. Look, I picked up this thing, and it was kind of heavy. And I wanted to have that kind of weight uh, for this character because they're like on Earth, so therefore the gravity would be affecting them. And when they get impact, things will crack and dust, and things will fall down. Because you have, because you see it in the real, you would write those notes. It's sort of like when you write somebody uh, in a windstorm. It's one of the examples I, I do with younger students. What moves? What doesn't? How will things move because of the different textures and weight value of things? That's something you should know as a writer. Why? Because if you're writing a scene where oh her scarf is off, you know, flittering in the wind, I'm like, if it's in rain, it's gonna be kind of heavy. It's not that gonna really happen. <laughs> yeah. So you you have to you have to know what 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 things are and and. Like, like an artist, but translating the words so that it's doable and more pra and practical when you ask an artist to do something. So even if I asked Dom, like, you know, this is what's going to happen in this kind of environment with this character, you know, with this design and, and kind of uh, outfit they're wearing, he could, you know, he would come like, that's like physically, you know, that's the thing that, that defies the laws of physics. <laughs> and he would be right. And then I have to go back and then retool everything because you know in my mind it just looked great, but it wasn't that wouldn't that fit. Yeah, it's five percent true. And like we will try explorations, like you know, but sometimes like an idea sounds really good. And uh, as an artist, there I'll get wrapped up in the details with, uh, you know, in, uh, in the moment there with a writer. It's like you know we'll fight tooth and nail like certain times, and you got to pick your battles. Sometimes like you know in the end it's like yeah you're right that's not really working. And then other times it's like, yeah, I think we got to work. Like I did with that weapon for that astronaut. So like we figured out a way that this guy can actually carry this cumbersome weapon around. So I was like, great, we have that result. And I would love the one when you showed me that space safe. And I was like, that, that's not really practical, but I, I get the visual, but <laughs> unless it's weightlessness, exactly. I don't know how he's going to go to town with that. But all right. So normally really here, what I would do is like, now that we got a bit of uh, the, the shape and silhouette, it's like, I'm just going to delete some of this and like clean this up a little bit. It's like the head is, I think it's about the body proportions will fall based on the suit design since uh, she'll be expanding in size. It's kind of Kirby-esque. I like it. It's kind of, <laughs> what? it's kind of Jack Kirby-esque. Yeah. yeah. The king. Like you yeah. sci-fi fantasy. That's the guy like, you know, made mainstream comics, like, you know, made it perfect. Look at Asgard, all the designs. Yeah. Look at the, the Eternals. Like it screams Kirby. Well, yeah. Well, that. Well, that's him. I mean, Ragnarok. The, 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 you, know, you know, such. Well, I know. Uh, unless you're a comic book fan, you won't understand the, the Kirby crackle that they did with What If was sort of like I, when you throw your fist in the air and your your family looks at you like you're a weirdo. You know you <laughs> you know you're a geek. But when they did the Kirby crackle on that, I was like, wow, they actually made the Kirby crackle. <laughs> um, yes. It, you know, it's like, wow, they used it. I'm like, you never, you know, ne you never think that they're going to do it because it, for comic books, it totally makes sense because it's a totally different medium. And Kirk Cr Crackle, if you do it, those who don't know, are like, imagine an energy beam surrounded by dots. That sounds really weird when you say that out loud, though, eh? But it so, works. Uh, I think when we got works. something here. Like, with her with her hair and the way that you want it, and having these, like, you know, tentacles here, like, the, making these forward horns. Mm-hmm. And then you were seeing how the mask, it pulls up this one here. Uh, I'm just gonna change color so that we see my process. Where, where are you planning to put the jewel? Uh, uh, and AKA her child, basically her child's protected by that jewel. Uh, and it, it's like, the, the mage did this so that when she saves her, she can save herself and it's basically it's protecting the, their child because it's, it's under her protection. Because he basically he knows that he oh long story short the idea is that why do we put it in her throat? 
You can. Would it work? Maybe. Because I was just thinking, you know, every time we see her face, we should see the, the somehow see the, the child as well, so that you know that they're both there. I don't or know. like if she touches, touches like, like if it's on her throat, then it's like that's the way she, like she talks to her son, or I don't know. Uh, don't know. Possibly. Don't. Like we're too early to get into plot details. We just want yeah. to get like the basic yeah, look. Yeah, it's just a basic idea, and then take it from there. I mean, like the idea would be it was with the mage to go. Okay, this is happening to her. I'm going to protect her kid so he doesn't get uh, destroyed. And then because I know that uh, the you know his love interest is going to become this like his monstrous beast, that would technically would protect her, her child at the same time. So they threw it on there. So uh, now I'm just going to do like once again like the the mask real quick, uh, like the human mode, mm -hmm. and then uh, then we can start uh, getting the shape and the body. Yeah, and then anybody, we can add some colors. Does anybody have anything they want to share that you know we can I can take a look at or even well Dom as well. Yeah. Any questions? If you want to pick Howard's brain, since like he rode the Iron Man uh, ride there in Hong Kong, and he rode the Tron ride in Disney. I didn't ride the Tron ride. I rode. You didn't Hong do Kong. it. Well, that's in that's in, in Shanghai. I was in Hong Kong Disneyland, but they had the oh, what was that called? They had, they they repurposed uh, Space Mountain into a Star Wars ride, which was really cool. Which wasn't part of my wasn't part of my job, but I, w I went there anyways. <laughs> but I rode the Ironman Experience ride like over a hundred times because fun, not really. It was fun the first three, ten maybe times, but for work I had to do it because they wouldn't give me a video of it. So I had to sit there and watch it through all the nuances because um, I might have one here. Give me a second. Let me see if I have it because I was talking to somebody about it the day, day but um all the rides that you have the 4d rides in disney they actually have a script now, i can't show you this the script because then the, the disney ninjas will come and kill me um <laughs> for sure but i was working on let's see if i can block out stuff so you don't you don't see certain things uh uh there uh I'll, I'll start talking so my screen pop up. So you can see, I don't know if you can see the title. So this is actually a script and you can see how thick it is for one of the rides. And the reason why it's that thick is because they have multiple endings. So every Disney attraction that has a 4D ride um, has multiple endings. And it's brilliant uh, because they all work. I hate that sometimes because that means you have to do it. Is, are they random? Some of them are. Um, and unfortunately for the Iron Man ride, I had to, I had to look at to do my, some of my research to do my thing. <laughs> they were random, so I couldn't ask them. That's why I kind of have the videos or can you show me, put me in a room where, you know, that's not, and there's no internet that I can see the different endings. So I don't have to like ride this until I see them. And there was no, so I spent a couple of days just doing that, um, which was not as fun as it sounds, but you know, it's 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 part of the job, right? Um, and then when I say 4D ride, means the chairs are moving, things are going around, you know. And you can, you, I can imagine my expression when I'm there with like a trying to have a notepad, trying to write stuff. <laughs> so, um, the artist was with me. The artist was for the comic was there too. Oh, you hey, guy. Um, and I think he bailed after like the twentieth. Uh, round he's like i can't i'm gonna throw up and he literally was hiding in the bathroom for a bit so that people couldn't find him to put him back on the ride and i was like i will do this because i need to and i and i went through it and you know it, it's it's really cool to see like the like as, as as a person going to the parks and stuff and enjoying something or a comic whatever it's really cool because um you see it as as the as they intend it but when you go in the back, you know, behind the scenes, behind the curtain, uh, as, it, as it were, the amount of work that goes into it is insane. I mean, well, I, I know, believe you. Like, when you look up videos and stuff, they like the no look green, the hide stuff. Like, you don't notice that as a, as a person going to the park, but when the imagine is like, you notice that? And it's like, what? Oh my God, there's actually a giant, you know, box for electrical, electrical wires, like in the, like right beside the ride, but I never noticed it because of the way they designed it. So it's like, wow. I mean, I work in this crap. <laughs> I didn't see that. So, um, 
it, it's, it's insane. And the Imagineers, you know, my hat's off to them because they do things where you, they purposely make you see something. But at the same time, you can also hide things so you don't you'll never ever see it unless they point it out to you. So, you want to uh, know an interesting little the factoid? I used to work uh, Blue Man Group. There's what? Really? Yeah, the Panasonic Theater. Wow, doing what? I, I would do. I would set up the stage cues for the finale when they would play like uh, uh, Alice uh, and that well, the White Rabbit song there and. And then drop that uh, uh, like all the toilet paper, and then I would recue. I would sneak in the Blue Man Group, like in when they would interact with the audience. I worked at the theater. Yeah, we're Blue Man Group. Oh man, that, I thought we were maybe one of them secretly. <laughs> I was like, I actually worked like in the theater and worked for that for them. The good guys, uh, and I'll tell you the secret: How did they catch all those marshmallows? Cream cheese. That's not marshmallows. It's just. I don't know that made it better or more disgusting, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Lots of a lot of shows. So this uh, is what I'm thinking like, uh, to, so when my process here is because we have a character that actually has two modes. Thank you, Howard. I thought where I was doing one character is like with these features combined. Wait, but no, uh, you, can, you can focus on one after the heads. It may make it easier because of time and stuff. Oh, no, well, I'll do the body now, but just to show like because yeah. this is the thing that's going to be most distinguishing because it says the tone. Like now we know like how the coils from like the Medusa type mask and it'd be animated and move, but when calm, like to show the two different modes. Here it is like cold here. Uh, you can see like, you know, the jewel, I just decided I'm going to make it like heart shape, okay. you know, smell up and the kid. So that way it pulls up and then you, know, you can see that's actually embedded to her forehead in the monster mode. But when the mask is closed in, it looks, it looks like it's part of the mask. Uh, they don't know and then you realize like oh it's Chris is actually right there right smack in the head yep. so as the plates here pull back and telescope back in and then the face kind of like expands it's almost like the monster mode literally crashes through like stained glass is what I figured like through with the helmet here just gonna zoom in so it's like with the pieces then the way it's easier to reflect and we just have them like you know kind of like telescoping in Sounds good. It looks good, man. It looks great. I'm so definitely... that's would be our character's face and like some of the humanizing aspect. And at least we know we can convey emotion using uh, the hair and the tentacles of the mask. So you're using you're Photoshop, now. right? Using, which version of Photoshop? Somebody's asking what software you use. Right? I just wrote down Photoshop and I realized there's different versions. <laughs> so yeah, this one, this one's actually, this is the latest version. This is uh, uh, 2022. However, like with the brushes are all very, very standard. If you're going to use any form of uh, illustration uh, software, uh, hold on, I'm just going to, that way, that way I feel like I'm we're having a conversation. I don't. Uh, for illustration software, it's like, you know, you can absolutely use, depending on your device, you know, if you have Photoshop Express, they're on iPad, absolutely works like a charm. Uh, they, there's Sketchbook Pro, but there is a free version of Sketchbook there that uh, for Android users, especially since, like, you know, I use that uh, for myself. There's Procreate that a lot of people use, Affinity Photo, yes. which is like Photoshop, but not. It, the tools are very are the same, but they renamed them but they work really well. And if you had old PSD files or EPS files, Affinity Photo and Design can open them. The only thing is the drawback is if you use those Adobe swatches, those RGB swatches, those are understandably Adobe. So as informed practice, what I always do is not everyone does this, but being a graphic designer in my role, there's like, I like to make sure everyone has what they need. When Howard broke down, like a writer tells me the colors, I make sure that I provide a color swatch like um, uh, like guide cheat sheet. So that way the color knows like for web, this is your hex code for, and this is your RGB code. Here's your CMA code. Here's your Pantone code. If I do do some gradients, it's based off that color palette and you can save the swatch library. And if you stick to, as long as they're not Adobe, just like those codes, Affinity and other software should open them just fairly fine. And recognize it. So if you're concerned, like, oh, I try the software, my colors don't match, that's the reason why. Some people were working on it, and then I asked to see if you want us to critique anything. So I just mentioned on the chat that if if you're working on it, basically we call it a, w, a working. I keep seeing the, the acronym is the work in progress in the, the whips. Yeah, I was uh, wondering. I just saw the most the post here is like work in progress, like. Howard, you're looking at my work in progress. I'm, I'm I, sharing I, I it know. with you. 
Well, that this is usually what happens when you're like working with someone live. It doesn't matter if it's remotely or in person. So, yeah, you feel free to share it. I mean, that's the whole point of you know that's how you tweak it because it's very seldom where you like you get through the first draft of anything, be it uh, the breakdown or visuals, before you show it to somebody. Uh, if you're working in live in the studio or on a, on a personal project or anything, it's very seldom that you do that because the best is to talk about it as you work on it, because ideas start flowing and you get inspirations. Like me, like my my, I'm not gonna like throw it out there, but my I, my initial visuals for this was definitely not what Dom is doing, and Dom is take, taking it into another level. And as he's talking about it, I'm actually building story ideas at the same time, which. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, or, or do know even, uh, next week we have uh, also a double workshop session for me and Mickey Comic, Mickey Comics for the first time, where she will be taking this character and trying to build a one-page story out of uh, somehow, some way. So when I was, oh. it's true. And uh, when I was talking about like the process when working, uh, when I used, when I was uh, living in Toronto, there I got called into uh, Warner Brothers there down Young and Shepherd and uh, to their office. And basically it's like, I would be sitting in a conference room for uh, a week straight and with uh, VPs of marketing and they're trying to get, you know, they know the IP and they know it's Batman. They say like, oh, we're, you know, can you do some stuff? And basically I would uh, provide visual components for their meetings. It wasn't, I wasn't representing a toy company. I was actually from the other end, from the licensing division of, Mar of Warner Brothers. Uh, like they would ask for like, do can you make something like this? And I and it says, well, you know, a guy that can make that kind of stuff. I was I was that guy. So like this drawing here, when I did this, it's like I didn't do the whole suit, but when I did some concept designs for uh, at the time, it was Rory, it called Rory's First Kiss, which was the working title for Dark Knight Batman Begins Two. I drew this at Tim Hortons. Now the funny thing is, this is scanned in the book, and this truth be told, I drew it on a napkin at Tim Hortons. And it's just like, you know, because of during the conversation on the phone, I had, we, it's best to work and apply. Like what Howard is explaining with the story notes as he's establishing the plot based on the details because to flesh out the characters, uh, I'm putting in these details. But at the same time, it's like what I want to do is ensure like, you know, that, you know, you don't lose that idea. We were talking about Howard yesterday it was saying about there are no bad ideas. It's just, you know, bad timing. There's just like the ideas are not ready. You can always dip back into the well. Don't throw away anything out. They could be used to repurpose a scene, especially given next week's discussion about comic book making. You know, you it may not be able to illustrate the size of the panel of a certain scene, and we may have to revise that. So that's something like we'll be showing like some tips and also some tips there for not only, um, especially for Howard there from Marvel Marvel uh, perspective, but I'll be giving a bit of uh, a DC work for hire perspective. So now we're in the next step here is that we're gonna have some fun. It was my favorite. I love this part, which is costume design. And then also for designing the monster, because the monster is always fun. And in this case here, I want to start with the monster. So that way, again, I idea how much fabric, you know, how much material that we have to work with. And then I can just streamline come up with something incredibly elegant there for the human uh, humanoid in which form that can have a lot of power and presence. So now is this is where I start picking on Howard's brain. So Howard, I imagine this beast mode there is bipedal and not, not like walking like a gorilla. Well, why would you want to do that, do the gorilla? Well, the just like, you know, like Umbrella Academy, like, you know, it's like, you know, that body shape, you know, with the big arms, Optimus Primal type, you know, like bipedal, uh, but you, I'm just saying like, obviously, obviously bipedal, but you don't want like uh, proportions like, uh, Hellboy, you know, like that, like too top heavy, obviously, because she's, you know, fem she's female. Do you see more uh, slick form or? And this oh. is when Howard sometimes will provide me an action figure and go like this. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. I'm looking around thinking about things. Hey, Rob, look, I'm checking out what Rob is doing. And up, that man? looks actually yeah. really cool. Where are you? I can't see Rob. Look, it? Rob Price there, he's got what, like, he's got some watercolor there and I love with the jewel and using the hair to get that shape and silhouette. Where are you? And okay. see, there's some distinguishable features that even at the small thumbnail that I could see, I could tell that this is a unique character. Oh, cool. 
Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, Rob. Rob was actually uh, uh, one of the participants from last year. Wow, that feels like a million years ago. Last year. So, hello, Rob, who I believe is sure. in Germany. <laughs> yeah, oh. hey. Yeah, we actually yeah. met at uh, Comic Con with Jeff Isherwood, I think. Or maybe, or maybe I'm mis mixing things up. Jeff Isherwood. Sure. He's another Ottawa boy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, was that right that we met there? I can't remember. It's so long well, ago. It was I last just, year, definitely. I, 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 well, I met you, Rob, definitely here on Figment last year. Oh, was uh, it? Okay, then. Sorry. Because yeah. <laughs> when we asked, started asking people where you're from, he's like, Germany. I'm like, what? Because yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's actually a little far off from Toronto, but hey. 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 Yeah, I, I thought oh. uh, because she's kind of a witch as well, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, like the traditional look of the witch's skirt, but I don't know how functional that would be, you know, with uh, if it's like an action kind of comic. Uh, you, all, or... you know what? Right Question. Now... Yeah? Yes. Who is because I thought about that too for the, for the outfit, and I figured like uh, my approach there for the gown is to approach it almost like uh, the Chinese long gowns, where it's uh -huh. like, you know, like you see what it meant. It's like, it's like a long shirt, but it's not a full skirt. You know, that way it's, it's, it's got seams and that way your legs won't get caught uh -huh. and the fabric, you can easily like move it away. So it's like, you yeah. can still get the shape of the skirt, but it's like, you can do like almost like octopus, like, you know, shape, but the way that the different parts of it are cut and they move around. If you like, I, I just to save time, so I don't like start taking over and screen sharing. If you look up uh, things like uh, the Last Airbender, the cartoon series, they do a great job with costume design with the flows and the clothes. If you look at, uh, ugh, I'm thinking Legend of Korra for some reason with, uh, with Korra, her her design. If you look at the bottom half of her outfit, it does that. It's not. It's. it's I'll take inspiration from there. You can do that. Um, yes, the, the witch, the, usually the witch has that, that aspect of it, but th this is a, an alien, an alien witch in the future. So, you know, right. the design is, you can go to town with it for sure. I and mean, that's no points to have fun, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I threw down sadistically the atomic, uh, atomic age stuff because I have an affinity towards that because it's just a weird quirky design that, you know, why do we have these, like, these things are like oval or round, like, like, if you think, if people don't know, it's like, you know, imagine like, remember those cars with the fins in the back or mm. how any kid on earth draws a rocket ship with the fins, with it's the from fins. there. It's yeah. still influenced now. If you draw a space if rocket, you automatically put fins on. Why? It's because that's how it was back then. So it's sort of that you could use, even use, you know, think about that. I mean, it doesn't have to be practical. It's a comic mm. book, right? Um, if we, if we talk about practi the practical aspects of comic book characters, if you look at Batman, it doesn't make sense why he has a cape at all. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, he doesn't fly. He uses a well, grappling hook. And there's then, an interesting, you know. um, we were talking about the Batman, Matt Reese film. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the idea now is with that new cape? No, actually. It's the squirrel gliding suit. Uh, Look at where the scallops uh, yeah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my God! The Boy. way his cape is cut is not multiple scalp like uh, like a yeah. bat. It's only from the edge. It's got the swoop. So uh, I'm just going to draw real quick. So the new Robert Pattinson cape is like this, the bottom. Mm -hmm. I'm down here. It just has that one scallop shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I there are seams that. here and here. Those slits is where. That sticks their hands the cape, in. Yeah, yeah, sticks yeah. his hands in here and then tucks his feet and they'll see the scallop part here, the boots. It's the gliding suit. Yep. So that way when you saw in the trailer when he uh, deployed, because a, a friend sent me some pictures who was in uh, Chicago and saw them filming rigging with a squirrel suit. And I know like uh, I designed some stuff like that. And it's uh, for video games. So I knew right away, it's like, oh, it's like a trench coat. He can just, he tucks in his hands and his boots. That's why he's there. And then just expands his arms. And then when he has his arms deployed, he has this flying squirrel silhouette. Yeah. Like I, I, I know, uh, hmm. I should I say this without saying it? I can't. Well, I I don't know if you know David Uslan, but uh, <laughs> I met David Uslan, who's the son of Michael. Michael. Uslan, who, 
Yeah, Michael. Well, you, you know who Michael is. So David would share stuff. I don't think he should be sharing stuff. He shares stuff on social media a lot about stuff like that because he shared like one of the first images of him uh, at a bell tower, not a rooftop, with him preparing. Obviously, a stunt guy preparing to look like he's going to jump off, and he and then when he was holding the, the the cape like that, and I was like, oh, it's a gliding suit. That's actually pretty brilliant. But that was like a million years ago, so I totally forgot about that. I'm glad you brought that up because. They're trying to make. I, I know that the, the, re- the design direction for that whole uh, reboot, well, in quotation, reboot, is to make everything functional and practical uh, as much as you can of a guy to dress like a bat. But <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, yeah, right? Exactly, I mean, he is Batman. So you know, um, it, right think, now I'm just getting. Uh, I'm just going to get my. I should go dark gray. I'm going to go in for my shape of the silhouette. Yeah. I got here is like obviously hulking. It's like I just have the real only reason why I have her hunched over is because she's larger. And it's obviously yeah. it's like someone is fairly big, crouched down through a corridor or something. Like it's stand upright. But yeah. stand upright, everyone just presumes the person is average height. But if you add some proportion, uh, mass to the legs and seem like they're crouching down, you know, a bit uncomfortable, that gives, uh, I find, a, a good sense of weight and scale. So let's go in here. So for those for those wondering what I'm doing besides just hanging out and having fun with you guys, <laughs> just chilling out here, I'm actually making story notes for myself as uh, Dom does his thing because I'm getting inspired by the changes that he's added and the layers of things that he's doing. So it's actually giving me ideas to push the plot forward. It's like as I said, the whole idea is to inspire each other and move things forward, right? Like right now. We have a, a direction of the, of, the, of the design right now, and I have a direction of the story. But these things are dynamic. Things can always change. We might go back and go, you know what, this is not going to work. Let's just take this out or replace whatever. And the same thing with story. So don't worry about if your work in progress is not done or, or what have you. It's one version at this moment that you're doing it. That's the whole idea. You have to get your idea. I mean, the one big tip I will give to everybody here, regardless if you're a writer, writer, artist, or just an artist, is to get your ideas out as quickly as possible. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about the perfect line. Because if you focus on things that you can control later, you won't be able to get back the idea. Because an idea can come and go, and you'll never get it back. The grammar will always be here. <laughs> a straight line tool will always be there for you. A ruler will always be there for you. You can always go back to it whenever. But I have seen it in rooms where somebody is like that. They're like, "Ah, oh, my grammar!" You know, like you can see the person literally striking out a word, rewriting it because they spelt it wrong, and then they forgot their idea. They literally lost a train of thought, and that whole scene or something is now gone. It's in the ether now. So you can't. Jeff get Loeb, back. yeah, he, he talks about that extensively. Yeah. So yeah, don't worry about you know if you're if you're wondering should I show my work in progress is not done. That's the whole point. Is to show it um, and then work it. So, like right now, as as we talk, um, like I don't know if you can see my screen because I'm talking, but you know I'm like making notes as we do it, and these are not perfect notes. I'm scratching things. I look at my worksheet; it's terrible. I I don't I don't care about spelling. I just make sure I know what I'm writing so I can read it later because <laughs> it's 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 my 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 mental translation of my ideas onto paper, physical form, so I can then translate that into something that's readable by other people. Um, that's the that's the key thing about all this stuff. Regardless if you're doing a comic book or animation or a painting or toys, um, it's it's getting the ideas out as quickly as you can. I mean, both t- it's, it just so happened that Dom and my, myself we worked in toys, and I worked it from a store a story development uh, side of things um, to extend to other media and providing backstory to literally toys that were made without an idea for a story. And you know, it's it's it becomes one of those things where you start shooting out ideas quickly because you want to make sure everybody's on board because you're not working by yourself. You're working with a creative director, uh, the toy designer. Uh, <laughs> it sounds kind of weird. Accountants and lawyers as well. Uh, manufacturers, the guys who actually make the toys, the 3D renderers who go, that's, you know, in, you know, in earth physics, that doesn't work as a joke because grav- we have real things called gravity and stuff. So making a toy top heavy doesn't make it stand and so forth and so forth. So 
you know, we do all this. And those, you know, even toys, we make pro they make prototypes and some of them are horribly bad. And then we, they, you know, reconvene our ideas and stuff. And I can tell you right now, I mean, I was working with Bandai and 3.0 and they literally they had a prototype 100% translated from the sketch of, of, of uh, Kuno-san, uh, Kuno Okawagra. Oof, I think I butchered his name, who helped design Gundam, all the Gundams and uh, Battle of Planets, uh, Villain vehicles and the whole slew of things. If you Google him, it's like he has a long list of creds. His design was top heavy. So they, they translated it to a prototype. They printed it out. <laughs> they put it in the desk. I kid you not, it fell over and it broke. <laughs> it was dead silent. Like, if you think of it, this is like an actual production meeting and it's just, and then it just went, it just fell across the table and it was like, you know, it's like, what are you going to say? And I was the first person to speak because I'm from North America, so I'm not shy or embarrassed. I'm like, well, that's not going to work. we got to fix that. Maybe beef up the leg or something or make it different. And then they translated it to him. And he's like, yep, I'll fix that. And then, you know, it, was, it wasn't like, you know, it's like, oh, you made a mistake. It's sort of like, it didn't work. So we'll have to re retool it. So one hundred percent. These are all things we have to, you know, bear in consideration. Like I, I did do... Um, the funny thing was I did do a concept for a Batcave uh, playset, and they actually thought that my concept was too underwhelming. And then it's, and later on, I'm watching uh, Dark Knight Rises, and I get my royalty check, and Ashley remembers when I got my royalty check. It's like, oh, we since go see Dark Knight Rises, and what do I see rising from the Batcave water? It's like, oh, that looks like my toy. And they said <laughs> they wouldn't work. So I told you that thing would pop up. So I was like, you know, it was all the, the computer station was originally supposed to be part of that platform, but they moved it off to the side in the movie. But the, the idea was for kids, how did they make the cave? And I said, you don't have to mold the cave. Kids have blankets. Just have to wrap the, like any ads and marketing. And I did mock up of blankets, just curled around the place. And it says, here, you just have, this is the base. You can put the Batmobile on top. And then you hit this button and this thing pops up and there's the bat suit. You put Bruce in. And you can push it down and then they'll pop up and he'll, he'll be fully dressed. So he'll come with a Bruce Wayne outfit. And then the other side, here's the other thing. I'll pop down and it would open up and his stool can fold down. And that's his computer station. And it was great. And like when I saw the movie, I was like, wow, they took that concept and really rolled with it. It was amazing. But at the time, it was to have a practical toy. It was like, that's it. It wasn't meant for the movie. I was just trying to design something that I saw like in that environment in the movie and see like, okay, it was something that we can make. It's a cube, but um, they end up just repurposing the old uh, toy set from uh, like uh, the Batman animated series. But oh. it, it, because the molds were too expensive, like, you know, if they were to build it, like, there's a lot of move. I realized I was designing it with a lot of moving parts. I had two things going inside. There was a spring to pop out. It made total sense why they rejected my idea. I wasn't even thinking about that. I only thought about the look. I didn't think about how many bits and pieces had to go into it. So I think it was it was rejected, unfortunately. But it's like, but I did have a lot of fun designing it. But it was you know, how it's right. Like there's a lot of details, like you know, with lawyers and like this and fabricators. You know, it's good to have communication and you know, just uh, you don't have you can't assume that everyone has all these details. You just have to assume common sense by asking yourself the five W's: How is this going to be made? How it look? How is this character going to be used? So like with here, it's funny. Like mentioning about top heavy, and I was going for chicken feet. And I realized chicken feet's a bad approach. I should go like full on feet on the ground because if if there ever there's an action figure her like her and Monster Mode walk around just on the ball of her foot like a ballerina, uh, it doesn't really work unless you can go on all fours and launch yourself like you know like a, in a feral mode. So, but I figured here it can still cast spells. So this is just the body that I'm designing here, and then the clothes that I'm going to use another layer and go over and get the shape for the outfit. So. From the monster form, I wanted to have that strong silhouette, feminine like my composure in terms of the great, like you know, the curves, but not in a curvy like non-essential way. Curvy like a panther, like a leoness. So that's what I'm approach here when talking about the mane, how the hair. See, so like you have the horns, but you still have those tendrils like Medusa that move around. So what I was thinking is that probably with some magic, which you I'll know, do right for, now for, for the legs, you can go like. <laughs> I keep thinking of tree trunks for fur, but yeah, tree trunks for fur. You can basically make it so that she has, uh, it's going to sound weird, but uh, fur that goes down and it's super thick. So for we don't know how thick her legs and feet are. 
So therefore, and now I'm thinking about toys, but we're actually doing comic books. But if it was a toy, that's one way. <laughs> it's so cheap, right? It's a cheap way of making it so they can stand. But if, if a character has like really thick or bulky clothing or like a legging that's really thick and furry, that's a way we hide how we get support to toys. So I'm thinking, I'm trying to find, I don't have anything like that. Oh, okay, I'll show you a bad toy. Okay, this is not a bad toy. I'm like, I don't like it. Oops, there we go. Uh, but uh, something like this from my childhood, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. If you look at their legs, Leonardo. it's really hard to stand. You had to really go and balance it, right? But if they were wearing something, and I use this character-wise, something thick, like or have furry legs, then you can make it so that it actually has more support at the bottom of the toy so they can stand. Because if you look at it, this is top heavy. It's very top heavy. That's why I have it leaning on things. And yes, I lost the swords a long time ago. Um, so it, it's it's one of those things that you keep in mind when even when I when I when I do story development for these things for the toys and stuff, I have to make it so that it is it's connected to the toy, um, and the looks and stuff. I mean, I remember. The most weird conversation, and it sounds weird when I say it out loud, was it's like they wanted to release a, a limited edition uh, accessory for the toy. I was doing samurai, giant samurai robots, uh, just to give you context. It's like, we have this giant sword, this super big sword that's going to be limited for people who buy this certain package, whatever. I think it was a hundred, whatever it was. And I'm like, and they told us this after I finished the story development and after I did the uh, preview comic. And it was like the first draft that was already done and the art was already going being made. And I was like, when's it going to be released? Like when the toys released, I'm like, so when the comic book promo is going to go out, it's like, yep, I need to refix. I need to fix the comic book. <laughs> and this is the toy yeah. right now. And I went back and um, honestly, I had to, I threw it in as a special thing. I threw, instantly added it to the end of the uh, end of the preview comic where it's like, it's like one of the, you know, weapons I sent to the guy to help him, you know, turn the tides of this battle that I have going on there. And the marketing department and Bandai are like, this is great. I'm glad you thought about this. I'm like, uh, it'd be great if you guys told me this, like at the get go, <laughs> let's start <laughs> happening. Like, because the thing is creating something for fun. Absolutely. A lot of blast. But uh, both Dom and I are like, I guess we saw business creatives. So we have to have function and purpose of what we're doing. Because we're, you know, it sounds bad. We're, we're selling a toy. Yes, we're having fun. Absolutely. But we have to sell these things and help push the, the company's items out uh, and make it associated to it. I mean, imagine, you know, it's, it's, it's people like, when I say this to tell this to people who don't work in toys and stuff, like that's kind of silly. I'm like, imagine you know doing star wars you're making you're doing a star wars comic before the movie comes out and they told you oh yeah there's lightsabers in there you can just imagine that for a moment it's like so your whole comic has not I mean, one mention not even a lightsaber in there and all of a sudden you see it in the film and stuff and you're like oh man what do they do what what can i do now right because you didn't you didn't have that connection with the pro with, with the branding and the product and stuff so it's that's why you have lawyers and accountants and People that from the inside in the, in these meetings, even in in, in uh, not necessarily for comics, but actually for animation, for video games, for sure, we always have like a a, 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 a business guy in there, uh, you know, and producers mm -hmm. and stuff like that, right? Because they always go, so how's this? You know, it's, it's a free to play. So what's what what what's 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 the projected? And I'm, I'm going to use all the terms because I'm not be here forever. But basically, you want to know how fast will they be making a certain amount of money? It's literally it's literally a graph. And then it's like at this point they have to the, the point then they circle they circle like this point in this game has to plateau, so it has to be make it really hard for people who are free to play who wants to continue and where it encourages people to do do the IAP, which is in-app purchases, basically you pay microtransactions. We just had how we get money and so forth, you know. So uh, it, it, everybody's involved. And as a creative, you have to not ignore that, but embrace it. So mm -hmm. it, it helps. It, because if you don't, they'll come back at you. It's sort of like what Dom did with the Batman toy. It's like, it's too many moving parts. They were like, that's going to cost a fortune. So no. Like they automatically would say that because of the amount of engineering to do that and to produce it. The, 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 uh, the retail price would be so high that no kid... No kids' parents, I should say, would you know fork over money to, to, to buy that. That's right. You see, that's the inexperience because you know I was uh, I was a bit I was 
I first I was I was I was offended. It says I thought I came up with a really happy design, and you know everyone was happy and very simple and like constructed. Says, yeah, but the moving once again the moving parts like well we got to put a little spring in there. Someone's got to screw this in, and it's like yeah, it's not just cast and mold. It's like oh you got a good point. Yet I was I was dumbfounded when I realized later I, I design a and I'll explain to you one thing is that uh, I thought was kind of funny. Uh, Batman in Dark Knight. Batman Begins 2, he has two sets of those scallops uh, blades, and you saw them shoot across. The idea at the time, the script was being developed, was the marking division asked, saying, can you come with a new thing like we can we can do for Batman? This is okay for a costume. So I knew they were doing to keep the mask. So I was like, great. We, and I did some designs about how the, for the new suit, like how uh, Batman can turn his head. And I proposed segmented armor. So that's where you see like pieces. I have nothing to do with the weird Tetris legs pants that he's wearing. I did not design that. But the point of the two rows of the blades, and you saw them folding down, where the toy design was, bam, bam, you can shoot batterings. Kids with a little with a suction cup, little Nerf batterings, and you would, they can put them here, and they, you know it has the wings, and just fold down flat, and this, and then you can stick extra ones and a utility belt. Fantastic. This is why I was dumbfounded by their logic with the back cave. So a year later, okay, they didn't use my design. That's fine. You know, it's like, you know, you get paid and it's perfectly fine. Rob, that looks awesome. Thanks. They, it looks really nice. It's coming along really Ooh. well. And uh, when I did the design, they, they did for the kids, instead of the bad glove that could shoot batarangs like in the movie, you they, they build a utility belt for the kids. So the kids have to take off the Batman utility belt that's just as Batman and use that as the launcher. <laughs> so it just didn't make sense. It's like the first thing you do as Batman is take off your pants, take off your pants. I was like, it didn't make sense <laughs> to me. And it's like this, all these moving parts with utility belt, like a, like a chain gun shooting these darts. It's like Batman doesn't take off his belt to, to, to grapple bad guys. It just was a weird toy design. So going back here into our shape. Rob is I'm gonna doing extremely well. I'm going to share somebody's art if I get my screen. Oh, over. yeah, yeah, here, here, share someone's art. Please yeah, do. I will do that in a second. Okay, hey, come on. on, get in there. Come on, here we go. So, let's see. That's looking great. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. ah. See, already I'm loving with the shape of the hair, and you got this, uh, like, you know, mm. I'm, a, I'm a sucker for Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Uh, Howard oh, knows this, and yeah. uh, I love, like, I'll, I'll draw Maria, and, so it's, and that, to me, that's, with, like, you know, the same inspiration. It's like, you know, when, uh, it's like the expression, great minds think alike. All of us here are doing, thinking the same thing with the jewel and the hair and the silhouette, and we're having really fascinating results. And the fact, like, I love how Rob's there is, like, something different, like, a Brothers Grimm. Which is mm. really excellent. It fits the description perfectly. And then you have here with uh, with uh, Joe, who says something that's like you know more common representation in terms of the character design. But you have features here that with this character that you design, how the eyebrows are aligned with the jewel, the cracks not as not as like strong and stark as mine, more delicate like age and wear. You yeah. know the crackling is from age and wear. It has a history to it. I like that. I like, like the you like the, you, you can see the sadness in the expression and the fact yes that it's behind the theater it. mask it's, i find behind this it, like in the mouth slightly open yeah it's it's like those masks and eye, eyes wide shut wow that's a throwback but yeah uh, <laughs> yes indeed oh my, my wife actually wow. went to the actual store and she got a mask she, I, got a, I, uh, she got a plague mask i actually from eyes wide shut i was yeah i was in let's keep jaws uh piece up there for a little bit and then uh we're gonna get back. Oh no, Rob! Uh, can we do an update on Rob's? Sure. Let me add some sharing. more color, and then we'll go back sharing. to Giles, and then we'll get back to mine. I'm almost done my shape. I stopped sharing my screen. I think I'm not sure if other people can share their screen or not. I'm gonna let the folks in Pigment figure that one out because if I mess it up, that'd be kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I like I like Giles' uh, uh, fact that it looks like a, a face that's all cracked up because it shows the difference of. If she, when she, before she had, you know, the dark reality hit her, if you want to call it that, her mentor, that the world is not all black and white, but shades of gray kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, she, she found out the hard way 
in, in AK, it's yeah, it's in her face. But it, it it gives you that sense of you want to help her. Okay, that's the whole point. Is like you want to help this character become, you know, back go back to where who she who she was. Um, that's the feeling for what I want to have for the reader. Reality wise, as a story writer, no, that will never happen. She will never she can never go back to where she was because there's then be no story. <laughs> You want her to transform and change and accept the past experiences and add it on to her previous experience and and becomes a and becomes a a, a new line for her. We want to call it a, a new path for her because you know when I when I talk about um, uh, making comic books next week, I touch upon that. I mean, there's a whole that's a whole other workshop to talk about uh, how to, how how to plot your story out because there's so. Is there a million ways? Sort of. I mean, it's literally, it's literally a few that are like mixed and matched and then pushed. Because when I say mix and match, people always like, it's fifty and fifty. I'm like, not necessarily. If you think I'm cooking, sometimes it's like a little twenty here and eighty percent. You know, it can vary, and depending on what you're doing, it it shifts back and forth, right? It's a sliding scale for mixtures of things. So, when you tell me here, that's like, you know, it's half of this and half of this, and you go. Yeah, you take it with a grain of salt, like cooking. It's like it's a suggestion. Any time you see a recipe for cooking, it's a suggestion. You always augment it. Wow! Nice right. use there right. with the green and Rob. Take a look is at what that, Rob's doing. Is that like a face in the jewel? I'm just wondering, or I'm just interpreting it. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I was thinking yeah. like also kind of like a face in the jewel. Uh, nice. I thought more like a skull, but I, I like the uh, suggestion of the uh, babies, like a baby's yeah. face. That would be cool. Yes. Even like a like a fetus would be kind of maybe a bit mm, on the on the what? On the, yeah, I think the yeah. face is fine. I, I I did think about having a fetus in there too, but I was like. <laughs> That mm -hmm. for a comic book, I mean, like, that's like a murder for any artist to draw repeatedly. <laughs> right. yeah, 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 so, yeah. so I, you know, because of the medium that you 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 work with, then you change your direction. Even for right for for like when we develop things as a writer, mm -hmm. right? For those who write too, um, don't go super detailed with your stuff because it will be literally impossible to draw. And even if you do draw it, because you actually don't draw and it's actually, you don't draw on the same size page as your comic book. You draw in a bigger page and it shrinks down. So if you draw a super detailed ones, this and it shrinks down, the lines become muddled and you can't mm -hmm. see anything. And then your comic book is very much, either you print it like super big, <laughs> which is fantastic if people want to buy it, which is great. It, uh, but most times, you have to shrink it down and you have to take that into consideration. You got to think of, you know, there's going to be word balloons, caption boxes and sound effects and the layout of panels. And there's, there's, there's only so much you have to work with the real estate of your page. And I, I'm obviously bleeding into next week, but that's why when we start designing even characters, we go, okay, these are great details. And sometimes, you know, ours is go, you know, they love it and you go, okay, like the bat, like the, like the utility bell for Batman. I'm going to go all these super details and show every single gadget because they never do that. Then you stop them and like, there's a reason why they don't do that. <laughs> because when you do a full body shot, it will crap. <laughs> it won't work. So that's why he's never shown. That's why they, they simplify it because it can't be done. Um, you got to, you know, like, Unless you have characters like Iron Man, where you can basically hide everything in, you know, under, you know, his armor, and then he exposes it when you see it, then that's when it happens. So you work, you, you work with the medium that you're you're working with, um, you know. So don't worry about details and stuff. Yeah, I mean, have it in the back of your mind, because if you go, oh, we're gonna make, it's, it's like if we made this into a toy. I would definitely push Don and go get as much detail as humanly possible. For sure. And it's all about the shape. Like, obviously, like here, uh, you can see, like, you know, in the more humanoid form, it's just like I'm trying to get the silhouette. And it's like a bit of Medusa, but it's like you get a bit of this halo, the way that the the, the snake, like the you know, tendrils will be, and the hair is giving her grace. So, but here it's more feral uh, in the monster mode. And you see, like, the, the skirt with all the different sashes and everything, you know, they stretch and expand, the armor plates fold up. Because here's a bit Joan of Arc, I figured, like, you know, for the arm. And, you know, just a bit of a deity in humanoid form. So I figured, like, the boots are, like, inspired. I thought the Wonder Woman Amazon, uh, the DC Expanded Universe, the film version of the suit was was pr pretty well done, except for the part of, uh, for the fact that I think they gave Gal Gadot a way too short skirt for Gal. But, uh, you know, but 
the the in terms of like the, the the armor design the the hardened leather armor for the torso uh i liked it i like all the tension detail all the dings if you look at it there's there's a bunch of these, these dings and scratches and wear all over yeah and it's like obviously over the years to get in that wonder woman 84 it looks cleaner she's she's polished it you know because when she got it in uh, the first wonder woman movie it's been sitting in a room you know, like yeah. just gathering dust literally yeah so it's by the time it gets to Batman vs Superman, it's like you know it's battle worn and it's got a lot of history. So the first introduction of the Wonder Woman suit, uh, I thought was great, and the boots especially, that telescopic armor, uh, the way that it folds all the plates. Yep. So that's the approach that I'm doing here for the legs. So. Yep. Oh man, I'll talk about armor. If, if you ever want to look at, it's, it's not okay. It's really old. If you look at Lord of the Rings, so I have because I have the uh, the box set in extended edition. Their documentary on how they actually made, built the armor from the plate armor and the because there's different kind of armor, plate armor, which is like basically plates folded like sort of stacked on top of each other like a roof shingles. Well, that's actually a thought way to know it's like roof shingles, and then you have you know from chainmail. There's different kinds of chainmail, different kind of weaves and stuff like that. It's really nerdy and geeky. In, 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 in from uh, from uh, I guess a normal person's perspective, but when you read a story, it's like, will this arrow pierce through this kind of armor, and how can it happen? And and that's something. You, how else would you know? But unless you dive deeper into that kind of thing, it also helps the artist because it's sort of like, there's going to be a scene where this crazy thing is going to happen, where this person shoots an arrow and it's left right between the plate armor, blah blah blah. So you make sure that it's it's you know it's doable because if you make it too you know too perfect, that's not going to work out. Um, if you have that in mind, right? Um, that's something. That's those things that come to play as we banter back and forth when we talk on story and characters as well. Um, something about uh, your design there, Dom, that that inspired me was uh, having the jewel uh, stand out as much. That I actually came up with a story point that I might see. I'm going to feed off and bleed off into next week. Is that I might jump off by doing this as a third per third person telling the story of this happening um possibly and it feels like it might work and then it will it'll make it interesting um uh, sort of like i want to say the mummy i don't want to say the mummy but possibly like the mummy <laughs> well that depends which mummy are we talking about uh, the Brendan fraser one i know okay that's just guilty pleasure fun I know. That's why I'm like whining about it. <laughs> but he's a why? Great the first actor. one. The first one's good. Second one's okay. Yeah. Third one. Let's not talk about it. Being that you know we're both Chinese, let's not talk about the third one. No, no. The first one was the best one. They should have left, probably left it at that. Um. <laughs> I'm just thinking, poor Michelle, Michelle Yao and Jet Leader. Just thinking. Okay, sure. Okay, paycheck. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> there are many, many sequels that don't work and should never have been made. You know, Matrix Two, Three, and then, <laughs> and you know, but then there are things that work well. So I don't know. We'll see. I'm I'm thinking about doing that, possibly. I have a week or so to to come up with some ideas for that. But we'll see. I'm gonna do, obviously do it live next week, but I'm putting some notes based on what I have here. And I kid you not, I'm not gonna like write it, write it before that because. It's it's kind of hard for me to show you how I, my thought process if I already write it ahead of time. So it'd be kind of fun to do that live. Uh, as for your 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 costuming, it is really neat that you you did the, you did the aesthetic because it changes the way I'm writing. I'm actually looking at how to do the story because at first I was like, ah, atomic age, you know, kind of thing, but old age. But you can it, it now sort of went back to the more fairy tale esque thing. But now I'm thinking. Final Fantasy fairy tale kind of thing, possibly. Don't know. Oh, why not? Why not? You know. So right uh, now, I'm just gonna go and start like adding some more like uh, subtle details for the. Not, not one thing is I always try to do in terms of like uh, doing a character design is well, do I do the, the classic animation like front view, back view, side view, three quarter view? Yes. When I know that it's going that is going to the next stage, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I will do that. I'm going to be doing that for this comic. It's like I'm going to do a uh, three quarter front view and a three quarter back view. So next weekend, you guys are going to actually see that I'm actually going to do just two poses of each incarnation of the character. So it's like just for the sake of the panel, 
that's great because it gives me enough of a frame reference and commonly with animation uh you get like three quarter views like you know family guy you see there always have a three quarter view that way it's like you know great and i just it, normally the trick is just doing one or two little details so you know oh that that's that character's right side that's that character's left side and i'll be figuring that out with uh with howard later like you know be it a dagger uh on the waistline or or where the belt uh, strap is or anything like that those little details you know we we'll, we'll just refine later on but that's the why you see DC Comics or like you know what like Batman's so great. You can do Batman just flip him whatever right or left or flip him horizontal. He's still Batman. But Superman that S gets all messed up. Spider Man same thing. You can flip Captain America, Green Lantern, even like the Flash and Wonder Woman. That's the the beauty of like comic book design. Just that no matter what you do, if you have to, uh, and Howard talked about that a bit yesterday, but he will definitely hit on that next week about panel layout. And the importance of like sometimes you have to flip some of the artwork to get the flow of the text. And that's one of the things we're going to co uh, cover, and some of the things we have to bear in mind with this uh, character design. But we're going a little bit more fun here because we're not yeah. doing just like superhero. We're actually creating a full blown uh, character, almost like the equivalent of like Sephiroth. And uh, so it's like, there's no comparison. <laughs> Like oh, that, that's why it became up. I, I was thinking, wondering why I thought about Sean. Yeah, it's because of the the the, the coat that he, his long coat that he wears. Is that even consider a long coat? I guess it's a so. chensa. Yeah, it is. It, it really is what he's wearing. He just open. He just it doesn't button it. That's it. That's the only difference. Yeah. He only has a, the X strings the here for the shoulder plates. But basically, it's a chensa without the frog buns. It's like he took all the frog buns and ripped them out. And just like oh, there we go. I'm gonna go bare chested. <laughs> That is true. Oh, that's true. I never thought about that. It's funny you should say that. I actually, ha I'm not going to move around, but I actually have the Final Fantasy Seven, the Advent Children one, the the first animated series, they, uh, and a series, first animated film they did with the with their bike where they blossomed up, blossomed up all the swords out from Cloud, the clouds riding in. I actually grabbed it from San Diego Comic Con many wow two decades ago. I feel old. <laughs> I think it was two decades ago because they had it. I was like, oh. That's cool. And they also they also had Seth. I was like, oh no, but I bought I I went for the bike. I eh. <laughs> what can you do? So uh, folks, they're just uh, because you know it's just ten after, and we did start a little bit later. So if you're okay with it, uh, we we will be uh, extending there to comedy for the time loss. Yeah. And I'm just rushing here to get my basic tones and shadows in, so I get like silhouette there, uh, both human and monster mode. Uh, so that with a humanoid. Here is by the time like it's next week uh for we will have like i'll have the final uh design ready and then we can start actually making a story with our character pressure <laughs> <laughs> oh man so is, does anybody have any questions because this is a great time to ask us anything maybe in the chat or if you want to like pop your hand up I'm Absolutely. Even if, even if you're curious about like uh, what software or any tools or what drawing tablet that I'm using, uh, anything of that nature, by all means, like it's like you know it's there. There's no reason to be shy. Any question is a good question. Also, if you want to show your stuff, you know, let me know. Yes, what we'll what love tablet? to see your stuff. What tablet are you? No, using? do you have do you have progress? Can you share some of your progress? Love to see where the mask is at. The question from Haley: What tablet are you using? I'm using a Huon. Now, uh, oh, <laughs> Rob, wow. that looks great. Wow! Uh, I'll tell you the difference between a uh, Wacom and uh, Huon right now. It, it's actually the pen. Uh, Wacoms do have better pens. Uh, they're much more responsive. You know, the eye pencil is good too, but it's limited to, of course, Apple products and the iPad. It does work like a charm though. Now, Wacom, the portable ones, they're, they're immensely overpriced, but I find that this Huon is excellent value. The tablet itself is exactly the same. Exactly the same. It's just a pen that's like, think of it as a, an older uh, Wacom pen. So it's like, you know, the, this would be a Wacom pen that I would have gone like in the early 2000s. Does it, does it work well? Absolutely. And it's one thing that I do like is that you still have the button on the pen that you can set to eraser mode if you want to. And it's much more affordable uh, 
the customer service is excellent, but the only catch is this. With a Hue on tablet, like any Windows product or anything like that, you have to calibrate a little bit more. You know, it's like if you're a gamer, you know, you have to do that calibration with your joystick and controller. Same principle with the pen. You have to do, it's not as plug and play as it is like with a Wacom. But in terms of color resolution, response, I can't say enough good things about it. So it's like, you know, in comparison, you're saving a thousand bucks with Hue on. But you do have Apex, uh, sorry, X-Pen. X-Pen, I know people that use X-Pen. Uh, that's another uh, more budget-friendly drawing tablet, and they love it as well. So it's like, you know, regarding those two uh, Wacom alternatives, I have to say Huon and X-Pen, definitely like, you know, if you're looking for something more budget, I would definitely look into those models. And as you can see, the Huon is quite, uh, quite a lot of fun. What about you, Rob? What are you using? Um, oh, let's see. This is a uh, Han Von. I bought it in China about five years ago. And for the longest time, I didn't even have the uh, correct um, software installed. So it wasn't showing the, the uh, pressure. Uh, but my setup, because it's just a regular pad, it's not one of these new ones that you can actually see what you're drawing. So I've got like a book holder. Uh, so it's actually, you know, at, for me, it's at about, what is that, about um, 25 degrees. So I got this. I used to have the same setup uh, before yeah. I uh, <laughs> come. Like, yeah, I used to have, like a book stand there to keep it an angle. Yeah. Brilliant. Nothing wrong with it. They're still reliable, those guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, uh, yeah. So I'm not really that... Uh, <sighs> I, sh I should use the digital, uh, you know, uh, the, the Rob, tablet. Uh, Rob, I can tell you right now, yeah. uh, one artist I know, uh, I know he uses the, like the uh, I believe it's called the Wacom of Bamboo uh, yeah. tablet. So, <laughs> and I kid you not, I was at the studio, he drew on his lap, which was kind of weird when you're talking to someone, and someone's like, can't, you know, drawing stuff on the, you know, their lap, but... <laughs> He was working, it's like at the Rage Studio, like the Rage Studio, they actually moved, so that's like the old Rage Studio, that was kind of weird. Mm -hmm. So, um, Marcos uh, Toe, uh, he was working on, what the hell was he working on? I think it was Nightwing. Yeah, I remember the conversations, but not where they work on, because I just see people as people, but he was working on a DC comic that way. And he made all his comics that way. On his so left? Well, he's using, he's not using a giant, you know, uh, Wacom thing that's you know the, the, mm. whatever it's the size of a TV and drawing on the screen. No, he's doing what you're doing, literally. So nice. it's not it's not the tool per se all the time. It does have it does mm. help. I'm not gonna lie, it does help. Well, I'll but tell you a confession. Dave McKean does the same thing. He doesn't draw on the drawing tablet. Like I've seen his setup. He has a Mac and he, it's just his monitor. And he he has a pen, but it's, it's exactly the same one that like you know Rob and I. Uh, well, I used to use I I use it at work. Just those drawing tablet without the screen. Dave McKean, that's what he's using to this day. Dave McKean is best known for like Sandman stuff. So have you heard of the Sandman comic series and how critically it came for the art uh, as well mm. as writing, obviously. Batman Arkham uh, Asylum. Oh, uh, boy. Yeah. Classic. Yes, and uh, of course, there classic. he had Black Dog that was critically acclaimed. Uh, Raptor yeah. that's out this year. It's another critically acclaimed. He's also a filmmaker. He's done Mirror Mask. And he also did yet. Luna. Wow. I haven't watched those. I haven't watched those yet. But I actually have a copy of uh, the last, the Wolves in the Wall. Did he, do, he did Wolves in the Wall, right? I think yes. He yes. I have, Stephen King, Dark Tower series. No, no, no. Wolves, Wolves in the Wall was a children's book written by Neil Gaiman. I sorry, I'm thinking about like yeah, the other well, uh, the Wolves of. Uh, no, no, no worries. I, I believe Dave did was art on that one as well. He really is one of the artists with with Neil Gaiman stuff. So I have that signed somewhere in my basement. Everybody's like, why is everything in the basement? Like, I don't. Know. But that's like that's signed into my basement, and I actually do have Dave McKean's uh, autograph had. Oh, this is this is why you should know your, what you what crap you have in your possession. I had it in an art book. I did not know I had it in the art book because I forgot and I sold it. Oh, no. yeah. oh man! And the reason why I know it was in there because the person who bought it's like this is awesome, and he they showed me a picture. And I'm like, I hate myself so much. <laughs> oh no! Because I did not charge you for that one for that. At all. As you should. 
But, As you should. But you know what? I'm happy that someone who enjoys and appreciates his art has it. You know, the fact that I forgot about it tells you a lot.、Uh, maybe I have too much crap.、Um, but it's one of those things where you should know what you have and, and appreciate that. And and it's not it's, as I said, it's not necessarily having the best tools or the, all the books or anything. It's really the person behind it. So even though I gave that up. I still appreciate Dave McKean's art and stuff, and I have a story to tell, and it makes people laugh and point fingers at me and stuff. But、uh, it's really you,、uh, you as the creator.、Uh, this might what tool you I mean? If you ask me what I'm using to write right now, all my notes and stuff. I'm using scrap paper and whatever pen that's near me,、yep. really. And I've done. I when I did、uh, stuff for Disney, I did that in front of them, <laughs> literally with a pen and scrap paper. They're like looking at. It's like you don't have a laptop, like. I write faster than I type. I could it's, it's because I can doodle and make notes and stuff much faster this way. And this is how I do my thing. So it's not necessarily always your tool, but it's more about you and you practicing the fluidity of translating your ideas into something. That's、mm-hmm. the key thing. That's the, that's what difference、uh, the difference between those who start out and they feel like it's really hard to do, and those who've been doing it for a while. It's because we're so used to just going, okay, here is going to go here now, as fast as we can. You know,、um, you know that's how it is.、Um, mm-hmm. We have a question here、uh, from Haley:、uh, Are there technical or compatibility issues that would mean waiting to purchase one would result in better price performance? And in、uh, in terms of the tablet, tablet? yeah, in Rackets tablet. Yeah, there, there's certain like you know for uh, this. Uh, I'll, I'll presume that、uh, Haley that、uh, your Windows. So if you're Windows, then yeah, because there's if there's some products that are like where they, they do Wacom does work better on on、uh, on a Apple. I'm not gonna lie about that, but it is also a pain in the butt. The way I would describe it is this:、um, if something goes wrong、uh, with your Apple product in Wacom, you need to be a brain surgeon. If if it goes wrong with your Windows, you're generally you're just a general practitioner. So basically, it has a cold, and it's like you know, take two of these、uh, updates and call me in the, in the morning. You know, it's like you know, you just like it's a driver's thing. So, it, it, in terms of like performance, I'm gonna be honest. It's not like Adobe where they say like you need 32 gigs of RAM to run the video editing software. That is a limitation of the software, not of the drawing tablet. So, just to give you peace of mind, drawing tablet absolutely. So long as you have you know at least eight gigs of RAM to you know and Windows, if it can, if your computer can run Windows 10. And then play video, and you can play games. Guaranteed, your drawing tablet will be just fine. And if there's anything, if you're wondering why is the resolution a little bit different than your monitor, it's just a calibration issue, and you set the colors, and you know because sometimes it's set to 4K or it drops down in、uh, in resolution because it thinks of your whatever you last open. That's what you want it、uh, set at. So you will have to make the adjustments when you buy the tablet. But I would say that there are no limitations. They're all pretty plug and play USB. You just、uh, need to factor in in terms of the size. That if you look at certain tablets when they have a number, for example, like the Huon, we'll say Huon Canvas 20, Huon、uh, Hu- uh, Huon Canvas Pro 16. What that means is that the 16 or 20 is in reference not to the size of the drawing tablet itself. It's in reference to the size of the screen, the actual display area that you have to work with. So it's a bit misleading if you're getting a drawing tablet and it says this drawing tablet is 11 by 17, but you may only have a drawing surface of eight inches. So it's not like as big as you thought. It's cumbersome. So it's good to show like what the actual display size of that drawing tablet is, and then if you're like I like 20、uh, for my desk, but for portability, that is just Ginormous. It's just it's like you know it's just too heavy, and too bulky. Now you have Ken Lashley, acclaimed illustrator, another Canadian, and he well, geez, in terms of character design, he can fill you in on a bunch of stuff. He's done character designs for Transformers, Beast Machines, so like you know, and then he's worked with like Hasbro and like at Irwin. He's done so many things, and he he factors in talk about design for a toy company. He got himself a portable、uh, Wacom for conventions, so he can still do work on commissions while you know on the showroom floor. And he got himself a、uh, that's the portable one, but it is immensely expensive. But in terms of the size, it's like the size of like your iPad or a Pro tablet, and that works out great. So if you have an iPad, 
you don't need to get a Wacom, portable Wacom. If you're going to get a drawing tablet for your home studio, you might as well go big. You don't want to go too small. It's like, you know, 13, I'd say is the minimum. Anything smaller, you might as well, like, you know, it's like what Rob uh, is using and what I used to do. Uh, you might as well just use one of those non-display tablets because you can just plug it into a laptop. You can take it with you everywhere. And I love that. I could just, if I have a, a laptop or if I can hook up the computer, so I do a quick sketch on uh, freeware, like a free software, great, then I'll just do that. And I hope that answers your question. So do we have any other questions? For a second, I thought you froze, Howard. For a second, well, I'm writing, I'm writing ideas down. <laughs> Oh, okay. So it's like in a moment here, I'm just like adding some polishing yeah. details, but you gotta get, uh, get the idea for this character, uh, what I'm doing, like, you know, to have like in the panel, this certain look and silhouette. So that way when she becomes more feral and it's like, and it's like, I'm drawing, I, I'm not going to lie. Like I am drawing from a lot of East Asian, uh, religious folklore, uh, well, religions and folklore. And especially like, you know, uh, with this, as I was reading the description, I kept thinking about uh, Journey to the West. Uh, Howard, uh, Journey yeah, to the West. I, I, well, yeah. I saw that. I saw the inspiration. So, there is stuff. obviously some uh, uh, Indian influence here with the design here. It's like, you know, that you probably saw earlier yep. that uh, I want to employ uh, with that fork for. So that way, it's just like it's this uh, not not just otherworldly, but omniworldly, as I like to call it. It's mm -hmm. like there's aspects that are so familiar that's shared that it's like, you know, it's can easily transcend space and time. Yeah. If you, you guys have any questions, because we're, I think, I don't know what time is it. Yeah, soon we'll be, oh, actually, we have pretty, about seven more minutes. Yeah, so if you guys have any, if, I think at the end, I would love for everybody to share what they've done so far. For sure. I would love that too. Please we'll do, do not a, be shy. We'll do a share screen or something, or, or just show it on your, on your own or your own camera there or whatever, and then we can see at the end. So, can, Take a quick look at everybody's cool stuff. Uh, does it matter what software you use when working at a studio? I use Clip Studio. Not. Uh, it's all about the file format. To be perfectly honest, uh, that's an excellent, excellent question, and is one that I find is not asked often enough. Now, in terms because with the file, then it, there's uh, there's a whole aspect about the work files and then production files. Production, like when it goes to print, be it for web or for actual hard copy. Now, with this there, it's like you just have to make sure that if whatever software you're using, there's a, a, a layered work file. Now, Photoshop, it has PSDs, and then you go to finding the other own. But if you have the components, you can always save them as EPS file. And that's because there's a postscript file. The, these are more likely to open in other software, like cross, cross software. Like if you save it as an um, AI file in Illustrator, uh, it can only open AI stands for Adobe Illustrator. But if you save it as an EPS file, you can not only open it in another software, you can even open an EPS Illustrator file in Photoshop. It won't matter. So TIFF files are good for print when it's flat. If you're going to submit it CMYK for print, then, you know, I would definitely go uh, in that route. But it, JPEGs are good for web, for, uh, not really good for print unless you're formatting maybe for InDesign. Uh, magazine layout or some kind of spread, but uh, for the software, you know, you want to make sure you have your safe files. But if you're going to go like high res uh, at the end, final file, same as TIFF. If you're going to put them on a website or showcase uh, JPEGs, PNGs, just make sure the PNGs are always flat because sometimes they'll make them into transparent and they'll do some weird formatting when you upload. Hey Dom. Can you stop sharing your screen so everybody can share their stuff? <laughs> yeah. I uh, just like, I uh, just want to see, I'm just going to pan out to show real quick uh, mine. Yeah. And then you, I, I, I'm going to show you mine and then you guys show me yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. So like we saw here, I'm just going to go here with like, you know, the bit of the evolution. I'm just going to merge these and there we go. 
So when we start off, we start off with these uh, notes here uh, from Howard and based on the description. Now we know that I started uh, like how it evolved, like with the creature. Okay, I had a braid and like you know, a bit of Frankenstein's creature sad face. And this obviously is a take on Howard's doodle on the bottom right. I uh, was getting an idea of like the shape I wanted for like a mask to change the features and a bit of the outfit. Now, as we're evolving through the notes there, we're taking consideration how the character will be used in certain action scenes. Uh, first, we want to have like, of course, for close up or dialogue or expressions, a uh, bit an idea direction for the face. So we knew, we knew that there's a jewel that represents like the backstory of the character and ties in also to potentially uh, the root of their powers slash curse. So in the more saddened, broken, like fragmented uh, humanoid face when, you know, calm, we know that these tendrils will, can be animated, but here it is to show complete contrast to the monster beast mode. So having to repurpose these tentacles to like form like horns or other things or other shapes, other silhouette, but to show that when the face mask pulls away, uh, the concept that I'm presenting to Howard, my, my creative liberty, like what you guys have done during the session, is that the mask pulls away and you realize the jewel is actually embedded to the forehead. It's not part of the mask. So it's like part of that transformation is like, there you go, and hence the curse. So leading up to our shape. So we're like the form, like we wanted something like a deity has like a bit of a warrior sorceress type look but still feminine silhouette. So with the overlapping, if lit from behind, it still looks like a skirt. But in fact, we know that these are all these satchel, like, you know, we would see. So spinning around, it reflects, you know, the top of the head for some symmetry, but it gives some gravitas during motion and movement. So we just hear the proportion from like nice and lean here on the top. And then from bottom here is like a bit of a muscle form with the armor plates of the form and shoulder pads kind of folding in based on the mass of the body. So it's like, you know, it's just point, uh, creating a new, a new silhouette, if you will. And from that, then we started going into refining and polishing detail and spit of the costume like where the cloth and armor will sit. It's like, we're not too monstrous, but something that obviously has a lot of shape and form, but obviously distinctively different between the two characters. So we have here, we have uh, Minu Ursa, who's now, we have the contrast here. So it's like a bit of here, it's like what I'm trying to show here is a bit of actually the size comparison from the monster in the humanoid form. And having it wrap these materials, tighten and stretch, you know, seems to make a little bit more sense with the plates. So I'm going to start sharing. And now that I've shown you mine, I would love to see yours. Rob! <laughs> oh my god. Nicely done. Nicely done, sir. And I love how you got the glow of the jewel reflecting on the forehead and the supernatural aspects. And you're using complementary colors. <laughs> I was going to say that too. I was going to say the colors are great. <laughs> it reminded me of the EC, the EC comics back in the day, eh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Speaking of which. You're uh, going to grab one, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, okay, oh, I'll show it next week. But I just bought Tales from the Crypt, like the hardcover collection, and that's what exactly what I was make, making me think of. And I thought, mm, brilliant. Uh -huh. oh, so I it. thought, uh, because you mentioned a sadness in the eyes, and I thought, mm -hmm. well, if you, if when she grows, her, her, like her skeleton, her body increases in size, but her skin stays more or less the same, you know, so it stretches out. So you have not just like uh, uh, the the uh, eyes are so wide and so big, but they've got this sadness because you know if you look at the shape of the skull, the the orbits, uh, really that's just like uh, you know like when you look at that, I, it kind of looks sad in itself. I love it because it's like the the, the way the bones you were describing, like the transformation. I'm reminded like the how physically painful. In the mm. old, uh, the American World Open London transformation oh, scene, oh, yeah. you hear the bones yeah. cracking as uh, David is like, you know, morphing and he's under the skin. And it's just like, and that sadness too. And it's, I, I think this is a brilliant approach for this character. Uh, hey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And especially with the skin, because yeah, almost childlike when not a monster, because, you know, it, it's, it's, it stays expanded because the bone, like, increasing size, so it comes down, like, now even more childlike and sad. And this is, this is an excellent approach. 
Thanks. Anybody else? <laughs> I just want to feed it with, make sure everybody has a bit of time <laughs> for critiques as well. What about Joe? Joe, I want to see, I want to see, yeah. I want to see what's that. Do, do you have a monster mode? Uh, hi. Um, I'm just having trouble with share screen. It uh, just says the host is disabled. So I'm, all, all I'm doing is um, I'm you just changing the hair to like a snake like kind of theme, you know? Excellent. I, I, just yeah. made them go wavy and stuff. You can, I think you can share it now, actually. Should be able to. If not, let me see. Uh, what can we do here? Da, da, da. I, I, yeah. I just wish it was this good, to be fair. <laughs> I have a few concepts. Well, on the share button, there should be a little arrow pointing up saying uh, whoever the host is. Uh, saying, you know, uh, 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 multiple sharing is possible. Yeah. I'm I, I've it. allowed people to share their screen, so I think, uh, Joe, you can do that now. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pressing it. Oh, thank you, finally. I've been pressing it a lot. <laughs> yeah, no it's a security no feature that oh. we the hard oh, way. Not. Oh, not. There we go. That. Okay. Oh, See, the it. expression yeah. one, I love, I love that you use, like, the actual, like, the brush there with the bristles. So it's, mm -hmm. like, it really... Like I love how you're doing the exploration here to get like the serpents there with the hair. Yeah. I love that like, it looks like the hair is transforming into serpents, which is awesome. Did you it notice like how Zhao did the lines and the mask, and as it's becoming yeah. more serpent, it's like crawling around the jewel? Yes, which is great. I love it. Mm -hmm. See those little details to make the character distinctive like that are absolutely key. Like yeah. in angles, like you know, to do that in two modes. It reminds me almost like how the face runes were done in the horror movie Nightbreed. If you, if you remember, if you've ever seen it by Clive Barker. And the main character, uh, uh, Boone, uh, he becomes like a, a cabal at the end. And he realizes his monster feature is actually runes. It's not scars. It's all these tattooed runes uh, are along mm -hmm. his face. And I, I've rarely seen uh, people like pull off. They, they go a little bit too crazy. And I love how you did it here to get it part of the eyebrows and go around the jewel like that as the hairs become serpents that that there is like the whole the funnest part about uh, character design you guys are coming up with some great stuff like concepts yeah. i love like raw with the bone structure like everything like taking that into account and then with gel you're taking instead of that with the bone structure what you do with the mask with the expression of the hair yeah it's brilliant it's... thank you <laughs> The great stuff this is i'm like i'm staring at it going okay what can i use with this? <laughs> as i read like i want to pull ideas from this but that's what you do you, you basically <laughs> you pull and push each other this is an absolutely you can, you can actually see the transformation happening like even though it's a comic book and you there's it's still images but you can very really difficult with it with especially a solid yeah. mask how do you yeah. give a solid mask character besides lighting and the fact it's, doing the eyebrows with the transformation like that with the jewel and using the hair that's brilliant that is brilliant Love it. It's just inspired. Just absolutely inspired. Well done, Joe. Jeez. What are you guys gonna roll? <laughs> Pamela? Is anybody Andy? else? Is anybody else out there who wanna share? Go ahead. Let's look at some monsters. <laughs> I will talk. Um, I just wanna say so uh, I appreciate you guys for sure. Rock stars for sure in your genre. I love it. So um I was very inspired yesterday. And unfortunately, there's not enough time in the day for me, so I didn't get to elaborate on what I did yesterday. Um, I'm both a writer and a visual artist, so um, I'm always looking for ways to, like, you know, further develop myself. Um, and especially now that I'm, like, reinventing myself, you know? Um, so this has been really cool. Um, I'm a Haudenosaunee, which is a First Nations person. Um, so I have a lot of teachings and a lot of stories that go outside of the formulas that are, um, you know, that are out there. So as a writer, um, you know, for many years doing children's books, things like that, like just on a really small scale, I've been thinking like, um, these stories need to be taken further, you know? Um, and so it was like really quite unexpected when I signed up for this and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, for real. Like what? 
a great way to like just to reach like a, a, a broader audience um you know of people and and to take um some of those teachings and make them really like mystical make them come to life also um a lot of what um the stories we have are known as original instructions like from the creator mm -hmm. so, our stories go back when we talk about the seventh fire the seventh fire really only started in the 60s so um and it goes back generations so the first fire is basically uh when we were here with dinosaurs when we had to you know discover our fire and make tools and things so those are still our stories to this day um and so we ha and it's so funny because now people are saying oh well humans were here when dinosaurs were around and it's like well we've been saying this this whole time you know so yesterday when i was listening to your stuff um i actually went of course i always go in a whole different direction so um but i did really want to follow along so i could like sort of come up with my own thing but what i did do um is stuff surrounded around like um Sabe, which is Sasquatch. And in the seven grandfather teachings, he represents truth. So like stuff just writes itself. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, all of those things. And then also, um, you know, to integrate, you know, some of the language in it. So, you know, if I am doing something like sci-fi, it's cool because <laughs> you can just make up a whole new thing, you know? So one of the things like I like I'm old school, like pen and paper. So I had like my um, my guy yesterday. I don't know if you can see him. Oh, you can see but him. just wow. coming up with his, uh, you know, he's carrying his old uh, deer up there. Um, different things like um, this is sort of Norvell Morriso esque. So it's kind of like taking that two dimensional design of like the Ojibwe thing and sort of making it three dimensional with the. Yes like yes. with the cartoon stuff yes. so um so yesterday when you were talking about your concepts and thinking about vikings and like we used to have treaties with vikings way back in the day you know and stuff and and so like going like pre-contact so going back either to that first fire or going into the future and going to like the 10th fire or whatever you know and and so because i don't think they're probably going to be too different you know what I'm saying? And so like, as you were talking, you were talking about like the Viking thing. Then I thought about like metal. How did, you know, metal come to the planet? Was it here? Was it brought, you know? And so like, I just have like, my sketchbooks are always like half writing and half like folk pictures, you know? And um, it's so funny. I just actually got an X pen from a digital class that I was in. So I'm so looking forward to it because like I literally like use a pen and I'll show you a painting I'm working on. It's um, please, please. <laughs> yes, definitely. Like, we're, 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 we're being quiet because we're listening to everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh my wow oh my i might God. as well like if you look at the lines and stuff on, like it's totally not even done like it's so not done but like i might as well like use a pen you know what i mean like i'm like on my paintings and um i so much respect I, for line work i art. i'm a big fan of like daphne ojig and uh, oh, like yeah. oh i lived the on man. the west coast for a long time as well like and and so i find a lot of my stuff is really um between the ojibwe floral stuff is more painterly the stuff on the west coast is like real precision a lot of that so i have to really let go of my um my need for perfection you know and i really think as an artist that's kind of what stopped me from a lot of stuff you know where i'm like ah oh, i give up on this um oh that's so, it like, like it's one thing it's like you're like we're focused on next week it's like yeah if, please like join us if you know we can help you like you know to walk you to set up your x, x pen there let us know but yeah. uh with with, with yeah. drama the comics it's like uh one thing is to give the peace of mind we're showing like see this panel i'm not going to put this much detail because it's going to be like you know half of its dialogue mm -hmm. but the next one i have to really show emphasis on the eye well yeah um, depending yeah. on how how it writes it so we're going to tell you like you don't have to like you know not every panel has to be perfect so long as like the key ones that you you intend well that's that what i'm looking forward to this x pen thing like i just got like the very minimum because they were giving them away right <laughs> so i got like the and but i'm so excited because like just like with my painting like to work through these colors was 
insane. Like, and I, you know, and like the layers that I put on. So I'm just mm-hmm. thinking, wow, like what well, am I? You're, you're guys, you're, you're Ojibwe, you guys make it look like gouache, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. so you guys, you're, it's like, it's acrylic, but you have to layer it and layer it and layer it to get that wait, gouache wait. matte look. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's, I love that's it. A, wait, that's acrylic? Seriously? Yeah, this is acrylic. Oh, that's insane. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> yeah see? Uh, yeah, you thought it was gouache, uh, but it's not. <laughs> But wait, they could, but it, like it could, like shrinks though. So how? Wow. Okay, now my brain's getting blown. Layering yeah. and layering. Yeah, and but layering. yeah, but it, it still shrinks though. So you guys have basically like predict how much it's going to shrink with before. I don't know. It sounds people who don't paint, but it yeah. like shrinks after you paint it. So I don't know how much it shrinks because I'm not a full-on painter or anything. I do it for fun. So first yeah. time I experienced it, I was like, it shrank and it looks like poop now. <laughs> so <laughs> my friends are like, my friends who are artists are like, yeah, it could have shrinks. I'm like, oh, how, why would I know that? But so that, <laughs> since then, I'm like, when people are painting for like, it's like, I did this for, you know, for whatever. I'm like, how do you know how far it's going to go you know, into itself and not like bleed and mess up things, especially when you have to do fine details like that. It's insane. Yeah. You guys are, it is like, insane. Well, that's why I'm like, I'm just so excited to think like, I'm going to be able to do stuff on a pad before I even put it on canvas. And I'm going to be able to just do it like boom, like that. Instead of like, this is like 50 hours of just like, Oh no, I did a mistake. And like well, <laughs> taking it out. I'm going to tell you a secret right now, uh, Pamela, it's like one of the good thing you're going to love it with XP pen, but it's like, it, it's going to be inevitable. It seems like you're 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 not officially like a local artist until someone asks you to paint a mural. <laughs> so with XP pen, which is great, is that when you do your your rough and you have to do your grid, like you know, instead of like you convert to like inches to feet, and that way you know like all your blocks of color is like great, and you just print out, do it on XP pen first, and you have your blocks of color print on eight and a half by eleven. You have your stencil on your guide, and it's gonna save you a lot of time. But with XP okay. pen uh, drawing tab, one another good thing about it that I like too. Once you get like used to it, uh, you know, it's, it's, you, you're going to look at your mouse going, why did we have this relationship for so long? I sh- <laughs> we should have moved on like years ago. <laughs> uh, oh, absolutely. Well, you know what, that I, what you're doing is great. And then once you get to digital, it's going to make it, it's going to translate very well. Um, and if you're looking at telling stories in comic books uh, through comic, through the medium of comic books. Definitely uh, next week's session will help with that, with the jumpstart with that. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's like, it's almost like, like for our culture, for the Asian culture, for Chinese, like we have like long scroll paintings of stories. Basically it's, think of it as almost like a montage, it's not really a montage, but it's like a long scroll. So it's a whole bunch of stories. It's like a mega happen- pan shot that stretches across the room yeah yeah which you know it, which is is using comic books as well but when you're like how do you translate into 3d or whatever it's like you don't do that because it's you it won't work <laughs> it's only meant for 2d so you have to compartmentalize certain things and then translate into a different medium it's to make it work so so sort of like what they do with comic books and they made it into movies they like okay these things in comic books are great we, we can't do that in film so we're going to take these things and then push those and push those parts of the story or that's at, or visual aspects of it and then reinvent it in a way. But you know, you as a writer and an artist, you, because, and I hate people who have that kind of talent, but you're able to do, you, you're able to do this weird synergy between those two things at the same time. It's like the way I work with Dom is like, I do my thing. I give it to him. He does this thing. And then we start talking and then we're doing that. But for someone like you, you're doing that all here at the same time. So you're able to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to be, you know, turning this, this, this image in three quarter turn in this, con- if it's just say the comic book, make it easier, right? You already know what, you already have that planned in your head before you put any words on the page because you already have it here. So you have that, but you just, you once you get the right tools that, that help you translate your ideas easily, you're going to be flying because you wouldn't believe because, Ab- you know. Absolutely. Like That's it's one plan. thing. <laughs> like like with the uh, Haley was uh, I know so asking a very similar question like she had some concepts for stories that involves like you know like uh, uh, some really clever stuff but it was when she was talking about pet projects surrounding social justice and like what we all had uh, figuring out like uh, uh, a way forward on that one because it's kind of epic the first thing I would suggest absolutely with that one is like you know if you're going to do like a certain story is think of it like in terms of like uh television people tend to think of like always the whole trilogy thing forget stop selling the trilogy bit uh intellectual property where people's like you know netflix oh i've got this could be the next lord of the rings don't think of it that way 
you tell your story and they say like okay it's this uh it's gonna be this long it's about many this many pages like you could do, you could choose to do it as a single format graphic novel or as a multi issue like what exactly what howard did with damn chris children as a multi-part installment like a mini series and that way you can collect them later as you know as a trade now why do we not do that at first i'll, I'll explain that from a production in like comic sites like why why do we not do like a whole graphic novel in one go I to be know. perfectly honest it's actually more it can be it can be potentially more costly a uh, lot more printing a lot more binding there's always some issues in the beginning if you get all smaller issues it's easy to condense them into uh one like soft cover like you know graphic novel um and i've done many times a lot of formatting like that so when it comes to like certain stories like I would suggest uh, one thing that's interesting is that if you have separate stories, but you want to put in a big format, Dave McKean did this graphic novel close to a start called Cages, and it involves stories about tenants in this building. Get it? Cages? Apartments? So you're, uh, sometimes you're following this cat, and this cat is walking the fire escape, and it leads to the next story. So you realize like every issue before one is separate, but now that it connects into this yellow page, thick hardcover. And I love it. I love that hardcover. But I used to get them all individually. But because they're self-contained stories, but they're in the same realm, you can actually do that kind of approach. Sin City, Frank Miller did that with those stories. Um, I, you know, it's like you can, you, if you want to, you can do a, a bunch of series of like separate mini series that take place in that kind of world, and you can just build from there. You don't have to limit yourself to just that. Actually, I'm, I'm telling people and encouraging immensely: don't call this part one, part two, or whatever. Why already limit yourself to what it is? If you look at Lord of the Rings, Majora Token, it's not three parts. It's actually like, like, was it five books, Howard? Like the second book, Two so. Towers, is actually two books. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> two books, but it depends on how it's pre how it's re republished. But yeah, the thing is, things can. It's gonna sound weird. Things can be divided in any way you would like. Um, it's easy to see the whole because it's done and you know the story as a whole. But when you think of, and, and it sounds kind of bad, like if you think of even the Net, any Netflix series um, that is a series, not a film, you can technically watch it all at once. You, you know, binge watching is basically turning that series into a movie, um, in essence, right? Because it just continues to use a, 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 an overarching story. I, I know there's like little subplots and stuff, which I'll talk about next week, but it helps you do a couple of things. It helps you with production value, it does save time and money because. If you draw 120 pages and it's you finished it and no publisher wants it or you self publish it, then you're like, it becomes it becomes more about you know trying to make it uh, doable financially than the creative process of it, which is obviously not as fun. Uh, when I did, uh, I'm like grab it. Like the, this thing, this is like about oh shoot, how many pages was it? 120, <laughs> 100 pages. I can't remember right now. Um, you know, we put this together. This is actually made out of five small issues. Um, there was one storyline then we put together what we call a trade paperback at the end. Why do we do this small issues is part of production value. It's much easier to control. And it's also, it sounds kind of bad, but it's from the publisher side. If issue one sells well, issue two is going tanking, we might stop it and then consider yep. just releasing the trade all at once or whatever, or not doing anything at all. So as a sell, if you're doing a self-published book, you can really control it. It's like, okay, issue two sold like 30, 20% of issue one. I can't financially do this. Then you might have to retool your story or, re or, or, or change a direction. So you have a chance to do that. But once you finish the whole thing, you put it out there and it flops, it's kind of hard to go back. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, that's, that's the case of things. And that's the reality of things. But for storytelling part, it's great because it helps you become a better storyteller, be it with text or visual, because you know you have 20 pages to tell a story. That's right. You get more hyper-focused. Yeah, you become more, yeah, exactly. Because you know that it's going to take another month before the person gets issue two, and issue three, and issue four. Regardless of the stories, like one story or a bunch of other stories, you would want to keep, so you, you're literally saying, at the end of this issue, I have to make it so that it's so exciting that this person's going to go out to the kind week shop or a bookstore to buy issue two a month later, 30 days later. No one watches a TV show and go, I'm watching episode two 30 days later, right? So that makes us very sensitive of how we can, how we tell the story and what we throw out, what we keep in. So that when, you, when you get to the point where you collect them all into something like this, every page and every panel is very, very uh, condensed 
and focus towards making the reader enjoy it more and telling your story better. It makes sense. So it's it's sort of that weirdness of it. It's economically for uh, for publishers, but as a creator, it makes you focus your your ideas more so because of that. Because of the. And I would always describe it like to, to somebody who's like, yo, it's like, yeah, if you're watching a series on Netflix or Amazon, like you know, you have different episodes. And before that, because that format uh, that streaming services are using was commonly used, like in the UK for BBC, they don't call them seasons one, two, or three. They call them series. It could be two episodes, it could be several, twelve episodes. Like IT Crowd, their final series is one special. Uh, that's it, and that's like. Yeah, but you, you, I find it's easy to think of it in those terms. And and people that try to go like, oh, this is going to be my Act One, Act Two, and Act Three. Don't do that. This yeah. is not opera. You're telling a story that fits. Uh, and I tell this to everyone. It's like, don't ever think of it that you're not ready to tell the stories. That the story is not ready to be told. That's it. It's like you'll know. If you're holding back, then you know this. Like, okay, I got to tweak on a few things. You're ready right. to tell it. You got the energy. You got the drive. But when that right. story is perfect, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just like it's, it's enough. It's good enough. It's just that I find the most humbling thing that you can should always remind yourself. It's not as good as some, but it's better than most. Yep. And with it's that, just reassuring yourself of that. With like, that. I think we're going to be wrapping up uh, now because I think we are at one o'clock. I'm with my clock.